I may have just made the biggest financial mistake of my life. And a few weeks have gone by since I made a video for you guys, and there's good reason why I haven't been uploading. A couple of weeks ago, I made the decision that I would buy a salvaged car and rebuild it here on YouTube to show you guys that honestly anything's possible, even for somebody that has zero experience working on cars. So after watching some of my favorite YouTubers like Matt Armstrong, Backyard Boys, Goon Squad, and even Tafarish rebuild some of their favorite cars, I thought to myself, hey, how hard can it really be? After all, who wouldn't want the car of their dreams? at a fraction of the price. In my last video, I went around to different Copart lots here in Florida to check out all the salvage cars and learn as much as I can about how the auction process works. This is Copart Punta Gorda. got our vests on. For those unaware, Copart is a company that, depending on how you look at it, will either sell you a pile of scrap metal, literal scrap metal, or the car of your dreams at a fraction of the price. I was able to find some of my dream cars at Copart, but it also helped me clearly understand that bidding on these cars solely based off the photos you see online is just not a good idea at all, as 9 times out of 10, those cars have more hidden damage than what you can see in those 7 or 8 photos. Oh my! This is why it's so important to check out the cars in person or at a minimum have someone inspect it for you. Now for those wondering, over the past few weeks I haven't posted, I was busy spending my time trying to win a car. This didn't come without its own set of problems though. I lost some of the cars I was bidding on. This is the last bid. I don't have any more money than this. That's it, I'm out at this, can't do it. Yep, that's it, I lost. Ah, uh, come on. Oh, come on. Some were even postponed to a further date, but finally, after a long time, I was finally able to win one. New bidder. Come on, make it easy. Make it easy on me. Make it easy on me. Come on, come on, come on, make it easy on me. Volkswagen Golf R, which is a pretty cool car. Well, I can't tell you how I'm feeling after spending over $10,000 on a car that luckily, hopefully can drive and run, but um, is absolutely destroyed more than I thought it would be. And we'll have to see if this is a good idea. Now I know from here, it really doesn't look all that bad, but I think I need to show you the extent of the damage and the extent of what I'm working with here. And hopefully you guys can give me some pointers in the comments to help me out because I'm not sure I know how to do all of this just yet. So I'm sure we'll figure out quickly if I'm in over my head on this project, but to me, this is much more than just rebuilding a car. This represents a new start, a new beginning, and a new chapter of my life to truly see if I have what it takes to rebuild some of my favorite cars for you guys on YouTube, and also just to go after my hobbies, even the ones that I thought would be too challenging. Because all in all, I'm just trying to have fun doing the things that I enjoy. So when we look at the car from the front, uh, the damage doesn't look all that bad. And this is another reason why I bought it. All I'm really seeing is a headlight that needs to be replacing. I think the adaptive cruise control sensor is gone, which isn't too expensive to buy used, but the front damage doesn't look too bad. Now, one thing I did notice is as I was pulling the car into uh, my garage, there was coolant leaking and I did pay to get it inspected, but I think I found where the leak is coming from. Now, as you guys can see, besides needing a headlight, I'm also going to need a hood. And you can see right here where the damage was to the adaptive cruise control module. Fortunately, the wiring harness wasn't broken, so that's uh, uh, you know a big savior on money. The main thing I wanted to avoid when purchasing a salvaged car was uh, engine problems, because I have zero experience pulling, changing, or doing anything to an engine. So I wanted to avoid that completely. And that's why I bought a car that was hit kind of a little bit in the front. And as you guys can see, it doesn't look all that bad inside. 
checking out the engine bay, there really doesn't seem to be all that much damage. Fortunately, the only broken things seem far away from the engine, which tells me this really wasn't hit that hard in the front. It's almost as if it was pushed from the back from whatever hit it and into whatever was in front of it. But what I did notice was low coolant, which was a little nerve wracking. Now, I was worried at first, but upon further inspection, I did manage to find the source of the leak. There seems to be a disconnected coolant line that came off of a broken coolant adapter. Over here, in regards to where this was hit. I, it's hard to see, but there is some sort of coolant leak right over here. Besides that though, it seems like I just need to fix the bent support rail and get a new headlight, fender, and hood. Now, if you guys happen to have any 2017 Golf R parts for sale that I may need, please DM me on Instagram, which I linked down in the description below, as I really would appreciate it. I also want to show you the extent of the damage on the inside. Luckily for me, the seats are all intact, which is great, but, all the airbags are pretty much deployed. The driver's airbag, the steering wheel airbag, the curtain airbags on both sides, and the dash airbag. That means I'm gonna be needing a whole new dashboard. But honestly, none of that really scares me, and I feel pretty confident that I can replace most of that stuff because it's simply, you know, unscrewing some bolts and putting some new used parts on the car. But here's where I think I might have bit off more than I can chew. Now, I'm sure by now most of you guys are probably uh, doing the math to how much this would cost and why was it actually totaled out. A headlight, a hood, and stuff like that wouldn't total out a car. Behind me is the reason why this thing was considered Total. After getting a better look at the back of this car, I started to notice a few things that I didn't actually see in the pictures. Uh, the rear quarter panel was kind of indented, which means this was hit a lot harder in the rear than I had expected, and it seems like it got pushed in a lot further into the trunk than I had originally thought. Now, when I bought this car and when I looked at the photos, it honestly didn't look too bad hit in the rear uh, because the bumper's kind of sticking out a little bit. The problem is when I looked in inside there, as you saw, the trunk where the spare tire goes is no longer flat with the spare tire on it. It's kind of pushed up like this, which is a little scary because I've never actually pulled or pushed any metal before. It's no longer just unscrewing bolts and putting on new parts. Now I actually have to bend things and that's where things get a little bit scary and I feel like I might have bit off a little bit more than I can chew because I didn't see that in the photos and now I'm kind of dealing with the consequences but I'm trying to look at all the good things that came out of this and the positives and I'm also trying to come up with a game plan as to where I should start on this car. And I'd love for you guys to help me out down in the comments below with where you think I should even begin on this. Do I start on the front? Do I start on the inside? Or do I start on the rear? Another problem that I noticed from getting hit in the rear is how tight the gap is between the quarter panel and the door. Now, fortunately, the door does open. Well, I got the door open. It wasn't actually stuck that much, but it definitely gets really close to rubbing here, and that's a problem, which means when the car was hit this way, it pushed all this in, and now I have to figure out how to push it all out, and a lot of that's going to be getting this off first so I can even enter the inside. Now, in order to feel like I've made some progress today uh, from getting this car, I think what I'm gonna do is clean the inside of it and maybe clean the outside of it. Also, before I forget, I wanna show you guys the mileage on the car, but I think the battery is dead. Now, we were able to jumpstart it getting it off the flatbed, but ever since leaving it here, the battery completely died. So it's probably been dead for a while now and giving it a quick jump start was enough to move it. But now that it's sitting yet again and hasn't had enough time to recharge, I'm gonna have to jump the car again to get the mileage because when I click the button, nothing happens. Jumping a car is pretty easy. Lucky for me, this car did come with a key. So it does make the process a whole lot easier. Now, instead of using jumper cables, I decided to buy a portable jump starter as it makes the process a whole lot easier especially when the car died on the ramp. But all you do is turn the box on, connect the red alligator clamp to the positive lead on the battery and the black to the black lead. That should send the needed 12 volts to the car and inevitably turn the car on. All right, so a moment of truth. I have power coming here. You can see the lights on there, the lights on the floor. Uh, so I'm gonna press this and let's hope for the best. All righty, so we got power. What do we got? Lots of codes. 34,000 miles, auto hold is not available, airbag lights, front assist not available, then check coolant, we got coolant leaks, tire pressure monitoring system, lovely, 
Adaptive front lighting system. All right, I think that's the extent of it, of all the problems we got on this car, but I am happy that it starts, and I am happy that it does, uh, that we, that we have power going everything. With the car finally getting some power, I was able to turn on the electrics without actually starting the car and shift it into neutral. With a little help from my dad as the supervisor, we were able to roll the car out of the garage so that I can clean the interior with some leather cleaner as well as vacuum up all the broken glass and then be able to cut out the airbags and even wash the car or at least use some waterless wash to get off all the dust. So I'm gonna to try to clean all this mold since the back glass is blown out. There's literally like mold or dirt or whatever from the insurance auction where it sat at, but I'd like to clean all the glass that's in here. And you can see the kind of like the dirt that's gone on all the leather. So I just wanna quickly clean this, vacuum it up so when I work in here, it's not as gross. As I cleaned the interior, I was making a mental list of parts for things that needed to be replaced as well as things I needed to take a look at. Obviously, I will need to replace the curtain airbags, the steering wheel airbag, and the entire dash since the airbag explosion ripped a hole through it. Now for things I need to repair, I hopefully can fix the creases in the roof lining, and I'll need to send the seatbelts out for repair and replacement potentially since they locked up during the crash. And also for whatever reason, I can't seem to open this center console. All right, so I just finished cleaning the car, waterless washing it, as well as some leather and interior cleaner on the inside. It finally smells and looks good, and I feel comfortable sitting in the car now that there's no glass broken everywhere. But uh, talk about one heck of a day getting delivery of this car, and I'm really just trying to take this all in, and I don't even want to even think about the rear end of this car because that's where the extent of this damage is, and I have a feeling that the rear trunk, like the boot of the car where the spare tire is, has kind of crumpled up like this, so I'm gonna need to figure out a way to push that back in a garage because I don't have a frame machine. So definitely let me know down in the comments below what you think I should be doing, the order of operations I should even be attacking this car. I think the first thing I'm probably gonna do is fix that coolant leak that I showed you in the front of the car. This way I can turn the car on and off and not see coolant shooting out everywhere. And this way it doesn't make a mess in my garage here. And then we'll have to start ordering some parts and going from there. But you know, I appreciate all you guys from checking this car out and the journey that we're gonna have it's gonna be a big project this is uh, I really hope I didn't uh, bite off more than I can chew so we'll see I bought a 2017 Volkswagen Golf R that apparently nobody wanted I placed one bid at auction and just like that I had won the car New bidder. come on come on come on make it easy on me In my last video, I took delivery of my new, slightly used 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. I had it transported all the way from Georgia to Florida because Georgia allows the public to bid on salvage cars, which Florida doesn't. The problem is after finally seeing the car in person, there seems to be a bit more damage than I had originally anticipated. The front headlight is completely destroyed. The bumper, the fender, and hood need to be replaced. Practically all the airbags are deployed and even the rear tailgate needs replacing but I knew all of that from the photos when I bid on the car. The problem, however, is what the photos don't show. The back of the car is so much more pushed in than I had thought, there is a mysterious coolant leak, and the battery is completely dead.
So after reading all your guys' comments, I've come up with a pretty solid game plan in regards to where I'll begin working on this car. The first priority is going to be getting this car up and running and actually starting the engine, which involves me fixing this coolant uh, adapter leak, this broken coolant hose right here, and then we'll pretty much see if it can start and run. Then I'll put coolant in the car here and see if everything starts up and runs smoothly. Once the coolant leak is fixed and I'm able to drive the car around a little bit, I'm going to start working on the front end as I believe that's the easiest way to start, getting as many small victories as I can as I've literally never worked on a car or rebuilt a car before. This is going to include bending this back into shape, getting the fender off, fixing the bumper, putting a headlight in, as well as the adaptive cruise control. And that involves plastic welding this bumper, which we're gonna try to attack today. So now that we have a game plan, I've already went ahead and purchased that hose adapter for the coolant leak, which we're gonna try to install right now. But before I do, I just wanna mention that this channel is gonna be more about the finance aspect of rebuilding a car, the costs, the process, so on and so forth, which I'll be breaking down all the parts and prices in my next episode. But for the time being, I bought this part on eBay for only 40 bucks, which isn't really a bad price. Now the process of installing this coolant adapter is a bit easier said than done. Since it's kind of tucked below the cold air intake, I decided it would be in my best interest to remove this first. I grabbed my biggest pair of pliers and wiggled the hose clamp off of the top of the box. Next, I grabbed a screwdriver to help me loosen the vacuum line off the back of the intake. Once removed, you can merely shimmy out the intake box and create enough room to access the coolant adapter. I figured now would also be a better time than ever to clean up the shattered headlight from the engine bay as there is a lot more space to work with. Once I got the area cleaned up, it was time to attack this coolant adapter. I removed the first clamp with a pair of pliers by getting the hose clamp off first and pulling away. Then I removed the biggest coolant hose, which was the same process. I also needed to use a screw screwdriver for this to separate the two pieces since it was stuck to the adapter. And lastly, I separated the clip with a screwdriver which was holding the adapter to the actual radiator. Once off, it was time to install the new one, which simply means repeating everything in reverse, making sure to put the clamps back, and it was good as new. Oh, and I also remembered to remove the old broken plastic from inside the coolant hose before putting it back on the new one. I ran into a bit of trouble trying to slide this onto the new adapter, so I used a little bit of WD-40 to make this process a bit easier. So since the original air box was damaged in the accident, as you can see, there's a big hole through here where it's not supposed to be, I decided I might as well upgrade it since the price of one of these OEM is the same price as an aftermarket one. So I went ahead and purchased an APR cold air intake, which should hopefully not only make it sound better, potentially add a little bit more horsepower with the right tune, but also it looks freaking dope. Installing this cold air intake is extremely straightforward. I just pushed it back into the turbo inlet pipe, connected the vacuum line back to the back of the intake, and then made sure that the intake was sitting properly. Next, I just put the hose clamp back into the right spot, and just like that, I had officially installed a cold air intake. Something tells me this will probably be the easiest repair of this rebuild, so with that in mind, I'm enjoying the small victories while I still can. I also made sure to to tighten down the cold air intake so that it won't fall off while I'm driving the car. All right, so with the new coolant adapter installed over here and that we put back a new non-broken cold air intake, I should be able to have a closed system now for coolant. So when I pour the coolant in, it hopefully, fingers crossed, should not leak. Another thing I did notice about the car that I was fiddling with a little bit here is the fact that this coolant line is kind of rubbing against this ever so slightly. And then I noticed that there is some broken tabs over here so I'm gonna have to look up this part number and replace it but I'm not gonna mess with this until I take the bumper off and actually see what else is damaged so here's a question for all you Volkswagen drivers out there I have heard mixed opinions about removing the silica bag from your coolant reservoir. Now, since I've heard horror stories about it ripping and destroying your coolant system, I decided to remove it now since the reservoir was empty. But let me know if that was a good idea down in the comments below. And if I'm wrong to remove it, then I can always put it back in. Now, after removing the silica bag, it was time to top off the car with coolant. I had some leftover G13 OAT coolant from my Audi RS3, so I used the rest of it to top off the car. And a trick I learned is to squeeze the coolant 
coolant hose behind the radiator a few times to let some of the air out of the system. You'll know it's working when you start to see air bubbles come up from your coolant reservoir. So I just poured some coolant into it and it seems like it really didn't take all that much, which fingers crossed means there wasn't that much coolant that spilled up. Just a little bit from the top here, but I am gonna start the car and see once it cycles through and the thermostat opens, if it will suck more of the coolant down with it. And then as it does that, I'm gonna to top it off. Now this is the officially second time that I'm gonna be starting this car since I got it. One was taking it off the ramp and this is gonna be like officially the first start. So fingers crossed and let's hope that it actually starts up. Funny enough, I didn't even have time to start the car before I noticed that the coolant tank was already empty, which means that air is getting circulated through it. Now I did check under the car. I don't see any leaks. So hopefully we do have a closed system. Now, prior to buying the car, I did have somebody inspect it and they did check the dipstick to see if the oil was milky and it wasn't. It's actually at a perfect oil level and not milky at all. So I feel confident running the car. Now, one thing I forgot to mention is before I even started working on the car, I did check the battery in preparation for getting the car up and running later on in the day. When I checked my battery, it was showing 0.89, which is incredibly low for an AGM battery. I even bought this Vice Viking fully automatic uh, microprocessor controlled battery charger from Harbor Freight to hopefully charge it up over a couple of hours and it was coming up as it was completely dead. So I'm just deciding to replace it entirely as it is the original battery from when the car was manufactured about seven years ago. So it's probably a good time to replace it anyway. Replacing a car battery might be one of the easiest things you can do on your car. You simply disconnect the terminals, take off the leads, and in this instance, unscrew the lower plate that holds the battery snug. Now, being that this is fairly straightforward, I want to take the time to explain what happens when you let your car battery sit uncharged over a long period of time, like this Volkswagen Golf R did when it was in the Copart yard. Given I'm sure it had its accessory lights on when it sat for over a month in the yard, it completely drained the battery. Now, some might say that this battery was savable, but I'd rather not take the chance on a seven-year-old battery. When a battery like this sits over a long period of time at a low voltage, a process called sulfation starts to take place. This is the formation of buildup or lead sulfate crystals on the surface and in the pores of the active material of the battery's lead plates, which usually causes permanent damage if left uncharged for a long period of time. Once I had the battery installed, it was time to coat it to the car. So the first thing you're gonna wanna do is take the OBD11 and plug it into the OBD reader at the bottom left-hand side of your dash. Once plugged in, navigate to the app on your phone and then just turn the battery on the car. Now that it's in, all we do is just click connect right here and we should start populating everything. We click the Bluetooth, it'll start connecting to the car and it should automatically detect a vehicle or you might have to enter a VIN really quick. But now it's already reading the control units as you can see here, hopefully. Now, while this is happening, we're probably gonna see all the fault codes on this and I wouldn't be surprised if we see over 100 because of the amount of things that are unplugged or damaged on this car. So as the computer scans the car and I start to see all the fault codes, it quickly reminded me that I have quite the project on my hands. And it's times like this that I remind myself that it's good to step out of my comfort zone and try new things. Yes, it might seem overwhelming at first, but if I break it down into smaller projects, the small victories will hopefully continue to motivate me and push me through until it's complete. Anyways, once the system scan is complete, I clicked on gateway, then adaptation, and then battery adaptation. Then it was time to just enter the battery capacity, manufacturer, serial number, and type in the type of battery, which is AGM. Then I just slide right and it coded it to the computer. Without this little tool right here, this project would be pretty much impossible. And I wouldn't be able to read any of the codes and be able to perform pretty much any of the maintenance on this car. I actually bought this for my RS3 and the cool thing about the OBD11 is it works for Volkswagen, Audi, Skoda, and a lot of other European brands. So if you haven't got one of these, consider this the holy grail for owning any sort of European car and make sure to pick one up down in the description below where you can help support the channel. The best part is these things are relatively cheap, about 60 or $70. It can also read cars like BMW, Mini Cooper, Bentley,
Bentley, and even Lamborghini. Now, what makes this device so unique is it gives you features that usually only dealers have, such as scanning, reading, and even clearing various fault codes on your car, allowing you to ease the process of maintaining your car with only a few clicks on your phone. You can even enable, disable, and change the configuration of various features and functions in your car, even some hidden settings that I bet you never knew you had. And the best part is this gives you access to resetting your control unit, doing diagnostic service changes, and even coding your car like I did with the battery. Oh, moment of truth, I have the key right here. I'm gonna start the car with the coolant tank open and see if that can start flushing out some of the coolant and potentially lower it. Now, this is the first time I've started this in a long time, so I guess wish me luck. Wow, start it up easy. Sounds great too. Cars in park. We have a few things on the dash. No coolant leak though, I don't think. But it does sound like it's running. The fans are on, good sign. Coolant looks okay. Lights are on. Hopefully these fans die down because it does sound a bit too loud. It doesn't seem like it needs to be running that fast. All right, so we might have another problem on our hands and I just took a quick break because I was freaking out a little bit um, and I'm not exactly sure what the problem is, but uh, I just want to show you really quick what's happening with the car when I turn it on. All right, so I put the coolant in the car. Everything seems to be holding coolant. Uh, there's no leaks that I can see so far. Granted, I didn't take the bumper off. And if you can check right here, you can see we do have coolant in the car. It's at the min line, which seems to be fine. Um, I'm gonna top it off a little bit more. Granted, I only ran the car for a minute and it sounded good. It sounded really good, but there seems to be a problem which made my heart drop. All right, so look what happens when I start the car. Watch the needle on the gauge here. As you can see, that's not good. It's. That's almost at zero RPMs. The engine sounds on though, and this made my heart sink. We're at zero RPMs, but the car is on. It doesn't make sense. The engine is still hot, the coolant is still hot, the temperatures, everything is good. But look, we're at zero RPMs. As you heard, the engine sounds pretty much normal, and there's really not enough damage to the front that I would think the engine is fine. And this car is bone stock, so What's interesting to me is why would the RPMs go all the way down to zero when the engine sounds like it's on? Another interesting thing, granted, I'm not entirely sure about this, but the fans kick on almost immediately and they stay on for quite a long time. Now, that could be because I changed the battery on the car and things need to be reset, or because I haven't waited long enough for the fans to bog back down. And I also haven't checked any of the codes on the computer, so I don't know necessarily just yet, but I'm just nervous as hell as to why I'm getting zero RPMs. So here I am thinking that I bought lemon and the engine is actually dead and I got screwed getting the car inspected by a third party but I think I just found out what the problem actually is and feel free to let me know in the comments down below if this has ever happened to you. All right so watch what happens when I turn the engine off. Watch the needle on the gauge. So already turning it off in three two one. Look at that. That seems to be the problem. It seems like the needle is out of calibration because I don't think the needle should be resting less than zero. Notice here, the, all, all the other gauges seem to be at zero correctly, except for the RPM reading, which tells me this is off. And it almost seems like it's off about 1000 RPMs. So I'm not a betting man, but I think that's the problem. I have a gut feeling that the needle is out of calibration and it should be a little bit higher. Now, I don't know how to fix that. Hopefully I can move the gauge, the needle ever so slightly, and that might solve the problem. But uh, let me know down in the comments what you think. So moving on to something that won't give me a mini heart attack, I think I'm going to change course and try to fix this adaptive cruise control module. Now, luckily during the accident, it didn't actually break this wiring harness, which would have been a huge setback trying to find one of these because this isn't sold separate. It's connected to the whole like bumper of the car. Now what's interesting is it actually snapped off the old piece right here and I should be able to just wiggle this out. Yep, just like that and you can see this is the old piece from the uh, adaptive cruise control sensor. What's crazy is Volkswagen sells that adaptive cruise control sensor for over $900. Crazier is that same sensor is not only on the uh, Volkswagen Golf R, 
It's the same exact thing on my Audi RS3. The process of installing the adaptive cruise control sensor is extremely easy. Now I'm crossing my fingers and hoping that that's it and all I have to do in regards to this system once I reset the computer. Otherwise, there's a really good chance this will probably have to be calibrated in a later time. But I'm hoping I won't have to do that since only the sensor was knocked out of place. The actual bracket and the alignment seems to be perfect from how it was factory. I was also able to pick up the cover which goes neatly over the top of the sensor to make it look a little bit better as I think it serves no other purpose. With the car finally in driving condition, I felt comfortable enough to start moving it around under its own power in preparation to remove the front bumper. With a little help from my dad, we were able to get the car up on some ramps. This is to give me enough clearance under the car to remove the screws holding the bumper to the actual car. Now, since I'm sure there will be wires needing to be disconnected, I decided to unplug the battery first just to make sure I don't short anything out. Next, it was time to remove the broken front grille by removing a few torque screws. Then I could simply pull it away. Next, there are approximately four torque screws in the wheel well, which need to be taken off on both sides. And lastly, there are a bunch more torque screws underneath the car. Next, I unplugged the wiring harness. And when I was confident enough that I had all the screws out, I gave each side of the bumper a tug and it popped right off. The last step in the removal process was figuring out how to take the headlight washer hose out without spilling the wiper fluid everywhere. It took me a few minutes, but then I realized the easiest method was to just drain it from one side and then the other, and then just hang the hose on the car once I removed the whole thing from the bumper. And just like that, the bumper was free and finally out of the way. Then it was time to clean up my mess from all the headlight leftover coolant and wiper fluid all over the floor. All right, guys, so bumper is officially off the car. It was a bit of a pain in the butt trying to figure out where to disconnect the washer fluid bottle. I decided to just unravel it and shove it in the corner right over here, just because it was easier to disconnect it from the front end of the bumper than to go and shimmy under the car and disconnect it there and have it drain everywhere. So as you saw, it was pretty simple and probably the way I recommend taking a full bumper off. But let me just show you super quick what the front bumper looks like and the damage that we're gonna have to fix and hopefully be able to plastic weld. All right, so all in all, the bumper really doesn't look all that bad. I really don't see much damage on here. There's a few things we're gonna have to try to bend back into place, but nothing looks cracked or really broken that needs to be replaced. The only thing that needs to be fixed on this though is right here. So we're gonna have to bend these back in, push these back in, and hopefully be able to plastic weld this, sand it down, and then put some primer on it and get it ready for paint. But that's the only thing I noticed broken on this car, which is exciting because that means I get to save the whole bumper. So very happy. We'll do that in another. I bought a crash 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. And at the time it seemed like a great idea, but the more I take this car apart, the more problems I'm running into. But I'm not giving up hope just yet. When I originally bought this car, by the looks of the photos, I really only thought it needed a few repairs. Yeah, a headlight, hood, rear bumper, a tailgate, and maybe a few airbags, but boy, it was I completely wrong. See, that's the thing about bidding on cars you've never seen in person, sight unseen. More than likely, the photos you see just don't do the car justice, and in this case, they most certainly do not. In my last video, I managed to get the car to start. Wow, it started up easy. I successfully fixed the coolant leak, replaced the completely dead battery, and even got the bumper off. The problem is it's starting to feel like every single step forward I take, I end up taking two steps back. Not only did I find more broken pieces like the radiator support behind the bumper, but I almost thought I had a blown engine. It was showing zero RPMs on the dash after I started the car. As you can see, that's not good. It's, that's almost at zero RPMs. Fortunately though, I think I might just need to calibrate the needle on the dash and we can get it back to working. The engine actually seems to be all right. Now I do have some good news. As you can see, parts have finally started to arrive. And hopefully by the end of this video, we should have a fairly nice looking front end on the car. At least that's the goal. So let me show you what I got. So far I have a brand new hood OEM 
I have a quarter panel as well as the front grille over here and a new headlight. Now the first thing I want to replace in today's video is going to be this quarter panel for a few reasons. Number one, it helps mount the headlight to the front of the car. And number two, there's this dreaded sound when I open the door every single time because the door hits the quarter panel. So we have to fix that right now. Now I'm hoping removing this quarter panel is pretty straightforward as I believe there's just a few bolts here, here, maybe some up here, and then a few behind the door. And then hopefully I could just pull it off. Now there might be some issues because this is pulled in. So hopefully I can either pull this out myself or figure out a way around this without actually uh, doing any more damage. I also wouldn't be surprised if there were some other bolts under this panel here, which means we're gonna have to get this tire off and the car up on a jack stand. The first thing I needed to do was remove the stubborn caps Volkswagen puts on the top of their lug nuts. Once those were off, it was time to break out the brand new impact wrench I bought and put it to the test. Using a 17 millimeter impact socket, I loosened up the five bolts holding the wheel to the car. I just wanted them loose and not fully off until the car was in the air. Then it was time to jack the car up. Now, I'm sure there are plenty of different ways of doing this, but because I wanted to put the car on a jack stand and not just leave it on the jack itself, I decided it would be best if I jacked the car up from the rear. This way I had enough room to put the stand in the front. Once I had the jack in the proper place, I was able to lower the car down. The reason I jacked the car up from the back of the car and not the front is because there's little spots on the car where you can put an actual jack on. And unfortunately, there's not enough room to put this and that at the same time, or so I know. Now, as you, you can't really see it under the car, but there is a spot here, but maybe you can see it a little bit better where I put the actual jack stand. You can see right here, this is where you can actually put a jack or a jack stand. And that isn't big at all, but it does give me enough room to put this jack on to get the car lifted off the ground. I continued to remove the wheel and made sure to put it under the car. This is always a good idea because God forbid the jack fails, the car would land on your rim and not on yourself or directly on the floor. Finally having clearance, I could begin to remove the torque screws that hold the fender lining to the car. After moving my way to the top, I removed two 10 millimeter bolts and a sneaky eight millimeter bolt that was hiding underneath the windshield lining. Using a wrench, I took off the two mounting bolts on the underside of the fender and then it was time to remove the two hidden 10 millimeter bolts from behind the fender liner. Up until this point though, things were going pretty easy. That is until I came across this rubber plate that prevents things from getting behind the fender. I must have spent a good half an hour to an hour trying to remove this stubborn thing. Now, I'm sure I could have taken off the door and it would have made this process a lot easier, but I really didn't want to. If my hunch is correct, there's only two more bolts, one here and then one up top. And then this whole panel should ideally come off. I would like to be able to show you, but I don't know if you're gonna be able to see it. It's right there is like one and the other is up here, but you're just gonna to have to take my word for it and this whole thing should come off. Finally, the quarter panel is off the car. Honestly, it wasn't too bad. Scaled a one to 10, probably like a four, if not maybe even a three. It really was pretty easy, even with the damage that was on the car. But let me show you the extra damage that I found that doesn't seem all that bad. All right, so honestly, there really doesn't seem to be all that much damage here to the side of the car. I can compare it to here and I notice what needs to be straightened out and what doesn't, but it seems pretty easy. This I'm sure needs to be straight so that the uh, new quarter panel can bolt up to it. This needs to be bent back, which is super tiny. And this looks like it should be straight. You can see it's kind of bent here on an angle when this also is on an angle, but this piece is straight. So I have to bend that back um, and then we can bolt up the new quarter panel. First thing I need to do to straighten out the support arm is remove the upper support bracket from being in the way. It's only held on by three bolts, so it was easy to remove. With that off the car, it was time to straighten out the metal. Now, I bought some needle nose vice grips at Harbor Freight for this exact reason. I had a feeling I would need to bend metal at some point on this car. Now, I don't really have a plan for doing this, but I did realize it was more bent than I thought. 
it's supposed to actually look like a square, which clearly it doesn't. Using the vice grips with a rag, I was able to easily bend the metal back into shape without scraping off much of the protective primer, which prevents against rust in the future. For any of those spots though that I did get nicked, I used some automotive primer to cover it up quick. And also, yes, I'm aware I'm calling it a quarter panel when it's really a fender. So go easy on me in the comments. All right, so in here should be the new used, but pretty much new quarter panel. I bought it OEM on eBay. Somebody was selling it used probably to fix their old Golf R and decided not to. And this is what they sent me. All right, so here we have it, a new OEM quarter panel for the Golf R. Now it's time to install it, make sure everything lines up, and then hopefully we'll be able to install or at least try to see if the headlight I bought works. All right, so I just wanna line this up on here and then I'll bolt it down. I just wanna make sure it fits and everything looks good. Now, um, I've been going back and forth as to whether or not I wanna fully like bolt this down, install it, because at some point it is gonna need paint. And I think I am going to because there's a lot more on this car that needs to get done first before it's time to paint. And I'd rather have this on securely if the time comes that it does need to be driven, um, nothing flies off. So let's install this back how we took it off. Installing this fender was surprisingly pretty easy. Now, at first, I just wanted to align it up with the car and make sure that the gaps and everything was good. And then once I had a visual that it was all aligned correctly, I could go ahead and tighten everything down into place. Now, I did run into a few hiccups trying to align everything because I didn't realize that there was a front bracket, or you can see the front bracket, was actually sticking out a little too much and it needed to be adjusted by the those two screws. Once I tweaked that into place, everything actually fit how it was supposed to. All right, so everything seems to be lining up okay on the car. And then I'm starting to run into this issue where their holes are not getting so close. And then I noticed where this issue is. You can see how far off this bracket is from the holes where it should be. Then I notice I have two bolts right here. So I'm gonna to try to unscrew these bolts and hopefully that'll be enough to align this. You know, it's gotta move like an inch, so fingers crossed. Right, so good news and bad news. The good news is I was able to get the quarter panel put on the car. Everything lines up perfectly, which is good. It took me probably an hour of fiddling to get the bracket to line up and everything to line up uh, in its holes, which it does, that's the good thing. The bad thing is because I bought a brand new quarter panel, not a used one, it doesn't come with all of the uh, little nuts and bolts that the old one did. And what I mean by that is these rivet nuts that I wanna show you. As you can see on the old old quarter panel, there are these like riv nuts or rivet nuts, you can see it here, that are kind of like screwed down into the panel. And I really have no way of figuring out how to take these off. And the problem is they don't have these on the, the new panel, which is a pain in the butt. So now I have to order them from Volkswagen or figure out how to get these off. But otherwise, you know, looking at things on the bright side, the panel does line up perfectly. It looks good on the car. Now, I think just uh, so we don't stop the project here, I'm gonna try to fix the, uh, the new headlight or set up the, uh, the new headlight that I got. All right, so since I don't have the rev nut and it's on order and it'll be here in a few days from Volkswagen, I figured now would be the best time to move forward and try to figure out if I can fix the headlight. Now, this is the remainder of the headlight. Now, this is good news. I know this doesn't look like good news that I can use this for the headlight, but it is because for whatever reason, Volkswagen likes to make very specific headlights. Uh, it's not just a bulb. There's literally computers 
that go on the headlight. And for whatever reason, there's four of these computers that go on the headlight. Now, if I didn't have these, there'd be a good chance I wouldn't be able to use any headlight at all. So let's see if using these computers will solve that problem. Now I was able to get a secondhand headlight off of eBay for about 400 and something dollars, but I'll give you the exact breakdown a little later in today's video. All right, so here is the left headlight. Looks good, it goes this way here. And as you guys can see, it did not come with the four computers. One, two, three, four. So I'm gonna install those right now, then we'll plug it into the car. And fingers crossed when I turn the car on, everything should work. I'm so happy I was able to find the rest of the broken headlight in the trunk of the car, because without them, fixing this headlight would be that much harder. Fortunately, because we do have them, the process of getting this headlight working should actually be pretty easy. At least that's what I thought until this happened. God. What you're seeing is literal rainwater pouring out of one of the headlight modules. This is really not how I wanted this day to go. I decided since it was just rainwater though and not salt water from any sort of flood, maybe there was still a chance of getting this headlight to work. And by some stroke of luck, when I took it apart, I didn't see anything corroded, which is a really good sign. With that in mind, I decided to put the rest of the headlight back together, transfer the two bulbs that I found into the new headlight, plug it into the car and see what would happen. All right, so I managed to put all the computers back on the headlight. Good news yet again, and bad news. The good news is they all seem to have fit perfectly on here. Bad news, two different things. Number one, one of them had a ton of water in it from, I guess, sitting in the back of the trunk, which is definitely not a good thing, but I was able to unscrew it, look at the inside of it, and it appears that there doesn't look like any corrosion, so fingers crossed it works. Now, the other thing that is a problem is because I bought this headlight practically new from eBay, I didn't have any bulbs, which is good and bad. I was able to find the old bulbs from the broken headlight. Problem is both of those bulbs are broken, so the light likelihood that somehow both of these big headlight bulbs start to display is slim to none. There's just no chance with those broken bulbs, so I'll have to order those. But the turn signal and some of the other things should at least work, and fingers crossed it does, that all those computers work as well. So I'm gonna plug this in, I'm gonna turn the car on, and I'm gonna put the directionals on or something, the blinker, and fingers crossed we have power that everything was able to work with those computers. All right, so I'm gonna go turn on the car and see what exactly happens. Damn, so nothing right now, but I think I see potentially power, let's see. Yeah, there we go. So we got power going to the headlight. This is awesome. So I have a feeling that when I change out both of those bulbs, everything should work perfectly. So this is definitely an exciting good sign. That means that hopefully all four of those computers, even though the tabs are broken, should be working good. Now, one thing I am noticing is the DRL seem to stay on on that one and they don't seem to stay on on this one, but I'm gonna go turn on the auto lights and see if that does anything. Oh, well, I'm seeing light, so that's pretty incredible. I see both this and this is lit up and it's very bright. So I think they're actually working. Maybe they just need to be coded somehow. Well, after doing a bit more research online, I realized that DRLs or daytime running lights come installed in the headlights and that the bulbs have no effect on them working or not. I learned what actually sends power to the DRL is one of the control modules. Comparing part numbers to the one online, I found the module that I thought controlled the DRL and decided to take it apart, clean off anything I saw corroded, and to my surprise, there was actually very little, which easily wiped off 
cloth with some rubbing alcohol. With everything cleaned up, I put it back together and gave it another test on the car. I have a feeling that that daytime running light module is probably broken from the corrosion. So the next thing I'm going to do is try to take the module out of that one and put it in this one. And if this light turns on with the daytime running light, then it should be the module that needs replacing and it might not actually be coding. So it was on to taking off the other headlight, which I know works perfectly. I read somewhere in a forum that these control modules are actually universal and aren't coded to any specific headlight, which is definitely good news to me. That means it should be plug and play. At least that's what I'm hoping for, fingers crossed. Removing the headlight involves just taking off a few torque screws, and I also needed an extension to reach a couple of them. Then it was just as simple as unplugging plugging it from the back and I was good to go. Next, I needed to swap over the DRL control module from the working headlight to the broken one and then go test it on the car again. All right, so moment of truth. Fingers crossed that this works and it's not coding and I just need to buy a $50 module and everything will be good with the headlights. Pray for me right now. Let's see. Just gotta plug it in and turn the car on. It's like the lights turn on, but the DRL doesn't. So there's a good chance this is probably has something to do with coating the headlight instead of it being the headlight itself. But I don't know. Let me know down in the comments if you have any idea as to what this could be. Does it actually need to be coated? Even though I'm using all the original modules and I just swapped the module over and the DRL still doesn't turn on. All right, so swapping out the module didn't work, but I just discovered something, noticed something that, you know, fingers crossed, this might actually solve the problem. Now, um, I was wondering, like, why wouldn't the module actually work? Uh, we took it apart, it looks okay, but then I realized, hey, maybe it's the one that had all the water in it that's actually the problem. Even though it looks not corroded or anything inside, that could be the issue. The other thing I did is I took both of the old modules out, and I'm looking at the part numbers, and they are practically identical. This one says, it probably won't even load. This one says 4G09076972G. And this says 4G09076972H. So we're talking about a G and an H. So I don't know what the difference is. They look practically identical. I'm gonna swap both off, put the new ones from the new light that I know works onto the old headlight or the new headlight that I, I bought and uh, we'll see if that solves the problem and then I'll know which part to order. So I'm gonna swap everything over now. We'll see if that works. I have a feeling it might, I really do. So we tested this top module before and nothing changed, which is telling me that maybe the one that I had that I thought was broken isn't. Now we're gonna test this one. Even though I put swapped both over, this is truly the one that we're gonna test and see if it works. All right, so here goes the last and final attempt on seeing if it's the modules. Even though there's one more, I don't think, or two more, I don't think those are the reason. And if this doesn't work, then maybe I'll just swap those over for good luck. But this hopefully, when I search DRL module for Volkswagen Golf R on eBay, these are the two that come up, not these two. But uh, we'll see what happens. Just plug this in. This is the moment of truth that we've all been waiting for. And we got power, baby! We figured it out! 
It works. Oh my god. So now we know exactly what part number to order. I can't believe it worked. I cannot believe it freaking worked. So it's a new day and I was able to pick up the rivet nuts from Volkswagen. They were actually able to get it within one day from me calling. But before we go ahead and install these onto the quarter panel and then officially install the quarter panel onto the car, I just want to go over the build cost of this project with you guys so far. The winning bid was $11,300. And what some of you guys are curious is the sales tax with the copart fees came out to $2,372.73. I did get the car shipped from Georgia to Florida because it would have cost me practically the same uh, and I would have lost 20 hours from driving uh, and that was 550 bucks. So this currently gives us a grand total of $15,927.61, which isn't bad so far. Now what you guys need to consider is this car only has 34,000 miles on it, which really isn't that bad. Um, and one similar that wasn't in an accident with 34K, a 2017 Volkswagen Golf R, goes for about 33, maybe $34,000. Now, rebuilt cars usually go for about 20% less. So that would give this car, once it's fully rebuilt, about a value of 24 to $26,000 all set and done, which isn't bad. Now we are only at $15,927, which if we round up is $16,000, and we have about a $10,000 more budget to work with uh, for us to break even on the car. Now, obviously we wanna spend lower than that, but if I break even on my first car, that's totally fine with me. With that being said though, let's start putting this fender back into place. All right, so the time has come where I have to install two of these kind of rivet nuts onto the quarter panel in order to install it on the car. Now, I don't have a rivet nut gun to install this, so I'm gonna try the next best thing and kind of take the same concept and use a wrench and a ratchet with a long screw and a lock nut, and hopefully I can put enough power down to crush this into place without breaking anything and hopefully actually working. For those still confused, a rivet nut or riv nut is a one piece internally threaded tubular rivet that can be anchored entirely from one side. Its main use is to attach things together without the need to weld. It's also useful because it can be used on different materials like metal, plastic, and even wood where welding can't. Now, because I don't have a rivet gun, I wanted to try to replicate the same purpose as a gun by just using some everyday objects. This involves inserting the rivet nut into place and putting a wrench on the lock nut before threading the bolt into the rivet, screwing the bolt into place and holding the end of the screw with a socket. Keeping the screw in place with my socket, I was able to then start torquing down the lock nut and in theory it should be applying enough force up that it pulls and crushes the lock nut beneath it. And just like that, it worked surprisingly. Now it's time to finally install the fender properly onto the car. This process involved lining everything back up again before tightening down the bolts. With all the bolts officially installed on the fender, I could reinstall the plastic guard back behind the door, which took another hour to do put the mud guards back onto the car, and then finally tighten the lug nuts down to the rim. So check it out, the fender is installed properly. I aligned it, all looks good in my book. You can see the gaps all look good. Everything is aligned well, and it's on there nice. And uh, yeah, that's gonna be it, because I am exhausted. But everything is exactly aligned how it's supposed to be. It all looks good to me. It was a fairly easy job, nothing too difficult. And you can see now the door opens and it doesn't make that sound. A little over $11,000 bought me this 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. And as you can see, it's still missing its front end, but hopefully by the end of today's video, we'll be able to put it back together. What if I told you there was a way to get the car of your dreams at a fraction of the price? The only catch is you have to fix it yourself. This is Copart Punagorda. Got our vests on. 
Would you do it or pass up on the opportunity? Well, recently I had that same question asked to me and I said yes. As you can see, I now have a 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. What normally sells for $33,000, I got for only a measly 11K. discounted over 60% than what it's worth. The only thing is I have to fix it myself, which could be an issue since I have literally no experience working on cars. In my last video, I actually made decent progress repairing the car. I was able to put a new fender on and even figure out what's wrong with the headlight. And we got power, baby. We figured it out. But that's only a few reasons as to why this front end is still in pieces. Now, the reason it's still in pieces is because there's still a few more things that kind of need to get replaced. As you can see, there's still a lot of things broken on the front end of this Volkswagen. We do have this like support bar that I do have a replacement for, but the main problem that's preventing us from putting the headlight and the bumper on the car is because of this right here. This, if you can see, is a broken radiator support panel that fortunately I was able to find on eBay for only about a hundred bucks. Now I've noticed in the past couple of videos that I tend to get ahead of myself in thinking how quickly I'll be able to fix something and it actually ends up taking a lot longer. So I just wanna map out the plan for today. First thing we're gonna install is this bracket piece right here, which helps mount the headlight to the fender. This should be the easiest part of today's journey. Once we have that installed, we're gonna move on to what's most likely going to be the longest and hardest part of today's project and that's gonna be installing the radiator support panel, which you can see right here. Now, it was a bit difficult because I didn't wanna buy this from Volkswagen, so I was able to get this aftermarket on eBay. It's not OEM, but it looks identical to what I'm going to be replacing, so fingers crossed, that it's a pretty simple install, and I'll show you more about that in a second. Now, once that's installed in the car, if you watched the last video where we replaced the headlight, or tried to fix the headlight, we kind of diagnosed the problem, I ordered the control module. This is not used, it's brand new, and it's not from Volkswagen, and it's not in, I believe, an official part, uh, which hopefully we'll be able to install. Now, before we get into the install, I managed to get my hands on the damage report that was given on the Volkswagen Golf R from the insurance company, and what I saw was absolutely shocking. As you can see, the body shop quoted over $500 for the radiator support panel and around eight hours worth of labor to install it. And as you know, labor is isn't cheap. What's shocking to me though is the parts price matches what Volkswagen sells it for, but I was able to get this third party on eBay for only $100 with free shipping. Now what's crazier is the headlight repair was quoted over $2,000 from the body shop, which I'm most likely going to be able to fix for less than 600 bucks. No wonder this car was considered a total loss. Unfortunately, it's raining in Florida today, so it makes for a harder video without light, but I do have this portable solar generator that I've been using, and this is able to power these kind of LED lights that I've strung to the garage here, and that's giving me enough light to work on this car. Now, if you wanna pick one of these bad boys up, I do have it linked down in the description, and it's actually really cool. I've also made a video on this before, which you can check out in the description as well. Getting into today's repairs, I'm starting off with the headlight support that gets mounted onto the fender. All I needed to do for this was just tighten down two bolts with, I believe, a 10 millimeter socket, and just like that, I had it installed onto the car. Next, I disconnected the battery, mainly because I had a feeling there was going to be a lot of sensors that needed to get unplugged. Last thing I need to do is pull an impact sensor while the battery is on and do even more damage to the car. Now, before we dive into replacing this radiator support panel, there's quite a lot of stuff that needs to come off of it first. Now, looking at this radiator support panel, it does appear that everything looks identical. This is for a Golf. Granted, this is a Golf 2, just the Golf R. Um, it does look identical to the one that I'm replacing. I mean, funny enough, we even have the rivet nuts again, as you can see here. And as we said in the last video, these can be used on metal, which we had to install, but also on plastic. So I find that funny that these are also now on plastic. Fortunately, this comes with the rivet nuts installed, so that is a blessing because I'm seeing quite a lot all over this panel. Now, in regards to working on this, I think we're gonna have to take these bars off first. 
then we're gonna have to take the headlight out, then the bracket's gonna have to come off, we're gonna have to take this off here, so on and so forth, and then we're gonna have to take the uh, front crash bar off, and then I'm hoping, fingers crossed, that this radiator support that goes apparently in front of this piece, maybe, it appears like that. If you look at these coolant, if you look at the uh, refrigerant lines here, they look to be in front of the bracket. So we're gonna have to try to remove that too. Each metal bracket has three 30 millimeter Torx heads that I unscrewed with my cordless ratchet. Then it was back to removing the passenger headlight again, which is held down by three more Torx screws and the wiring harness that needs to be unplugged. With both headlights out of the way, I had enough space to then begin working on the broken front support bar, as well as remove the two nuts mounting the locking mechanism for the hood to the crash bar itself. Well, as soon as I took this bolts off, you can see why this thing needs replacing. Look at how loosely this thing should be here. It definitely needs to come off. All right, so I think this is a good time where I also start unplugging sensors and stuff. Now, I see a sensor back here which I'm gonna unplug in a minute, but I also see one that's attached right under here, this wire, which is some sort of sensor, which I'm also going to try to unplug. There's quite a lot of things that need to get unplugged before I can move forward removing the radiator support. The obvious ones consist of this ambient air temperature sensor, which you just squeeze in the back and it pulls out. Moving on, there were these yellow crash sensor plugs on either side of the car, which involves pulling the red pin down using a screwdriver if it helps, and then pushing in and pulling to disconnect it. This is exactly why I unplugged the battery. Next was the hood latch sensor that needs to be unplugged, and then it was time to unplug both horns and release their harness from the bracket. And the last thing that needs to get unplugged is the radar sensor. All right, so with all these sensors, I believe unplugged and disconnected, I'm gonna start working on taking some stuff off. And I think what I need to take first, I'll start with the easy stuff, is this kind of air box right here that sends the air into the uh, cold air intake. In order to remove the airflow box, I first pulled the coolant hose off from the back of it and then just removed the two screws up top. It just slides out after that. Then it was time to remove all the screws and bolts that connect the front crash bar to the radiator support. Each side has a T30 screw on it. All right, so I'm pretty sure I've disconnected most everything that I need from the radiator support. And I think we should be ready now to start removing this actual crash bar, which is four screws, I think 16 millimeter on each side of the car. With everything disconnected and unscrewed from the crash bar, all that's left is removing four 16 millimeter bolts on either side of the frame. I just realized there are two bolts I left on, one at the bottom here and one on the other side. Get out, there's a sneaky bolt right there. And I believe the same thing on the other side right there that need to come off. All right, this time, hopefully removing the last two hidden screws, the front crash bar should just pull off. That was easy, that was pretty easy. That was pretty straightforward if you ask me. Put this over here. All right, so I think I'm at a point in taking this apart where I'm gonna wanna start pulling things off of this old bracket that I can remove and start putting it on the new uh, reinforcement bracket here. Uh, I only see a few things, so I wanna do that first and then we'll start taking more of this apart. From what I can tell, there doesn't seem to be much. I need to take this latch off here, which we're gonna do next. And I think I can disconnect it probably here, thread it into the new one. And then I believe there are these two kind of impact sensors here that I can remove, one on each side. And I think that's it. Maybe disconnect this down here. And then I can start maybe getting these clips out and pulling this off 
the car and try to install the new one. So before we continue any further with rebuilding the car, I just wanna break down the current build cost. As we left off, we are currently at $15,927.61. We have three parts that we are going to be installing. The radiator guide, which was the small skinny bracket, the radiator support, which is the big square thing, and then the DRL module, which is $61.76. In total, it's really not that bad. $104 for the radiator support, $42 for the radiator guide and the DRL was 61, so about 200 bucks for those three parts. That brings our new total for the build so far to $16,136.30. I started off by transferring over these plastic airflow covers from the old radiator support to the new one. Then it was on to disconnecting the wire that connects the lever inside the car to the hood latch. With that out of the way, I was able to remove and transfer the plate and hood latch by unscrewing and fishing both wires through the holes at the front of the radiator support. Both of these wires were actually held down in place behind the radiator support, so you have to kind of work with it with your hands to get it loose. Then I could transfer the impact sensors on both sides and also unscrew the bottom of the radiator support, which connects to the belly pan. For those wondering what the jack stand is doing on the floor, I use this as a way to hold up the condensers so that they don't hang by their tubes. The last and probably the hardest step was removing these two stubborn yellow clips that hold the intercooler onto the radiator support. I spent a good hour fiddling around with this because each side I got unclipped, the other side would pop back in. So I resorted to using two screwdrivers, pushing them in and then whacking it with a hammer and that seemed to have done the trick. With everything disconnected, I was able to pull the radiator up and away from the rest of the car, and this gave me enough space to slide the broken radiator support out without having to unscrew any of the radiator hoses. Alrighty guys, and there you have it. We have officially taken off the radiator support panel. Um, I just transferred everything over to the new one here. Uh, where is it? Right here. The old one is on the floor there. I'll show you guys a close up of that. But that was pretty simple. I think the most difficult part, literally the most difficult part was two clips. The two yellow clips were borderline impossible to take off. I had to use a hammer and a uh, flathead screwdriver. And then finally I was able to wiggle them out. But Officially, every single thing is off the car that needs to be off, and I was able to even move out the uh, radiator right there, I believe that's what it's called, the radiator, because the lines were made out of rubber, God bless, so nothing needed to be unplugged. Let me show you. All right, so check this out. I was able to move the radiator out of the way, then there's the intercooler and whatever there. This is the radiator, I believe, which has the refrigerant in it, and you can see I was able to just move these lines because they were rubber, right here, these two rubber lines, I was just able to slide this over without actually having to take anything off. I'm plugging it, which is really cool. Uh, here's the broken one, you can see right here, completely snapped right there. And then I transferred, as I was going apart, everything over to the brand new one here. So we should just be able to slap this back on and then start putting every single thing back together. And I think the assembly will be much easier than the disassembly. So with everything taken off the car and everything put back correctly on the radiator support panel, let's start putting it all back together.
right, so we have officially put in the last bolt for the front end of this car, including everything for the headlight as well as the front end radiator support. Now that means it's time to install this dreaded headlight, which you guys remember from the last episode, we found a faulty control module. Well, that part has officially come in. So now I have to install that onto the old head or onto the uh, new headlight that I bought. And then we're gonna put it into the car and fingers crossed that that solves the problem. And then we're really done with the front end of the car. All right, so before we start digging into the headlight, I just wanna show you the new aftermarket control module that I bought. So check it out, it's a brand new third party aftermarket uh, headlight DRL control module, which we're gonna try to install now. Now I marked the bad control module with an X here so I don't get confused when installing the, the new one. So the time has come to install the headlight into the car. The module is in, everything is tightened down. You guys are gonna be the first ones to see my reaction. Um, I'm gonna put it in first. If it starts up and lights up, then I'll tighten it down. But uh, I guess, uh, what am I waiting for? Let's just go put it in. I need to plug the battery back in. Let's do that really quickly. All righty, now let's go turn the, uh, the power on. We did it, yes sir, check that out. Lights are on on both, everything is working fine. So that tells you there's no coding needed to put this in as far as I know, as well as you can buy a third party non-OEM uh, control module for the DRL. That is insane, we have working headlights, this is incredible. All right, so with everything finally working correctly, it's time to actually uh, tighten everything back down into place. So I am missing a bolt on the side here and I'm hoping that when we were cleaning up in the uh, episode when we took the bumper off uh, and all the plastic fell on the floor, hopefully I have the screw that goes in the side here to mount this to the, uh, to the, to the headlight. Alrighty, so check it out right here. I'm glad I saved it. I don't know if you can see, but inside there is the missing bolt that is needed to mount the headlight. And this is the sole reason why you do not throw anything out on the car until the build is done. This right here is the damage report to my 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. Insurance said that the car is totaled because it would cost over $30,000 to repair. For example, the front bumper, as it states, it would cost over $1,100 in parts to repair. But today we're gonna try to do it for only about 50 bucks. A few weeks ago, I had the crazy idea to buy a crash damaged car and rebuild it. I thought it would be a good way to get an expensive car at a discount, if not a fraction of the price. Well, little did I know this would be one of the biggest challenges I had ever faced, mainly because I have zero experience working on cars. You see, when I first bought the Volkswagen Golf R, it really didn't look that bad in the photos, but boy, was I completely wrong. When I finally got the car in person, I realized there was a lot more wrong with it than I had originally thought. The car wouldn't start, there was no coolant and the deeper I looked into it the more broken things I would find but it was too late to go back on my word in the coming weeks I've managed to overcome quite a lot of obstacles I got the car running wow, started up easy replaced the damaged fender and in the last episode I even figured out how to fix the headlight and replace all the broken front end pieces so we've come quite far since the beginning 
So given the point of the front end of the car, as you can see right here, there's really not much more that needs to be fixed. Honestly, it's just the hood, which we can hopefully get replaced today, as well as fixing the front bumper you can see right here. So we're gonna start by repairing the front bumper of this car, and once this bumper is good and back in the car, then I'll be able to swap over the hood. Now, I really believe I'll be able to save this hood as well as about $1,100, and let me show you why. Luckily, the only thing that got damaged on this front bumper was just right here. As you guys can see, it just barely missed any of the sensors, and it's really only just plastic that needs to be pushed back. On the topic of pushing things back, we also have to push some of these panels back in, as they did kind of get popped out during probably the movement of this car with the big forklift. But honestly, this seems pretty easy to do. And then we're gonna start by trying to plastic weld this front from the underside, and then we're gonna put some body filler over it and hopefully get it back on the car. Starting with the lower grill, using a screwdriver and applying upwards pressure, I was able to pop out each of the clips that were holding the grill to the bumper. As you can see, there are quite a lot of tabs, so the task was quite tedious. With the grill finally out of the way, I was able to get to the lower silver trim pieces at the bottom of the bumper. Now, I had to bend the trim out and then around the bumper so that it could fit correctly into the clips. And this had to be done in a few different spots on the bumper. So all the cosmetic trim pieces are back in place, which look good to me. I took out the grill here because I'm trying to take everything that needs to come off in order to access the damage. I don't know if you guys can see it now, but this is where the damage is. There's about one, two, three, maybe four cuts in the plastic that we're gonna try to plastic weld. But in order for me to get a good area to work with here, I'm gonna have to remove all this stuff here first, and then we should be able to plastic weld. The first thing that I did was unplug the headlight washer as well as the the parking sensors. With everything unplugged, I was able to take off the first layer of plastic using a screwdriver. This plastic shield was only really held down by just a few clips, so removing it was pretty easy. The next step was removing the headlight washer assembly, which was held down by just two Torx screws. Now, in order to actually pull the assembly off the bumper, I had to remove the front plastic trim piece first, which was held down by two pegs, so all I had to do was bend them around the front plate and I was able to pull it off. Now with that out of the way, the assembly came right out. All that was left was the last piece of plastic, which was only held down by two more Torx screws and just some clips. So with everything out of the way, we can finally start bending everything back into shape before we go ahead and plastic weld. All right, so the heat gun worked really well heating up the plastic, and once it's heated up, it actually becomes really malleable, and I was able to align everything back into the right place for the most part. Now, I wanna show you guys the kit that I bought on Amazon for only 40 bucks. This is the plastic welding kit, and I'll link it down in the description if you wanna pick one of these up. It is extremely helpful, and it should make this project quite a lot easier. Now, it works uh, as such. Basically, you put a staple, it comes with these staples, into the end of here, these two prongs, you press the button and it heats the staple up and then you push it into the plastic, let go of the button, it cools down and you can pull it out and ideally, it'll hold it into shape as we staple it all together. They also come with a ton of different types of, of plastic that we can melt on using this prong thing here and we can melt it back into shape. And I'll show you guys in a second what that looks like, but this hopefully is everything I need to get this bumper back into shape. Now, once everything's stapled up and ready, then what we're gonna do is I bought this Bondo here, 3M lightweight body filler, and we're gonna fill it in, and then after, sand it down, and then we're gonna use uh, Z-Grip glaze, which is like a finishing putty to get it really smooth 
and then we should be good. Spray a little primer and we'll be good to go. Let me start off by saying I had a lot of fun using this plastic welder and I realized how useful this tool can be the next time something breaks as most everything nowadays is made of plastic. Like I said before, using this tool is pretty simple. You just insert a staple into the prongs and press the trigger to heat it up. Then you just push down into the plastic and it melts right through it. Now the thing you need to remember is not to go too far deep or you can push through to the other side. And the key step here is once it's in the plastic, you wanna turn it as this will embed the staple into the bumper. Then just let go of the trigger, wait a second for it to cool off and pull up. By doing this, the staple should stay where you put it. Then just repeat the process on all the places you're trying to mend together. Now, once the staples are in place, you can use the wire cutters that come in the kit to cut the ends off the staples, and you'll see why this is important in the next step. Once all the ends are cut off, you can either use the included polycarbonate rods to add plastic to the bumper and fill in the gaps, or you can just brush over the areas at the tops of the staples to close off any of the entry points. With the back of the bumper finally reinforced and fixed, I could start sanding down the high points in the front of the bumper with my Dremel. I'm trying to do as much work now so that the body filler process will be much easier. The last step was also to scuff up the bumper in preparation for the body filler so that it has a surface to stick to. So the bumper is pretty much repaired in regards to its sturdiness and holding its shape, but I wanna put it all back together and back on the car. And the reason is because leaving it on this stand here is changing the way the body lines are on this bumper. And I'll have a much better view on the car as to the way things are supposed to look before I start bondoing it as well as sanding it down into the correct shape. So let's put it back together. As I was putting the bumper back together, I did find another piece of broken plastic, so I quickly welded that back into place and then continued finishing the assembly. With everything installed back onto the bumper, it was time to loosely mount it to the front of the car. This can be done by positioning the bumper in front of the car and then pushing each of the sides in until they lock into the clips that are mounted on the fender. With the bumper mounted, I was able to put two center torque screws in just to hold it in place and help align everything to the car. I figured while we're at it, I might as well put the Volkswagen emblem on just to see what it looks like. It's been a long time. I did buy a, uh, a used one, so it should be the same, but not as broken as the last, which I'll show you. This is what the old one looked like, which ain't bad, but I have one that's actually complete. So let's put the new one on. So the front end is finally put back together and honestly it doesn't look half bad. There are a few things that I do notice that I do need to fix up but that's only because I bought this uh, as a used part on eBay. I just want to change maybe the emblem because it has a little more rock chips than the old one does 
And I also noticed that there's a little crack here, but I knew that when I purchased it, but that's easy. We can either glue that or uh, plastic weld it. That will be good to go. But otherwise, the front end looks really, really good. It's finally nice to see the front end taking shape. Uh, the only thing left we'll have is the hood, which should be a pretty easy swap over. But really, now all we need to do is just make this little imperfection over here just slightly better. And then obviously when we get the car painted, we'll have whoever paints it touch it up a little bit or, or maybe it'll be good to just throw on some paint. But I'm really liking the way this front end uh, is starting to look. Once I get that done, maybe then we'll start to actually put the bumper back on the car. So I've never actually used body filler before, but I've watched quite a few other car rebuild YouTubers use it. So I have a pretty rough idea on what to do. Now, once I had the bumper mounted, I used a rasp to file down the high points in the plastic. And this is just to save me time when it comes to sanding. Next, I laid out a perimeter with painter's tape so that I had an area to work with. This is by far the most important step and you'll see why later in the video. With my work area masked off, I quickly sanded everything down. Alrighty, so I sanded down the bumper enough to where I believe it's pretty close to flat. The next thing I'm gonna do is clean this with a little bit of water and some rubbing alcohol to get it ready. Now we're gonna mix up this body filler, apply it over here, and then sand it down. So as far as I understand, mixing body filler isn't really a science. The more hardener you use, the quicker it works. From what I've seen, just a pea-sized drop will actually do the trick. Then you just have to mix it well and apply it to the part you're trying to fill. Now, I used a piece of cardboard for this, but I'm sure they sell a special tool for this type of job. Anyways, after I applied it, I let it dry for about 30 minutes, and when I came back, the stuff was rock hard. I used my rasp again to file down the high points, and then I used 80 grit sand paper to shape it to the bumper. Now, given the area where the car was damaged, I needed to try and mold the body filler to the contour of the bumper and the body line that runs down the middle. I used a piece of masking tape above and below the body line to help me create and continue the edge on the bumper. Without this, I really don't think it would have came out as clean as it did. Next up was mixing this finishing putty, which helps fill in any pinholes and scratches left on the body filler. This stuff works the same as the body filler too, except you really don't need to apply that much. I also made sure to wear a mask and gloves as a precaution because I'm sure this dust is terrible for you to breathe in. Now lastly, I used 180 grit sandpaper to finish smoothing the bumper. From what I understand, when I apply the primer to the bumper, it should fill in all the scratches left on the 180 grit sandpaper and up. So that's why it's important to sand it down again after the 80 grit sandpaper. Alrighty guys, so it's a new day. We finished up the Bondo yesterday. We put uh, body filler on it as well as finishing putty. And then we sanded it down buttery smooth. It is very, very, very nice. We used a uh, 80 grit sandpaper to shape it and then 180 grit and then I used 400 grit to kind of smooth everything down and get it ready for some primer. So the next step is going to be using some rubbing alcohol, cleaning this area off and getting it ready for the primer that we picked up. And we should be good to go and it's ready for paint. I just wanna give you a close up of what this looks like. You can see the high points we had to sand down from where the bumper was kind of pushed in here. That's about it though. Everything else is very smooth. We were able to continue this contour line on the bumper. It was quite difficult, but we were able to do it using some painter's tape, as you saw, putting it across, sanding on top, and then putting it on top and sanding on the bottom. And now everything's smooth and we should be ready to prime it. After cleaning off the bumper, I used a big plastic tarp to protect the rest of the car from overspray. The last thing I wanna do is have to remove black paint from places that shouldn't have it at all. Now, once the car was covered, I cut a hole in the tarp and taped it down to the original tape that we used to outline the damage. Now you know why I originally taped the bumper. It keeps everything clean and and uniform. This way I don't accidentally sand or prime areas that weren't prepped and aren't ready for any touch-ups. Doing one final clean, it was time to put on a few coats of sandable primer. Waiting about 10 minutes between each coat to dry, I put on about three coats, which was enough to hide the body filler. It's been about an hour and I've let this dry and it's pretty much dry to the touch. This is pretty much how I'm going to leave the bumper for now. And it's time to take off this plastic wrap and then start working on getting getting this hood removed and putting the new one on.
With the bumper officially ready for the paint shop, it's time to start working on the hood. I bought this hood directly from the Volkswagen dealer near me because getting this shipped to me from anywhere else, even on a used or third party part, would have costed a fortune. All right, so before we continue any further, I just wanna break down yet again the build cost. There's three things that we have added. I forgot to mention one from uh, the previous episode, and that was the headlight fender mount, which was the small piece that went on the front of the fender to mount the headlight. That was only 13 bucks. We then have a new used, it is a used OEM part uh, that I got for $239. That is the grill where the Volkswagen emblem is. And then I bought a brand new hood that I picked up from Volkswagen for only $467 brand new, so the fitment should be spot on, except for maybe adjusting the brackets from the accident. So that brings our new total for the build to $16,857.09, which isn't bad for a pretty much fully completed front end. The first thing that has to come off is the hood latch, which was only held down by two bolts. Since the new hood is upside down, I have to install everything the opposite way, which isn't really a big deal. Next is transferring these four rubber spacers and then transferring all the clips that hold the hood liner to the car. Now I know I'm going to hear about this in the comments, so I wanna talk about this now. The reason I'm installing everything now before paint is because it will be a couple of weeks before the car is ready for paint, and I really don't wanna run the risk of losing any of the bolts in the meantime. Plus, so far everything's been pretty easy to install Stall, so I don't really mind taking it back off. Anyways, the next things that needed to be removed were these rubber guards that seemed to fill in the gaps between the headlight, the bumper, and the hood. I did have to bend the crush part of the hood with my needle nose pliers to create enough space to remove the one that was sandwiched in between. Lastly, it was time to remove the windshield washer sprayers, which involved pulling them down and towards me, and they just kind of popped out. Then you just have to unplug the connector and pull the black clip out and then pull the washer fluid hose off. With everything unplugged, I was able to take the gasket off and snake everything out of the hole it came from. So everything that has to come off the old hood is off and it's already been transferred to the new one. The last few things that's needed in order to get this hood officially off is taking off this kind of hydraulic arm and uh, unscrewing four bolts at the uh, the hinges, which is two here and two on the other side. Now, it's just me, and there's I already attempted it. There's no way I'm gonna be able to take this hood off myself and put the new one on. So I'm gonna have to wait, grab my girlfriend, and she's gonna help me put the new hood on. While I wait for her to come back, I figured I could fix the grill really quick. As you can see, the crack is in a tough spot to use the staples, but the kit does come with wire mesh, which should be perfect for this job. I cut out a small piece and bent it in half to create the same edge as the grill. Taping the grill into the right spot, I was able to put the mesh inside of it and melt it into the inside of the grill, which surprisingly fixed the problem. The last thing I wanted to do was swap the emblems from the broken grill to the new one on the car. This is because the broken one was in much better condition and didn't have rock chips. To do this, you just need to wedge something in between the emblem and its backing and then slowly work around it with a plastic pry tool and it should just pop right off. All right, so. Um, you're gonna stand on that side, hand up here, and then one on this side here, right? I'm gonna take your screws off the two nuts. Then I'm gonna take these two off here. First this, and then we're gonna walk it over. So with everyone on the same page, it was time to attempt the hood removal. I started by taking off the hydraulic lift, and then I unscrewed the two bolts on Heather's side, freeing it from the car. I did the same on my side and boom, the hood was actually off the car. Then I just had to reverse the process with the new hood, making sure everything aligned good enough so that it wouldn't hit the car when I closed it. The last step was snaking the wiring harness back into the hood and putting the windshield washers back on the car. So with the help from Heather, we were able to officially get the hood installed on the car. Now, I want to do a little bit of tweaking off camera because it is a little bit time consuming and I don't want to waste all my space and memory on this card, but that is official. We have officially gotten a new hood and the car is literally coming together. It looks so freaking cool. Let me show you guys what this looks like. So as you guys can see, the hood is officially on the front end of this car and the front end is looking really good if I do say so for myself. I'm actually surprised at how well 
this front end is coming together. Yes, there's a few things that we do need to tweak ever so slightly. Honestly, the body lines do look pretty good all the way to the car. I was having trouble aligning these gaps here and I'm thinking, oh, it has everything to do with the brackets here on either side of the car. And I was fiddling around with it and then I just realized something here. Do you remember those rubber mounts we installed? I just wanna show you real quick. When I pop this, check it out. These rubber mounts right here change everything on the car. And notice here, I didn't put them in at any specific way. You can see there's a few creases on here. If this goes up, a few creases here. Uh, this one's a little bit too far in. This one's really far in. This one's super far in. That changes how this car sits and mounts on the car. So if I adjust these a little bit, it should get this to line up perfectly and everything should be straight in on the car. So I'm super excited that it's literally just adjusting these things here and then we should be good to go. The front of my insurance total 2017 Volkswagen Golf R has finally been repaired, but there is still so much left that needs to be fixed. For example, all the airbags are still completely deployed and have not been replaced from the car. The dash still has a giant hole left in it. There's a ton of code still on the instrument cluster, and we even have this zero RPM reading when the car is running and on. And don't even get me started with the rear end of this car. This is the biggest of our problems. As most of you should know by now, and for those that don't, I bought a car on Copart, which is a place that mainly sells totaled vehicles online and in person. The reason I did is because I wanted a new challenge in my life, something that would test my abilities, and boy, did this thing deliver. This 2017 Volkswagen Golf R has proven to be one of the most challenging projects I have ever worked on. But over the past couple of weeks, I have been able to make some pretty good progress at least that's what I think, and hopefully you would agree. Now, picking up from my last episode, I was able to get everything fitted correctly on the front of this car, and off camera, I was able to align and adjust everything, which took a bit longer. I actually had to adjust everything, including the headlights, to make it look okay. But the one thing I haven't done yet is actually mount this bumper correctly. It's only being held on by two screws, and that's what we're gonna have to start off today's video with. <laughs> So first things first, the battery needs to get disconnected because I don't want to plug anything in while power is still going to it. This is just as a safety precaution not to short anything out. Then it's time to jack the car up and take the wheel off so I have room to work underneath and on the side of the car. I took the grill back off and the two screws holding the bumper on off because I need to reconnect the headlight washer lines and plug the parking sensor harness back in and I can't do that if the grill is still in the car. Then I can reassemble the bumper back on, putting back the two screws and reinstalling the grill yet again. And then the last steps are just putting all the torque screws around the sides of the bumper and the underside of the bumper as well. So the bumper is back on the car and everything is plugged back in. The parking sensors and the wiring harness is all connected and should be good to go, which means it's been a long time in the making, but I'm going to plug in our OBD 11 reader and clear some codes and see what is left. Now, last time we checked, we had over a hundred fault codes and I'm hoping since we have a headlight plugged back in and the bumper plugged back in, we should have a lot less fault codes. Obviously airbags and that stuff is still gonna be on there and some stuff with the rear end, which was hit, but we should still have significantly less. So let's kind of see what exactly is gonna happen. For those that don't know what an OBD 11 reader is and you own a European car, you're really missing out. With the car on and this device plugged in, it will actually scan the car for all the fault codes stored in the computer. Now, not only that, but this little device will even allow you to customize and unlock hidden features you didn't even know your car can do, and so much more. Now, on top of that, you can even long form code your car. If it wasn't for this device, this project would be nearly impossible to complete. So make sure you pick one of these bad boys up with the link down in the description below. So as you guys can see right off the bat, after giving this a scan, we have 118 follow codes, which honestly, is pretty scary if you ask me, but I'm gonna reset all the codes and see what's left and what we can start working on.
so I just reset the uh, fault codes and rescan the car. And we went from having over 118 fault codes to now having only 46, which is pretty incredible. I was really worried and my anxiety was going through the roof when I saw 118, but just a quick clear with everything plugged back in and changed on the front end, we've dropped it all the way down to 46, which is pretty incredible. Now, obviously there's still plenty of things that need to be done to this car, like all the airbags and stuff. And then that should lower this back down, but I'm very happy seeing only 46 codes now. So in regards to the fault codes that we do have, most of these, I'd say majority of them, I, I'm pretty sure I can fix. As you guys can see, almost everything else is perfectly fine in regards to the sensors. Everything is coming up good, except for just a few. We do have engine fault codes, which isn't saying the engine is bad. All it's saying, which honestly doesn't seem to be that big of an issue, but you can see we have exhaust door valve, which when I looked in the back, I understand why that is because the uh, harness is severed. So I have to re-solder that all back. And then the front has the ambient air temperature sensor, which I did notice in the front of the car did seem a bit broken. So this seems to be a fairly easy fix. We do have brake issues, not really much. I'm just seeing, uh, let's see, just steering wheel angle sensor, tire pressure monitor, that's whatever. Not worried about that. Air conditioning is not a big deal. Adaptive cruise control. I have a feeling that some of the stuff in the front needs to be reprogrammed. The faults, you know, what the when we put in the module, it just says error value received. So maybe we'll play around with that later. But also I know maybe with this cruise control, the whole rear end of the car is disconnected. So a lot of those sensors are also disconnected, which could have something to do with it. And then most of the fault codes, as you can see here, is clearly the airbag. So we, this is what we're gonna have to work on now, which is starting to replace some of the stuff that has to do with putting on these airbag codes. And otherwise, the rest of the things seem pretty easy. Gateway, steering assistance, multimedia, which is a fault code on like all Audis. And that's pretty much it. And obviously driver assistance with the rear end being damaged, but. Those fault codes don't seem to be all that bad. I'm still so relieved that we went from 100, I just can't shake it out of my head, 118 fault codes down to only 48. And I'd say probably a third of them, let's say 10 are just error codes that will clear once we start fixing other things. But majority of the, uh, the faults for the most part is from a lot of these airbag stuff. And that means we're gonna have to start off on this interior by removing the seat belts that deployed and trying to find the SRS module and sending it out for repair. So fun fact that I bet most of you watching don't know is that your seat belts are actually explosive and only have a one-time use. Yeah, you heard that right. You see, in an accident, your SRS module sends a signal to not only your airbags to deploy, but also to your seat belts, which ignites a small charge in the retractor and pretensioner that locks the seat belt itself in a certain position to cushion your impact in a crash and put you in the right place for the airbag. Once deployed though, your seat belts either need to be repaired or replaced. Now, in order to remove the seat belts, I need to first take off the plastic trim that covers them. There's a little airbag emblem at the top of the trim that needs to be removed first because behind it is a sneaky screw that holds the trim to the pillar. With that out, I can now take the first piece of trim off. The next piece is easy to take off because it's only held on by some plastic clips. So with the seatbelt covers out of the way, it gives me room to access the last two bolts in removing the seatbelt, which is one bolt here and then one bolt all the way down there right here, which might be tough to access, but I'll try to make it work. Now, what's really weird about this car and because it's Volkswagen is the type of bolt that this uses uh, because it's European and it uses this special tool right here. This is called an M10 and you can see if it loads, it looks really weird and it's found on mainly these European cars and this is what is used to hold these on. So the last step would be to just unplug these two clips right here and yellow usually means explosive and believe it or not, this is an explosive belt. So I have to just remove these two. Using a special 10 millimeter spline bit that of course I've only heard of European cars using them, uh, I was able to remove the first part of the seatbelt. Next was removing this bracket with a Torx bit, which holds the seatbelt to the pillar itself. And if you haven't noticed, I've been putting all the bolts back into their spot after I remove them. So I don't forget where they go when I reinstall everything later. Then it was time to unplug the detonator switches from the seatbelt. I used a small screwdriver to pull the orange safety lever up 
and then I could slowly pull them out. With everything unplugged, I could focus on getting what I thought was the last bolt out at the bottom of the seatbelt. I had to remove the door sill trim, which was a pain, and then I had enough room to access the bolt. Using the M10 again, I was able to unscrew the final bolt that held the retractor in the pillar of the car. There's another bolt. Alrighty, so new plan. I thought I was in the clear to get the seatbelts out and it appears I'm not and I might now have to take the seats out in order to access the seat belts, which is a pain in the butt because it's literally one bolt that I can't reach and it seems to be like under the seat. So now I have to take the seats out. If only it was that simple, right? Fortunately though, removing the seats is pretty straightforward. There are a total of four bolts around the seat that hold it to the floor. These obviously have to come out. Then I can tilt the seat back just enough so that I can access this little secret compartment below the carpet. This uncovers the three connectors, which I believe send power to the seat, as well as the airbags in the seat bolsters and probably power to the heating element that controls your heated seats. Now, I apologize in advance that my head's in the way, but I'll show you it up close on the other side as there is a specific way to remove these clips. With everything unplugged though, I could pull the passenger seat out of the car, revealing even more seatbelt stuff than I had originally thought. Underneath the carpet is the pretensioner, which has a another detonator plug at the end of it. Now it's screwed down by two more M10s and a few plastic clips that connect the wiring harness to the top of the pretensioner itself. With everything unplugged and unclipped, you can then slide the pretensioner back and it just comes out. Next was obviously putting all the screws back to where I got them from. So with the seatbelt finally out of the car, I have to now figure out, cause I wanna put the trim back in so I don't forget uh, how to install everything back later on, but I'm having trouble figuring this out because as you can see, this piece here, this massive, it's I guess it's a two stage uh, seatbelt does not fit through this hole. So some way at the end here, there's gotta be a way to disconnect it and get it through. All right, so I figured out how you separate this. So basically you, un you like clip it open and then once it's open, you can slide this piece out and that frees this up by taking this copper clip out and now I should be able to slide this through here and then we can install it just like that back on the car. With the seat belt free from the trim, I can now go ahead and install everything back the way I found it. I'm also mailing the seat belt and pretensioner out for repair at a place called Safety Restore because I've heard good things about them, so I wanna give them a shot. And moving on to the driver's side, I started removing the seat first as now I know this will make the rest of the process easier. I detached the connectors using a small screwdriver when necessary, and hopefully this is a better view than before. Next, I could take the seat out. I'm done. I removed the small airbag emblem again, the screw, and then all the plastic trim that covers the seat belt. Just wanna show you, you have to be extremely careful taking this off because there's a ribbon cable here, which puts the light on the, the door sill or the footwell. And you can see it is like paper, and I mean paper thin, and it connects right over here. I know this is gonna be so difficult to see, maybe I can zoom in. Connects right there. So it shouldn't be too difficult. Maybe I can do it on camera, maybe not. But that's what you gotta get off next. Speeding through the removal, it was time to remove the bolts with our special spline tool, unplug the detonator and remove the pretensioner from the floor and put everything back where I got it from. I also want to give you a better look at this seat belt clip. 
You have to open the plastic clip shield thing first, and then with the small screwdriver, pry out the copper clip from the back that's holding it in place, and that will let you separate the belt from the pretensioner itself. So, seat belts are out, seats are out, and they're probably not gonna be going back into the car until this dash gets fixed, but, the last thing I believe I need to send out with that is the SRS module, which is a device that tells the airbags to deploy when in an accident. And I believe this is, if you can see all the way under here, which we're gonna try to get, it's yellow. We should be able to unplug it, send that off to get reset, then we should be good to go. We out, baby. And for those wondering, that's how I did it. Alrighty guys, that is it for today's video. Hopefully you guys like it. We got the SRS module out, the seats are out, the airbags are out. I have to send, I believe, the module as well as the seat belts out to Safety Restore to get reprogrammed and reset and back in the car. And then, ideally, when we're ready and all the airbags are replaced, reset the airbag light and everything should be good to go. Parts have finally arrived for my crash damage 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. Which means we can finally start working on the interior of the car because as you can see there's a lot of stuff wrong with it. Theoretically this pallet right here should have all the parts to pretty much complete the rest of the Volkswagen Golf R. But before we start taking apart the entire interior we need to put together the seat belts, which I had repaired by Safety Restore, which is a pretty cool company. It's been a couple of weeks since I've made a video rebuilding my Volkswagen Golf R. Unfortunately, the parts I ordered were delayed, which is out of my control. But eventually, they did arrive, and that's all that really matters. Right in between those two cars. In the last episode, I was able to remove the seats from the car, as well as the seat belts, which I quickly learned are a three-stage system and are a lot harder to remove than a non-European car. And lastly, I was able to remove the SRS module, which controls all the airbags. But with the parts finally in, it's time to get to work. If installing these seatbelts go well, then we're gonna try tackling this headliner here because as you can see, there are quite a few wrinkles. Well, you can't, you're gonna have to just take my word for it, but we're also gonna have to replace the curtain airbags because two of them deployed. 
Hopefully you can see the wrinkles now. So instead of replacing the seatbelts with new ones, which would cost upwards of $1,000 on this car, I decided to send them off to Safety Restore to have them rebuild the seatbelts and reset the SRS module, which you guys saw in the last video. As you guys can see, they seem to have done a pretty good job because it's no longer a six foot strand of seatbelt and it's all seemingly put back together. Now, before we start the install, I was able to get some exclusive behind the scenes footage from Safety Restore and how the process works. When the deployed seatbelts arrive at their facility, they immediately begin to deconstruct the belts and fix them with OEM parts. Unfortunately, the full process is a trade secret, but I'm glad I was able to get at least some footage. What's also cool is Safety Restore can change the colors and stitching of the belts to whatever you like, which is super cool. And with their fast turnaround, it took less than a week for my belts to arrive. So make sure to check them out in the description of today's video. Now, to finally install these seatbelts back into the car, I first need to disconnect the battery, as I don't want to accidentally detonate the charges that were just replaced in the seatbelt while I install them in the car. Getting the trim out of the way reveals where the seatbelts need to be mounted. I made sure to plug back in the detonator switches into the correct spot by matching the colors with each other. Then it was time to string the seatbelt up and through the mounting points and through the trim using the bolts that I left in to make sure I didn't misplace them. While also making sure to bolt down all the guides correctly. Then it was time to reattach the seatbelt to the pretensioner using the clip, which was quite tricky, but I managed to get it done. Then I bolted the pretensioner onto the carpet, plugged everything back in, and reclipped the wiring harness. The last step was cutting the zip tie that prevents the seatbelt from tightening back up while you try to install it. And with the seatbelt officially installed, I could finally put all the trim back in place. So it is a new day and we are going to switch things up a little bit. Unfortunately, the passenger seatbelt kind of locked up during shipping. So I've sent that back out to Safety Restore to hopefully fix it and then send it out to me. That should come in a day or two, luckily, and we'll put that in. But for the time being, the driver's uh, seatbelt installed perfectly. Everything works great with that. But because of this little hiccup that we have, we're going to move on to trying to take out this headliner here. As finally, I have the uh, curtain airbags, both sides so I can install those and not only that but we can try to get these creases out of the headliner. Fortunately it's black so I think it'll be pretty easy but let's try to give it a whirl. So the first step to removing the headliner was putting the seats back into the car and you'll see why this is important later in the video. Starting with the center trim, I used a plastic pry tool to help pop out some of the pieces and this gave me access to the connectors which I unplugged and also the screws which held the center trim to the headliner itself. Then it was time to begin working on the grab handles. If you've never removed these handles before, then I truly wish you luck because these were the biggest pain in the butt ever. First, you need to remove the plastic caps which give you access to the clips holding the handles into the roof. Using a very small flathead screwdriver, I was able to unclip each side and eventually remove the entire handle. Keep in mind, this is sped up, but it took me over an hour off camera to figure this out. Once I saw the clip from the outside, I was able to figure out how to do it, and it made the process much easier removing the other three. So it's gonna be a little too difficult to show you with one hand, but basically these are the clips, and you can see there are these little bars here, and the point of these bars is in the actual car itself. You can see there are those metal brackets right there, and these barbs kind of go over the metal bracket which locks in place into the metal stopping this from coming out so you take this little screwdriver and you have to pry the clip out from the inside turn it and then you can pry the other one out and turn it again and it pops out but it's finicky it's not difficult per se but it's not easy it's just tedious because you have to keep trying over and over and over and over again and eventually it gives and you can pull the handle out 
Alrighty, update for anybody trying to remove the handles, to remove the headliner, and maybe you're trying to put you know stars in the ceiling or whatever. In order to remove this, because what took me 30 minutes to do one, I just did the last two in five minutes, not even. What you have to do is instead of turning it, like I said before, you kind of want to put it inside of it and get behind the clip and then just push as far in as you can. And instead of turning it 90, you're doing the same thing, but it's harder. All you're doing is pulling out and you hear the clip motion. Once it's in, you pull up and that pulls the clip down and it is so much easier. And then it pops right out. You just have to put tension on it, put this in, use a light for the first one, the easy one. You pull up like this, the opposite way that unlocks the clip, you pull it and you're good to go. And I took these off super quick. Hopefully that makes sense to you guys. Moving on to the sun visors, these use the same clips as the handles. I had to remove the A pillar in order to access the top of the headliner, which was hiding the disconnect clip that held the sun visor on. Alrighty, so I couldn't really find any tutorials on how to remove this. So I'm kind of just playing with it. And they're kind of similar, similar clips where you, if you bend it with a screwdriver, these clips in here, you can shimmy them and get it kind of free. And the, the clips kind of face different ways. So this is horizontal and then this clip is diagonal, but it's all the way inside. So with a flathead screwdriver, you can get in this and kind of shimmy it. So check it out. No special tools really required here. Oh, there we go. And just like that, we're out. But there's a wire here. So this wire doesn't disconnect here, which is kind of a pain in the butt. So what you have to do is if you're dropping this whole headliner, then take this off first, because it will allow you to pull this down. Otherwise, you'd have to pull this wire through, kind of like I'm doing a little bit, but it's kind of tight. So ideally there's some velvet tape, like some foam tape holding it from the other side, but I'm gonna pull it through. Right here, there's the disconnect. And then, voila, I'm taking it out. All right, it's the moment of truth. I have probably two or three more screws that's gotta come out, and then I'm pretty sure the whole headliner is going to drop off. Now, in order to do that, we have to take this rear boot open. I have to open it up. I did clean it out earlier today uh, in preparation for you guys to see it, but I know nobody on YouTube has seen this coming up. So this is like a moment in history. Write it down. Da -da -da -da. Opening the rear boot up. Opens up good. Inside, you'll see shortly more in it, but a um, few clips have to come out here and here. And on the, this, these panels on the sides, both have to come out. And then the whole headliner should drop out and we'll pull it out and we'll be good to go. So the last few steps involve removing this top trim piece, which is just held in by clips, and then removing the screw that holds the side trim to the car. With those out of the way, it gives me enough room to slide the top plastic trim out of the car, freeing up the headliner. And I did the same on the other side, and I also removed the two pieces of trim that were on the inner pillars. All right, so the last step is removing two clips, one here and one here. This holds the entire thing up as we've gotten everything else out. They are the same clips that were in the sun visor, and I think even in the handles too. So at this point, I'm pretty, pretty confident I've messed around with them enough to, to know how to get them out, but we'll see. Yep, one out. Last one. So you have to apply pressure down. That's the only way it's gonna stay open and not clip itself back in. Oh, is that holding something? Oh, no way. We gotta take these two out as well. With a little help from my friend Sean, we were able to carefully remove the headliner from out of the car. What's getting stuck on? I'm not sure, actually. Uh, 
the airbag. Oh, oh, actually, hold on. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we're out. With the headliner finally free from the car, it was time to replace the deployed curtain airbags with new ones. Now, of course, Volkswagen had to use the same stupid clips for these two. Like, of course, why, why make it any easier? But besides the, the clips needing to come out, I also needed to disconnect the detonator switch, which is in orange, as well as just one screw mounting the airbag to the car. Then you just slide it back and out free it comes. With that out of the way, just repeat it backwards when installing the new one and also do the same on the other side of the car. So guys, the headliner is officially out of the car. It's about time. Those clips were such a pain in the butt. So for anybody that's doing that, hopefully that little tutorial helps. There are a few little creases on here, but honestly, I don't think it's worth replacing this at this point. I'm gonna try uh, in a little bit to use a steamer and steam it up. The uh, curtain airbags have officially been replaced in the car, as you guys saw. So everything is looking good, but we're getting close to the end of today's episode. You guys can see we have the uh, brand new, beautiful uh, curtain airbags installed and good to go. The last we're waiting for, which should be any second now, is the seat belt to arrive in the mail. We'll install that and we'll call it a wrap for this week. Alrighty guys, time for a quick build cost update. So far we've added the seatbelt and SRS module. Well, we'll install the next one soon, but we also have the left and right curtain airbags that we got installed, which brings our new total to $17,677.25. In total, both airbags were a little over $600 used off LKQ, and the seat belts were sent off to Safety Restore, as you guys know. All right, it is a new day, and we are gonna try to get the creases out of the headliner. I've researched a few different ways to go around doing this. The first is using a steamer, which we'll try. If that doesn't work, uh, or if it does work, I also have a dental pick to slightly pull up the fabric, and that should really hide most of the creases. So fingers crossed this works, but Fixing this up or making it nicer beats buying a new one for like a thousand dollars at Volkswagen. So if you're like me and watch other car rebuild YouTubers, every time they remove a wrinkled headliner from the car, they end up buying a new one as they can't get the wrinkles out. I was a bit skeptical about the steamer actually working. The thing is buying a new one just isn't an option for me as Volkswagen wants a little over $800 for a new one. Can you believe that? After doing a ton of research, the steamer seemed to be the best option for repair. I used the microfiber towel to act as a barrier between the steam and the fabric just as a precaution. And I also use distilled water as tap water has minerals in it and things that could potentially stain the fabric. I just wanna err on the safe side. Now I don't have a technique to doing this, so I just went back and forth over the headliner, pushing up from behind it in where the creases were, and I actually started to notice a difference. I also wanna give a huge shout out to my neighbor for letting me borrow his steamer. All right, so I am in complete disbelief how easy that was. I've watched so many videos of people either throwing out their old headliner, not being able to get the creases out, or just being stuck and putting it back in with damaged headliners. This solution worked and it is absolutely incredible. I'm blown away how easy the install was. I just wanna show you what exactly I used. It is a power steamer specifically used for 
wallpaper removal. I guess it works. If it works, it works. And every single crease is completely out of the headliner. You gotta see this. I seriously had my doubts about this working, but I mean, check this out. It's as if it's brand new. I guess the steam heats up the, uh, the felt material or whatever this is, contracts it or constricts it, constricts it and pulls the creases out of the headliner. Who knew? I mean, in theory, it sounded like it would work, but I didn't think it would actually come out as good as it did. I'll do a few more passes with the steamer, but we're talking a literal night and day difference. This thing is brand new, and we're talking about like over $1,000 in savings. And right on time, the second seatbelt from Safety Restore delivered, and it is working and fixed. So let's get this installed into the car and call it a day. So just in the nick of time, the passenger seatbelt arrived and it works perfectly. Shout out to Safety Restore. Let's get that installed really quick. Now, since you've already seen me do this on the other side of the car, I'd like to take the time to thank you guys for supporting me through this build and commenting on all my videos, as without it, I don't know if I'd still be doing it. Now, for those new to the channel, I have never done anything like this before in my life. So every step along the way is completely new to me. So hopefully these videos inspire you to try new things and challenge yourself as I'm trying to do here. And if you have a similar car as me, then hopefully this has helped you work on yours. That is a wrap for today's episode. As you can tell, we have completely repaired the creases out of the headliner. It's as if we bought it brand new. Not only that, but we were also able to knock out, if you can see in here, both seat belts have been repaired successfully, reinstalled into the car, headliner was taken out, and we have officially replaced all the curtain airbags with new ones. So far, rebuilding my crash 2017 Volkswagen Golf far has been going surprisingly pretty smooth. But today I face one of the biggest challenges yet and that's replacing the dashboard. As you can see the passenger airbag deployed during the crash which inevitably rips a hole through the dashboard. And the only way to fix this is by unfortunately replacing it with a new one. That means in order for this new one to fit in properly which doesn't have a deployed airbag that means every single thing you see here, including the center console, has to come out of the car. I can't believe it's finally time to replace the dashboard in the Volkswagen. It feels like it was just yesterday that the car got delivered to my doorstep. This car has been a true test of my abilities and my mental strength. Figuring out how to get the car running, fixing the coolant leak, and even attempting bodywork for the first time has all been new to me and quite the experience. In the last episode, I managed to remove the headliner from the car because I needed to replace the blown curtain airbags and also fix the creases that were made in the headliner. Plus, some of these parts needed to come out anyway in order to replace the dash. Now, before I start taking everything apart from the dashboard, I need to first put in the headliner because it's not currently in the car. Well, it is in the right spot, but it's just not on the right side. It's actually on the top of the car. Now, luckily, before I took the headliner out, I went ahead and labeled everything with the correct side that it came out of. So that should make the installation process a bit easier. So the first step towards reinstalling the headliner is to put the handles and sun visors back on while the headliner is out. Now they aren't actually fully installed this way. They're more or less just held in place by a piece of plastic behind the headliner. Once in the car, that's when I can push them into their clips and that's what holds it into place. When Justin up in case you saw some creases in my last episode, I went ahead and steamed this another two to three more times and literally all the creases came out of the headliner. It's, it's absolutely incredible. To reinstall the sun visors, I reconnected the wire and locked them into place on both sides. Then I reconnected the light as it's easier to do that now than when the headliner is actually in the car. Getting the rest of the headliner back into the car without creasing it wasn't easy. The best method I found was folding the back seats down and turning the headliner as there was more 
room going vertical than just straight in. Once the headliner was in enough, I put the back seats back up to hold the headliner close to the roof and dragged it all the way through. Then it was time to reconnect the main harness to the headliner and start locking the headliner into its clips. Starting from the front, I worked my way back, connecting all the clips back into place. And of course, reconnecting the handles was just as difficult as taking them out. A tip for this is using a screwdriver, a small one, to help manipulate the clips back into place. Then it was time to reinstall the seatbelt trim and start reconnecting all the lights and buttons. This was a very simple process and only required me to put a, maybe two screws back in. The rest was just reconnecting the wires and popping in the trim. Alrighty guys, so the headliner is officially back installed into the car. Everything is back in the place it's supposed to be. What a pain in the butt though, putting these clips in the handles back in. The little plastic ones are a pain in the butt to slide in. But everything is in, everything is good, everything works. I connected the battery because in order to take the steering wheel off to start on the dash, the, uh, the battery has to be turned on so you can turn the wheel. I really hope these airbags don't deploy when I first start though. I'm like kind of nervous. Should I even like be in the... All right, so in order to take the steering wheel airbag off, what you need to do is get a Phillips small screwdriver, pull the steering wheel out as far as you can, and then as you can see in the back, when you turn the wheel 90 degrees, you can see here that there is a clip right here. There's like a metal bar you can see, and then a little bracket that it sits on. What you need to do is take a screwdriver and get it above it, and pry it down and that should pop out one side of this, the airbag. And then you can do that on both sides and the airbag should ideally come right out. All right, so with the airbag clips disconnected, we can slowly pull this out, revealing a few intricate wires. I believe there is two that have to come out. First one is the yellow one, which is pretty easy. You kind of just get in there with your finger or a little screwdriver, if you may. You get under it. You pull it up and then it wiggles out the other side and we are free good to go and we have a blown airbag cool with the steering wheel out of the car we can finally start to deconstruct this dashboard but first we need to get these seats out of here so i have more space to work with with the seats out of the way, I now have enough space to work on the dash. The first thing that has to go is the steering wheel and everything attached to the steering column. I started off with the plastic trim, which is just clipped in, and then I removed the wheel itself, which is held down by a big triple square bolt. With the wheel out of the way, I can now access the clock spring, which is extremely fragile. I made sure to tape this down as I don't want it to spin around or move and accidentally rip the ribbon cable that's inside it. I unscrewed the three screws that held the lower trim on, two at the top and one at the bottom. With that out of the way, I unplugged all the wires that plugged into the clock spring and removed one little screw at the bottom that held it into place. This gave me access to the stock, which was held on by one screw as well. Removing this frees up enough space for the dash to slide over the column successfully. Next up is removing the center console. And to do this, I started by removing the trim that covers the shifter. Then I took off the trim that covers the climate control and I had to remove some screws and pull the tabs that keep the climate control mounted to the dash. This then allowed me to disconnect it and move onto the side trim. There are a couple of bolts all around the center console that you have to remove, freeing it from the floor. All right, update for anybody trying to take the center console out. We got everything unbolted and it's free. Problem is I can't get this over the shifter because the shifter is in park and with the car off and the battery disconnected, it won't go into neutral. So we have to go into neutral. Well, there's a little yellow switch. You probably won't see it, but it's all the way down in here. And I can press it with my finger and I'm gonna put my foot on the brake and I can put it the, the car into neutral and that'll give me enough room to slide this over and out. All right, we're gonna shift this 
and to neutral foot uh, foot on the brake there's a little button you can feel it press it down press this and now it should be you can probably shift it even further into drive taking my foot off the brake and we're good we just have to remember this is in neutral you know now i totally forgot that i had to disconnect all the center console goodies first which required me to remove the trim and that gave me access to the storage compartment and the rest of the screws holding the cup holder in pulling up on the cup holder freed it from the center console and gave me access to the clips behind it which needed to be disconnected then i could finally remove the center console Next thing that had to go was the radio and vent trim, which is just held down by some clips that I was able to get free with a pry tool. I could then pull the vents out, which was a bit tricky, but I was able to get it done and unplugged it in the back. Next up was the gauge cluster trim, which is held down by two screws. And with that out of the way, I could pull out and unplug the gauge cluster, which will fix another day. Using a special tool, I was also able to pop out the radio. Alrighty, so while I have everything pretty much apart, not really much more room, but instead of getting further in, I'm just gonna really quickly install the SRS module and then that's it. I'll leave it unplugged until I have the entire dash and all the airbags back in. And when I start the car, then I'll plug the, uh, the module back in. Moving on, the next thing that had to go from the dash was the glove box. Using the same tools to remove the radio, I was able to pop out the MMI system, which then gave me room to access and begin to remove all the screws that hold the glove box to the dashboard. Using an extension, I was also able to get the last hidden pain in the butt screw and out came the glove box but that's not all you have to do you then need to disconnect all the connectors that go to all the lights on the glove box as well as pull off what appears to be an air hose on the back with everything off the dash that needs to come off the next step was to disassemble and remove all the screws that mount the dash to the car itself as well as unplug the wires that connect to the passenger airbag there's quite a few screws hidden all over the car so the best technique i found was to lightly tug on the dash and look for the screws or clips in the spots that were still uh hard to pull that were still being held down i also found connectors on either side of the dash hidden under a trim piece that needed to be unplugged. I had my friend Sean help me to do this because it was a pain in the butt reaching my stubby fingers in there. And with the connectors finally unplugged, I rerouted the wiring harness so that it wouldn't get snagged on anything. And then we could finally attempt to remove the dash. no longer have a dash bare bones but we got it out totally black from the sun i think we should keep it like this yeah dash is officially out wasn't all that bad i'll be honest really wasn't all that bad it's half the battle though the other half is putting it back together but not a bad look if you ask me <laughs> Alrighty guys, so the new dash has been, you know, just meticulously placed back inside. It's time to now reassemble everything. But before I do, I wanna kinda of show you the layout that I've left on the floor to making this process of assembling the dash or reassembling the dash that much easier. So check this out. I had a feeling that assembling and disassembling the dash was gonna take a while. I wanted to lay everything out so that I can pick up from where I left off. 
Everything here is pretty much in the order that it was taken apart. So putting things back together, we're gonna start here, work our way down and continue this pattern as we go until we get to the final atrium pillars. Lastly, I've also picked up this method, which is honestly been incredible for replacing dashes. You can see starting up here, working my way down is the bolts that I've taken out and where they go. So putting it back together, we're gonna start at the bottom and work our way back up. Now it's time to do everything we just did, but in reverse. Off camera, I spent a good 30 minutes or so fishing the wiring harness through to its original spot to make the reinstall process a bit easier. Now I'm so glad I took photos of everything because if I hadn't, I don't know how I would have remembered where everything went. Now moving on, I think the hardest part of reinstalling the dash was figuring out where all the bolts go that mount the dash to the actual car. This not only was the longest part of the reassembly, but also the most tedious as it was a total guessing game trying to find all the empty screw holes to put the screws in. Fortunately though, I was able to find them all and with all the screws back in, I could then start reinstalling the glove box and plugging everything back into it. Next up was reinstalling the MMI system, which is pretty easy too, because everything's color coded on the back. And once it's plugged in, you kind of just slide it back into its kind of shelf there. This is why it's also important to run the wiring harness correctly before reinstalling anything, as you want to make sure that all the wires are lined up and in place before putting everything back. Next up was the radio, which has two plugs and just clips back into place. And then the gauge cluster, which has one plug and two screws mounting it to the dash. I also made sure to put all the trim back correctly and I took my time with this because it was a bit fiddly. And once that was in, I could then put the center console back in. Now, once the center console is bolted back down, I could then reinstall the cup holders, which was a bit tricky because there are a lot of wires and connectors that need to be plugged back in. And you wanna make sure that they're all in the right place as some of them connect to the cup holder, but others connect to the shifter and then others connect to the cigarette lighter. And they're all kind of in the same general vicinity. Once I was able to figure that out, I could then reinstall the storage compartment and also the rear console trim. Oh, and I was also able to unlock the armrest in a previous video I had mentioned this, the armrest storage compartment by removing two screws in the back and then using some double-sided tape to hold those levers up. I know you can't see that, but you kind of just have to take my word for it, but now it can finally open. Got it done. After reinstalling the climate control and trim, it was time to start working on the steering column. The first thing that goes back is the stock, which is held on by one screw. And then I can slide the very fragile clock spring back over the column and connect everything back to it. Now the lower trim was next, which has one connector and three screws. Then the steering wheel could go back on. And to make the installation process of this a bit easier, there's a small notch in the wheel and on the column, which helps you align it correctly instead of just putting it on crooked and potentially, you know, messing up your alignment. So keep that in mind if you ever try to take off your steering wheel. Now, last but not least was tightening down the triple square and reinstalling the A pillars. Alrighty guys, that is a wrap for today's video. The dash has been completely reinstalled back into the car, including the center console. All that's missing is our driver's airbag, which we'll get done in the next video and plugging in the SRS module, but otherwise, Everything is starting to look like a new car again, so I'm super excited. I can't believe my 2017 Volkswagen Golf R used to look like this. 
after completely rebuilding the front end of this car and practically everything in the interior, we're almost ready to start working on the rear end and pretty much completing the build. But before we do that, there's a couple of things left that we have to take care of. Obviously these need to be in the car. This obviously is not supposed to look like that. We're missing the steering wheel airbag. This instrument cluster is out of whack. This is a little bit concerning. And to top it off, the rear bumper has parking sensors and for whatever reason the new one doesn't. So let's take a break from talking about all the negative stuff that's still wrong with the car and focus on the positive. If you happen to miss the last episode of the Golf R Rebuild, let me catch you up to speed. I was able to successfully reinstall our creaseless, finally, headliner back into the car, getting me another step closer to a completed looking interior. Once I had that installed, I attempted to replace the dashboard because the original one had a massive hole blown through it from the the airbag deploying. Everything had to come out, and I mean everything. Once the center console was removed, I stripped the dashboard from all its doodads and gizmos, and out it popped. Keeping everything as organized as possible, I was able to successfully reinstall everything back onto the new dashboard, and finally, the interior was starting to look like it had before the accident. But even still, there is so much more work that needs to be done. To start off today's list of things that need to get done, I began by putting both seats back in the car and started reassembling the passenger seat first because it has manual controls. I reconnected the three plugs that go underneath the carpet and then tightened down the four bolts that hold the seat to the floor. I did the same to the driver's side. And here's a better look at the three plugs that need to get reconnected. Remember, anytime you are working with wires, it's a good idea to unplug the battery, especially with yellow connectors as those usually indicate airbags and then the other two go in very easily you gotta remember to slide this over here you slide it on top and then you push the black in that locks the clip and the last clip is pretty easy it goes right here and then this connects right here and you are good to go Close this down, wrap the screw, I believe it was wrapped it right over here, and then you reinstall this little bad guy, and the little pin right over it. Good, now we're locked and loaded. So in order for me to get to the last two bolts to the front seat, I have to plug the battery back in because this is automatic and I can't just slide it back like the passenger. But before I plug the battery back in, I wanna go ahead and quickly install the new steering wheel airbag. All right, so installing this is super easy. There's only two connectors that you have to plug in. The first one slides in right here, if I can find it. That's in, and then the second goes right here, you push the yellow in, and you press the white tab down. Now we can kind of move this back to the way it's supposed to be, like this. And then we can slide this airbag in. We just click it together. And now we have a new front airbag, cool. With the battery reinstalled, I can finally slide the seat back, giving me access to the last two bolt holes on the seat. All right, so I know I've had this dent right here that obviously looks terrible, but I just realized, you know, since I took the back panel out and there's literally a hole right here where I can access the quarter panel, I'm just gonna try to like push it out. Oh, just like that. Yeah, just push it out with my hand. That probably couldn't have been any easier. I mean, yeah, there's still a tad bit there, but I mean, I just pretty much popped the whole thing out. Well guys, we have officially reinstalled and put back together the entire interior of this car. The only thing left is just the uh, little SRS module here, which we'll get to in a second, but I'm just at a loss for words. Every single thing is back in this car uh, to the way it was on the interior. I don't know if you guys remember when we originally got the car, the first video we made, the interior of this car was absolutely destroyed. I mean destroyed. Holes in the airbag, you know, curtain airbags, 
you know, deployed. The steering wheel was exploded. Like everything was just absolutely in pieces. So to finally see everything back in the way it's supposed to be, it just makes me a lot more confident going forward into this build. We can see the finish line now, so it's just pretty incredible. But I guess the next thing that we're going to do is turn the car on, try to clear as many codes as we can, and then I'm gonna plug in the SRS module and try to clear the codes yet again. And ideally, the airbag light should turn off. And then we'll start working on the instrument cluster. Well, the time has finally come. After clearing all the codes, it's time to plug in the SRS module and pray that the airbag light goes off. All right, so the instructions now say, reconnect the battery, we just did, and then turn the ignition to accessory mode. The SRS light should be eliminated for a few seconds and then extinguish. To complete the cycle, turn off the car. So we're just gonna click into accessory mode. It should stay lit and then it should go away. And if to turn the car off, we'll be good, so. Now, before I show you what's about to happen, I want to explain to you what's going through my head. You see, besides airbags and seatbelts in your SRS system, you have these things called impact sensors. It's a little sensor on the front of the car with a metal ball held back by magnets. During a crash, the extreme stopping forces the ball forward and completes the circuit, immediately telling your airbags to deploy. As far as I know, these are reusable sensors because I never changed them. So fingers crossed nothing happens. Let's see. All right, this is accessory mode. I think it's gone. I think the airbag light's gone. It's all the other lights, but the airbag light's gone. Holy cow, that was a lot easier than I thought. I was super worried about plugging this in because I was afraid that maybe there were crash sensors that were damaged or something. We didn't get any codes for that, but um, I thought it would have been a little bit more difficult or challenging than just starting the car and not having an airbag light on. But there's no codes for airbags, which means we're good. This is insane. I'm so shocked that there's no airbag light on the dash anymore. So now it says to complete the cycle, turn off the car. And now your SRS module is fully reset to work again. Car's off. I can't believe it. That was so freaking easy. All right, guys, so check this out. I just rescanned the car and no more. Is there over 40 something faults? We're now down to 33, which I know is still plenty of fault codes, but there's plenty more to fix on this car. But regardless, this is some incredible progress and I'm extremely happy. One of the faults I had on the car was for a steering wheel calibration error. And I read somewhere that if you turn the wheel all the way to the right and then all the way to the left, that it could clear the code. So I figured I would give it a try. All right, so another update. I just turned the wheel all the way left and then all the way right. And almost all of the dash lights just went off completely. That's pretty insane. The only light that I now have on the dash is just a tire pressure light. Check this out. Yeah, we only have like this, which is tire pressure. And then some of these down here, which has to do with like maybe the uh, adaptive cruise control and parking sensors. And we'll get to that later, but I cannot believe all the freaking lights just went off. All right, so I'm just gonna go ahead and rescan the car and see how many codes we have now. Remember, we were at 33. So after literally turning the steering wheel all the way left and all the way right and restarting the car, we went from 33 codes to 26 codes. And I don't even know what I did. I literally just turned the wheel. So I cannot believe how quickly we're knocking off codes on this. All right, so before we go any further in the build, the two parts that we've installed so far is the steering wheel airbag and the dash with the airbag. Both of those combined was $656 and they were each around 300 bucks, bringing our new total to $18,333.29 for a 2017 Volkswagen Golf R, obviously there's a lot more stuff to fix, but a car like this, had it not been in an accident, would be worth around $33,000 with this amount of miles. It's maybe 32, 31,000, and we're only at 18.3, so we're doing a pretty good job so far. So the next thing on our to-do list is fixing the instrument cluster needle, which is a bit too low. So I need to take the instrument cluster back out 
uh, in order to fix it. Some of this might look familiar because the cluster had to be removed in order to replace the dash in the last episode. The first thing that needs to come out is the vent and then the trim pieces, making sure to disconnect the two wires behind the middle vent. You then need to remove the top steering wheel trim and then remove the two screws that hold the instrument cluster to the dashboard. And lastly, just pull lightly on the instrument cluster and disconnect the one wire in the back. And just like that, we're out. With the instrument cluster out, you can see what our problem is. Right there, that needle is not supposed to be that low. It's supposed to be at the zero. So we're gonna try to take this apart and put this back to where it's supposed to be, hopefully without damaging anything. On the back of the instrument cluster, there are seven screws that need to come off. It's then held down by a clip on either side. Carefully pulling up, I was able to separate the cover from the circuit board, and I made sure to wear some powder-free gloves because I was told the actual front gauge cluster is very delicate, and any oils from your hands or powder from your gloves could damage the front fascia and ruin it. I want to shout out Mark, a subscriber also, for sending me a detailed video on how to do this, as without it, I probably would have broken it by now. Now. You have to lightly turn the dial counterclockwise in order to set the needle in the correct spot. Yeah, one would think turning it clockwise just a little to put it at zero would be fine, but that would actually break the motor in the back. Okay, fair enough. That looks about right. Let's go test it out. Now, before I put all the screws back, I want to just quickly test the cluster to make sure everything was correct. With that in mind, I put everything back together and just put one screw to hold it in place. All right, so I just plugged it back in. The battery's off. I'm gonna turn the battery on. And we're just gonna put the car in accessory mode and hopefully it stays at zero. I have a pretty good feeling it is. All right, so here is the moment of truth. The only thing, I mean, the car's probably gonna throw codes because this is unplugged, but uh, I would think everything should work now because that looks like it's in the right position already. And that was the easiest little reset I've ever had to do. So let's press the accessory button and see what happens. Okay, we fixed it. I can't believe it. Let's shut this off. I can't believe it, we freaking fixed it. With everything confirmed working, I quickly reassembled the instrument cluster and the dash and hopefully put it back for good this time. with the interior of the car finally back to stock OEM. I mean, it's been a long time in the making since it's been like this. It's time to start working on the rear end of the car. And the first thing we're gonna be doing is installing a new end link because the one I saw seems to be broken. And this only ran me about like 12 bucks online and it looks pretty straightforward to install. In order to access the rear sway bar end link, I needed to take off the wheel. This gave me just enough room to work on it. There's only two bolts that need to come off, but it's not that simple. The the bottom bolt you need to hold from one side with a socket and the other side with a wrench to stop it from spinning and then it will be able to unscrew. And here's the broken one. This is half. We have to, we have to get the ball joint out which is stuck to the actual uh, sway bar link but that shouldn't be all that difficult either. As for the second bolt, you need to use a torque spit to hold the ball joint in the middle from spinning, and then you can unscrew it with a ratchet. I had to use an extension actually for this because the spring was in the way from just using a wrench. That's the other piece. Cool, all dirty now. I'm glad there's no blood though. Then it was time to reinstall the new one by doing the opposite of what we just did. Alrighty, so if you check this out back here, you can see it does not fit because the uh, sway bar, the rear sway bar is too high. So in order to get this bottom boot up, we have to compress the spring like this. And you can see this is going up. So what I did is I got my other jack from my car and we're gonna just take the easy way out instead of hurting ourselves. Little rags so I don't really hurt the caliper, I mean the rotor. And we are almost in. Get us up a little bit higher. And up almost one or two more spins. And look at that, we're through. Bada bing, bada boom. 
Okay, let's put that nut on. All right guys, so the rear sway bar ball joint thingy bobber is back in and everything is looking good, tightened down. The next thing and the last thing to wrap up today's video is gonna be fixing the damaged wiring harness, which I kind of showed you a little bit in the beginning of today's episode, but I'm gonna show you it a lot more in depth. Now, I bought these really cool things on Amazon, which I've seen other YouTubers use, but these are solder seal wire connectors. So it's basically heat shrink tubing, but there's a little bit of solder inside of it. And all you gotta use is a heat gun and you're good to go. So we're gonna try that out. As you can see, when I uncover this bad boy, we have two things to fix. We have the rear bumper, which needs to be wired together. And then we have the valve control for the exhaust, which needs to be wired up, and then we should be good to go. So starting with the exhaust valve control, I spliced the three wires that needed repair and also disconnected it from the valve to make it easier. I slid the tubing over both wires and lined up the metal part in the middle of the two exposed wires so that the solder could bond them together. Then it was time to use the heat gun, making sure to rotate the wire to seal it evenly. As you can see, the tubing shrinks and the solder actually melts and bonds the wire together. I repeated the process on the next two wires and then started working on the rear bumper harness which had a total of eight severed wires. I guess a one good thing about Volkswagen is that they made this extremely easy to identify each wire apart by using different colors and then by adding stripes and dots to other wires. Once all the wires were reconnected I put the original weather stripping back over it and then finished it up with some electrical tape just to make sure everything was sealed correctly. I'm almost ready to test drive my crashed 2017 Volkswagen Gold R. The only thing that's really holding me back is the back. I still have a blown out windshield, a busted in tailgate, broken taillights, and the bumper is just barely hanging on. Now luckily most of the stuff can be replaced pretty quickly because I managed to pick up a near identical tailgate with a complete windshield. Not only that, but I even have a bumper which I showed you guys in the last video. The problem is the rear bumper doesn't have parking sensors and my current one on the car does. So we need to figure out how to transfer this to the new one. I also discovered some more problems with my wiring harness because after I scanned the car in last week's episode, I managed to have more codes than where I started from. And I think it has something to do with me shocking myself from playing with this without turning off the battery. Oh, all right. Yup, that was me last week shocking myself on exposed rear wires, reminding me yet again to always unplug the battery when working on anything electrical in your car. Fortunately though, the shock didn't prevent me from continuing to fix the rear end of the Volkswagen. I powered through my injuries, no matter how small, and managed to completely rewire and fix the severed wiring harness. You see, in the last episode, I was able to finish the rest of the interior, which involved installing the last of the airbags, clear majority of the fault codes and lights on the instrument cluster and even fixing the instrument cluster itself. Something that had given me a near heart attack when I first started working on the Volkswagen. Turned out to be as simple as turning the dial counterclockwise back into its correct position, bringing me that much closer to getting this car back on the road. So before I start working on the rear end of the car, I just want to figure out what new codes I've now developed from messing around with the rear end of the wiring harness and figure out if I can start it and hopefully it's an easy fix. And with that, I have this OBD11 device which helps me scan the car and figure out what codes I actually set and also being able to clear them. All right, so after re-scanning the car, you can see we now have 30 fault codes instead of last week's episode where we only had about 26. So somehow I've created more faults than when I started. As it appears, these are the actual fault codes that I'm starting to get, which I've never had before. I now have faults for the heater support pump, as well as bank one and bank one camshaft adjustment. 
So after giving the wiring harness a quick once over to confirm nothing was left exposed, I decided to move on to the next best thing, which was checking the fuse box for any blown fuses, as it's usually the culprit in situations like this, and here's why. You see, cars today have a lot of electrical components to them, and car fuses are designed to protect them. When an overcurrent or short circuit occurs, which is what I'm pretty sure I did, the fuse, which is typically a metal wire strip, will melt when too strong a current passes through it, thus stopping the flow of electricity and breaking the circuit to a given device as a way of protecting it. Now with a little help from my girlfriend's dad, Doug, we were able to test all the fuses in the engine bay using a fuse tester. Connecting the end of the fuse tester to ground and touching the top prongs on the fuses with the pointy end, the tester will light up blue with the voltage to indicate that power is running through it properly. One thing to keep in mind though is using this method will only show you what's getting power when power is running through it. What this means is if the car is off, not only could I find a broken fuse, but I will also find all the good fuses that just aren't getting power. As you can see, when I put the car in accessory mode, now all those fuses are working and getting power. Luckily, Doug showed me another method using a voltmeter, which I like a lot better. Setting the meter to 200 ohms tests for continuity, and the results are pretty much straightforward. If the multimeter goes to zero or close to it, then there is continuity between the multimeter leads, meaning the fuse is good. If the multimeter shows a one or higher, then there is too much resistance within the fuse and the fuse is blown and needs to be replaced. Using this method, we were actually able to find a fuse that was blown. So that's the one that's blown. The fuse that I pulled is fuse number seven, and as you can see by this diagram, number seven controls the solenoid valve and also the heater support pump, which explains why I was getting those random codes. I disconnected the battery and used a little fuse grabber to pull out the fuse and replace it with a new one. All right, so check this out. I pretty much figured out the problem. As you can see, this is definitely something that you can't just leave like this. Right in between, you can see where there's supposed to be metal, there's nothing, which means this fuse is blown and probably tripped when I shocked myself. So it appeared the fuse solved the problem. As you can see, we no longer have those weird camshaft and heater core shorts in the uh, computer anymore, which is super cool. And it appears that we might have solved the problem. So now I guess it's time to start working on the rear of the car. All right, so the next step is taking off this rear bumper, which is pretty much already halfway complete. Granted, it already comes off. All the clips on this side were broken and the wiring harness is pretty much already unplugged. So I just have to take a few screws off on the other side of the car. And then this bumper should really just like pop off. Lucky for me, removing the rear bumper was pretty straightforward, especially since I only have one side now to work on. Most of the screws are in plain sight except for one, which was a pain in the butt to remove. I tried using a regular ratchet, then an electric ratchet, and finally I used an electric ratchet with a wobble extension, a long one, and after about 10 attempts laying on the floor with my light, I was able to finally get it off. Now obviously taking the wheel off would have made this a lot easier, but I was lazy and I did not want to move the car. All right, guys, so good news. The bumper came off real nice and easy, but I want to show you what we're working with. So this is obviously the damaged bumper, but this has parking sensors. Notice here this big cable and all these sensors that are attached to the rear end of this bumper. This is totally cool. The problem is on our donor bumper here, it doesn't have it. All it has is the wiring harness for the lights right here, your, uh, what is this? Your license plate lights here. So what we have to do is transfer all these parking sensors and everything that's on this rear bumper over to that. Now, the good thing is I was trying to figure out where do we mount these because obviously there's no holes on this bumper, but I noticed here that Volkswagen has actually marked out where the holes go and where the actual brackets go that hold the bumper, that hold the parking sensors. So that's really cool and should make this process a lot easier. The first thing that has to get removed is the parking sensor so that it can access the bracket underneath it. Once unplugged, you can push the two clips away and the sensor will simply pop out of its holder. I did this to all the sensors and clips and removed the harness from the bumper. Now, since I need to make holes in the new bumper, 
I used a step bit to measure the size of the hole and marked it with tape so that I don't go past it. All right, so with the wiring harness officially off the bumper, the next step is gonna be taking these clips off which are unfortunately plastic welded into the bumper, which means we're gonna have to plastic weld them off the bumper and transfer them onto the donor one. Well, after messing around with the plastic welder for a little, I realized that it was making a bigger mess and not going as smoothly as I wanted. So I decided to try drilling out the factory plastic welds with the idea that it would come off a lot cleaner and hopefully a lot quicker. Luckily, that's exactly what happened. Once the holes were all drilled, I could pry it off with a screwdriver my friend Sean was also able to help me do the rest of the brackets. Once they were all off the original bumper, I could start prepping the donor bumper for the transplant. I removed the donor wiring harness, which only has plugs for the license plate lights and set it to the side. I took my step bit and carefully drilled the first hole, making sure not to go too deep as there's no going back. I also checked to make sure that the sensor fit and it was perfect. I drilled the rest of the holes and the hard part was actually over. All right, I need you to feel this one too. Wow. Perfect, right? Soft? It's a tad rough. I just gotta put tad rough, yeah. Because I didn't get the, the little edges off. It's a little loose. The baby's bottom. After making sure the wiring harness aligned properly, it was time to plastic weld the brackets to the donor bumper. Sean was able to hold the sensors flush with the bumper so that I could plastic weld the brackets correctly. I also used a fan to blow the smoke away as I'm sure nothing good comes from breathing in this junk. With the last bracket welded on, it was time to finally attach the wiring harness for good. Oh, it looks so good. So funny, but so good. Mm -hmm. Look at that. About an hour later, and we officially have a bumper with parking sensors in the perfect spots with the perfect size hole. Bumper just needs to get painted, but doesn't mean it's not gonna work. Sick. So guys, the surgery went well. We were able to transfer the wiring harness from the old bumper with parking sensors to the new donor bumper that doesn't have parking sensors. Everything's drilled in, everything's lining up perfectly. I just wanna show you what it looks like super quick. Just loosely put it on the car just for storage sakes. But you guys can see the parking sensors are perfectly aligned, smooth, and exactly where they're supposed to be. You would never know that this was without parking sensors. Now to wrap up today's video, the last thing that we have to do is going to be swapping out this rear tailgate with the donor one that we have right here. Honestly, I don't think it's gonna be all that difficult. The only problem that I could potentially see having is because those are on used parts. So those are used parts, not new. When plugging that into the car, there's a chance that like the backup camera and maybe some of the lights might register with the car as not from the same VIN and it might not let us use it, which means then we're gonna have to transfer the old stuff off this tailgate onto the new one over here. Now, in order to transfer the tailgate, I need to prep the one that I bought because the wires are cut off at the top. This is not really a big deal as I won't be using them anyway, but as you can see, most of the wires are pretty easy to access from just the front of the tailgate. To start, there are two wires that can be unplugged by removing the black clip first and then by pulling the red clip and pinching in and pulling out. And I did this to both of them. The next piece I removed is a bit tricky. It's the rear windshield washer hose, and it has the same clip on it like the ones I removed in a previous video on the hood of the car. Next up was removing the ground wire, which is held in place with a screw. I put the screw back on also just so I wouldn't misplace it. Now, I'm not sure what these white and tan plugs are for, but those can easily be unplugged 
too. Once unplugged, I used my fancy clip removal tool that I got in a kit when I was removing the dash trim. And if you want the kit, I'll put a link to this in the description below. With everything unplugged that was easily accessible, I was left with only two wires still connected. One is for the third brake light and the other, I believe, runs down to the backup camera. I figured I'd tackle the backup camera wire now and leave the brake light wire for later when it's mounted to the car. Now, unfortunately, in order to act access to backup camera connector, all the trim pieces have to come off. The biggest one is held down by four T12 screws that I was able to remove, and then I could move on to removing the top two trim pieces first by carefully yanking them as they're just held on by clips. Once those are out of the way, I could then remove the big piece by giving it a nice tug and off it came. With that out of the way, I could clearly see where I could disconnect the backup camera and remove the wire, which is held down by insulated tape. I just cut the tape with a razor blade in order to free the wire up. And with the new tailgate ready to be swapped, it was finally time to start disassembling the old one on the car. Everything I literally just did to the new one now has to be done to the old one in order for it to come off. This is because I can't just cut the wires since I'm gonna be keeping them for the new one. With everything disassembled, the last thing that needs to come off is the dreaded third brake light wire. I was debating about cutting this and splicing it into the new one, but I decided it would be better to just keep it OEM. Now, in order to remove this, three nuts have to come off from the inside, and then using some trim removal tools, I could peel the trunk spoiler off from the adhesive that's holding it on. It's as simple as unplugging it, and we're free. Now that this is off, you can also see that windshield fluid hose I was talking about earlier. With everything unplugged, it was finally time to remove this old tailgate from the car. With a little help from Heather, I was able to pull the two hydraulic arms off. There's a little metal clip that you have to remove first, and then it just pops off. And then the only thing left holding this to the car is just four 10 millimeter nuts. So guys, before I forget, I wanna do another build cost update. So far, we've added the rear bumper to the back and we're installing the tailgate. I was able to get each of them for 300 a piece, which brings our grand total to $18,933, which isn't too bad so far. We really don't have much left in this build. With the old tailgate off, it's finally time to install the new one. I think Heather and I tried about three or four times before we were able to line it up and put the screws on. But with it finally in place, it was now time to put it all back together. <laughs> Remember that last wire I had to remove from the new tailgate? Well, now's the time I'm taking it off. I used a trim tool and fishing line to separate the glue from the spoiler. This way it will free itself from the tailgate. Then I could unplug everything and remove the last bit of cut wire out from the tailgate. I routed the new wire through the top of the tailgate and reattached it back to the spoiler. Then I could tighten down those three 10 millimeter bolts I was telling you about earlier. And finally, I could put it all back together.
All right, guys, that is it for today's video. We officially got the tailgate back on the car and it aligns pretty freaking good, if I do say so myself. I don't think there's gonna be any more moving, but before we wrap up the episode, I wanna test out and make sure that the tail lights work because the old one didn't work and that the backup camera works because I really don't want any more coding that needs to be done to the VIN. So let me go hop in the car and see if these tail lights and the backup camera work correctly. All right, well, I was able to get the uh, rear backup camera working. I can't believe it. Uh, it's th literally that simple. All right, guys, I can't believe it. You know, the day's the day where this thing got installed. You can see everything lines up really, really, really nice here. Obviously, we can't close it just yet because we got to work on this tail light here, which is stopping it from fully closing. But everything looks good. Now, unfortunately, I ordered this thing blue so I wouldn't have to repaint it and it was shipped with YRC Freight, and they changed up and moved around my stuff and managed to damage the back of this here and here, which is super annoying. I even think they scratched the glass right here. So I have a claim in with YRC Freight, the shipping company, to hopefully get me reimbursed because this is gonna cost like 700 bucks to get the back of this repainted. But otherwise, I'm so stoked it's finally on. And honestly, from the back, it doesn't look too shabby. It has been quite a long time since the last time we worked on my 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. And the reason I haven't been able to work on the car is because of this piece right here that was back ordered from Volkswagen for over a month and a half. But it's finally arrived. Now, I know it's been a few months since I made my last video on my Golf R rebuild, and I'm sorry it took so long. These are just things that are out of my control and also seem to be pretty common in the automotive industry. So consider that if you ever want to do this thing yourself. Anyways, to catch you guys up to speed, in the last episode, I had to remove the old bumper and transfer the parking sensor harness to the new bumper because a new one didn't come with any. This process involved drilling holes into the new bumper and then plastic welding the old brackets to it. Once that was done, I then decided it was time to replace the old destroyed hatchback with the new one that I had bought third hand. I had to disassemble the new one in order to remove the cut wires and then I had to do the same thing to the one that was on the car. Once everything was unplugged, I was able to swap the new hatch onto the car and plug everything back in. I even had to have my girlfriend help me because this thing was freaking heavy. And with the final trim pieces screwed onto the hatch, the rear end of the car was officially done. Well, sort of. And that's a wrap. Now I scoured the internet far and wide, even reaching out to other dealerships in other countries, trying to see if they had this piece, but it was to no avail. Now I know this piece looks huge and it actually is pretty freaking long. It's almost the size of me, but funny enough, I only need about, mm, this much of it, literally maybe six or seven inches. Now, I know this piece looks huge and that's because it is, it's practically the size of me, but I literally only need about that much, maybe this much of it from this hole all the way up, which is pretty small, but of course they don't sell it like that. You gotta buy the whole freaking thing. Now, the goal of rebuilding this car was to challenge myself, somebody with zero experience working on cars, and see how well I can do, and basically to see if I'm capable or if anyone is capable of doing work on your own car. And we've gotten maybe about 85% of the way done with this car, but unfortunately the next 10% that's needed on this car, I don't think I'm gonna have the skills or and even the equipment to do myself. And that's okay. Asking for help from other people is okay. Now the remaining work that needs to get done to this car, which is cutting this off right here and doing a bit of pulling is just impossible to do in my garage. And that's why we're gonna be outsourcing the work and I'm gonna show you how we do framework. Now, I was a bit saddened to find out that I couldn't fully rebuild the car by myself and that 10% of it is just not possible to complete 
in a garage in Florida, but that doesn't mean we're SOL. There is a way to still build it, and I'm gonna have to take you guys on a journey. Now, just because the work can't be done in this garage, doesn't mean it can't be done in every garage, if you get what I'm saying. So what we need to do now is prep this car for a road trip across the country. And by starting off, we're gonna have to load all the parts into this car that's needed to complete this build. With everything loaded up, it was time to get the car onto the trailer, strap it down tight, and begin our 10-hour drive from Fort Myers, Florida, all the way to Chattanooga, Tennessee. Right there, right there. giving you a quick update we got about maybe four and a half hours left in our trip you can see i got the car strapped down all four corners on a tilt trailer this is a 10 hour drive so it's been pretty crazy i've driven majority of the way my friend sean's gonna finish the rest who you've seen in another video here but as you guys can see i just want to give you a quick walk around of what we're dealing with what i got and kind of the setup of strapping this car down. We've been stopping maybe every hour and a half to make sure that everything is strapped in so that we don't have any problems. But so far, so good. Let me show you. So we got a Chevy Silverado 2500 towing the Golf, which really looks pretty good on that, I'd say so. We got a tilt trailer, 10,000 pound, and we got straps on each at 10 and two, the proper way, 10 and two, and they are tight, not going anywhere. Got those on Amazon, very useful. And we have them on each of the four corners. Bumper is on there pretty well. Got some zip ties, uh, but we're doing okay. Holding everything on, but yeah, just kind of giving you the little tour before we hit the road again. I wanted to make a quick update video as we're at a rest stop here, but not too shabby. Everything's good. Yeah, we got some room. We can go down in case we start moving but so that's going to be it for the quick update of the golf r on the uh on the truck and trailer here and i'll update you where we get to our final destination it's going to be crazy so stay tuned
Alrighty guys, it is 6.55 a.m. in the morning. We have officially completed the 10 and a half hour drive yesterday as you saw in the last episode. So this episode is gonna be pretty epic. This is day one, the start of doing the framework on the Volkswagen Golf R. It's gonna be crazy. We're driving right now, Sean and I, to the shop. And um, I guess we'll see what's in store, but we gotta get there bright and early as there is gonna be a lot to do. It's going to be pretty epic. Yep, you heard that right. In the last episode, I drove across the country from Fort Myers, Florida, all the way to Chattanooga, Tennessee, in order to meet up with the one and only 23rd Garage. As you guys know, I was stuck waiting on a vital part of the car that was backordered to come in the mail, and without it, it would be literally impossible to continue this rebuild. Fortunately, though, it finally arrived at the dealer, and that means it's time for the real work to begin. Tell us a little bit about the car and about how you got into starting your own YouTube rebuilding channel. It's a lot to take in. 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. Bought it in Copart from Georgia. Had it shipped down to Florida. Yo, let me grab another battery. Welcome back to the channel, ladies and gentlemen. I know we've been gone for a while, but we are back today. And we are back in the shop today with my friend Hayden Schreier. Hayden is actually a original bona fide Florida man. And he is here with his Golf R. And uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about what's going on? Kind of bit off a little bit more than I can chew. If you've watched my channel, you'd know that I've been pushing this off till the end, doing what I can do, getting the small problems done first, working my way up to the big ones. And there's no way I can do some of this framework. So I had to find somebody that knew what they were doing. And 23rd Garage was here to help me out. And we're gonna try to, to get this thing up and running. It's uh, probably 80% done. The front's done, the inside's done, the airbags are done, everything is good to go. It's just a little bit of the rear end here, which we're gonna get done today, or a day or two, and get it on the road finally. Heck yeah, sounds good, man. So what we are going to do, we are going to start by removing the side skirts off the sides here, and put it up on the clamps, and then we will open up the lid and take the bumper off and show you guys what's actually going on under there. With Yuri leading the way, we started off by removing the side skirts on the car. This is so we would have enough room to place the frame machine pinch weld clamps securely to the car. And I believe there's only two screws holding these side skirts on on either side, and then it's just some double-sided tape that holds it to the car. And we did this to the other side of the car as well. What? A gold? No way. <laughs> Bro. It might help a little bit, no? Bro. That's awesome, man. I appreciate that. And I love the wrapping. The wrapping yeah, is, I wanted to keep it original. The wrapping know? is the cherry on top. It's that Burger King coupons on that too. On the other side. Oh, too uh, yeah. Anyways, now it's time to get the car securely fastened to the frame machine using those pinch weld clamps I spoke about earlier. This is to make sure that the car doesn't go anywhere it's not supposed to while it's being pulled. After the eBay extravaganza, now I gotta check everything. Check it twice. And, then the and just when I thought everything was going well and according to plan, this happens. Again, eBay, I got it for like 200. Chip. Oh really? Yeah. That's just pretty cheap. Find them all, you know, instead of going straight to the dealer, check eBay, send in offers, you know. We got more stuff. So is this an OEM part? Or yes, it's it? OEM. This is Volkswagen. So, I'm for a head so everything's around. exact. So I try to stick with it because I know Non-OEM stuff might not always be a line straight. That's what people, people who do bad framework say. We got an issue. What? what? This is just one piece of it. What do you mean? This is just one part of the rear wall. That's the rear wall, no? What else is missing? It's missing the actual... Here we go. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, see, we're missing the outer... Yeah. yeah, I messed up. As you can see by the Volkswagen parts diagram, I only ordered number one in the photo, which I thought was the only piece I needed. Turns out I needed number 10 as well. I guess it just didn't look clear to me in the photos as something that was, was needed for this build. I had over a month and a half to prepare for these next three days, and I didn't get it. 
This isn't good. You know what I'm about? No, I see. I just looked it up on on the parts and I ordered it, but yeah. So when when you get a rear wall from a dealership, you have to get it in two pieces. I had no idea because they sandwich. So this one comes in from the inside, and then this one comes in from the outside. And I believe you only have the inside section. Yeah, you see. You see how this is not boxed in? There should be another. There should be another piece that goes right here. Yeah, it like welds on around here. And it boxes this in. You never know though. We might be able to pull this one out and save that. Otherwise, piece. I can always call up the Volkswagen here. Just yeah, like, I don't know. We'll, we'll see what yeah, happens. Go ahead and call them and see if it's installed. I wonder if they're. Are they open today? Yeah, Saturday. They should be open. It's yeah, good. they're open until like four. Yeah, they can stay a little bit early. Yeah, there's no way that this is going to be in stock. Oh, yeah, I can follow. But I think that was the one time Yuri was wrong this entire trip. The dealer did have it in stock. The only problem was it was just 90 miles away in Knoxville, Tennessee. They happened to have only one of the outer rear walls left. And luckily, Sean took one for the team and drove out and picked it up. Because without it, I don't think we would have finished this project in time. Perfect. This is what, you know, this is what you get for buying Copart. I'm learning my lesson real quick. Right? Yeah? I'm learning my lesson. Are you liking real... it though? Like, is this I love the building part, what, the part that I can handle, you right. know, but I'm learning you got to go in and physically, as I said, with my first couple of videos, you got to check it out yourself. Because, yeah. you know, anyone that, you know, pulled the bumper off, you would have seen and you would have known if you could handle it or not. But if you don't, pictures aren't going to do it. And Copart offers ways where they'll go and inspect the car yourself. You can pay like 150 bucks. It's not worth it. You gotta, you gotta be the one to go look. Oh yeah, for you sure. You have to be the one. So for anyone that wants to go do this themselves, no matter what anyone says, no matter what any YouTuber trying to be or is, go spend the money, fly out and check the car out yourself. Or if it's local, check the car out yourself, 100%. That's, that's about I, the best advice you can get when it comes to Copart and IA. I mean, take a look for yourself. The auction photos really don't look that bad in the rear. I know I'm inexperienced, but still. I even purchased Copart's additional inspection, which had someone physically inspect and take photos of the car, and you still can't see any of the damage that we're seeing now. Of course, now I realize it's all just a big scam. The inspection is ran through Copart, and of course, they don't want you seeing something that might deter you from bidding on their cars. Consider it lesson learned. So, uh, what I think we need to go ahead and do is remove uh, the rear muffler. I said rear muffler, as if there's a front muffler. Uh, <laughs> and uh, then we'll probably throw the tow hook in here. Conveniently, it got damaged on the tow hook side. So, we'll put the tow hook in here and we'll pull this uh, rebar out just a little bit and see what happens, see what it looks like under there. But it's, it's definitely a little worse than I thought it was because Hayden's had sent me pictures of it, but it's just like if you're looking on the auction, you really can't see exactly how bad it is. Uh, but I did know that we would need a, a frame rail end. So, you know, we, bought that, man. we got all that and hopefully maybe, maybe this would straighten out. Maybe we could separate it and uh, put it on, like beat it out from the inside or something. But the thing is, it's kind of a nice car. It can? Mm -hmm. It's the same shell. Call them up. You got their number? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Call them up. All right, so in order to pull out this rear part of the bumper and the frame of the car, I have to remove and strip down all the plastic stuff that you see here. Tail light, all the plastic trim needs to come off in order to pull it. Then we'll pull the rear reinforcement out and uh, we'll start making bits and pieces of progress that way. But I'm gonna start removing all this stuff right now. folded up in there, pretty mangled up. And the thing is, is we don't actually have this floor pan for the trunk. We weren't really planning on replacing it anyways. Probably should have, but we are going to hopefully try and straighten it out. But what I'm gonna do right now, I am going to go ahead and do what I call a preliminary pull. 
I'm going to just simply hook to this tow hook, which conveniently they placed on the right side because they knew that this car was gonna get damaged right here and they knew I'd have to pull it. We're going to grab this tow hook and pull it out. I know that's probably all going to separate, but we need to do that to expose all the damages and hopefully we don't have any damages to the subframe or anything else that is you know, pretty important. Uh, so we're gonna go ahead and do that and then we'll see what happens. A preliminary pull is really just the first main pull you do to the car. You wanna to try to envision how the car was hit and pull it out the opposite way. Think of it like you were putting the accident in reverse. Pull it the wrong way and you'd be adding more damage, but pull it the right way and you'll actually be making progress. That's like way beyond what I can just. Oh, yeah. What you... Like, you're looking at this in a way that I can do right now, and I'm trying to pick my brain on how to do it. Yep. Right now, what we need to do, uh, we need to pull right here with the clamp and uh, straighten this out because this right here is not going to be replaced and we need this this tail light and the lid to line up real nice. So before we cut the rear wall off, we want to go ahead and try to get this pulled out, you know, get all the measurements right. And then once that's good, we'll take the wall off and then we'll try to straighten out this floor. What do you think about all this? What is going through your head? You're seeing all this stuff, man. So it's, it's gotta be kind of crazy for you, know? I don't even know where to begin, dude. Well, it's, it's way beyond me. It's a skill that I don't even, I, years of just, the way you work, you just, he just knows what he's doing. There's no like, it, he looks at it, I know how to do it. Check this guy's out. It's like it's brand new. Almost. Almost. <laughs> Almost. Just a I'm bit just more. in shock, look at that. We got a working door. Hey, wait till we get all this pulled out, then it's gonna be a working door with a factory door gap. Beautiful. With a few more pulls, Yuri was able to get the right quarter panel lined up pretty close to OEM spec. That's all that's needed now though, as we'll get everything perfect when everything gets replaced. Notice how he measures the car. This is to make sure that the right side is spaced the same distance as the left side, which wasn't hit. Once I got the all clear, it was time to wire wheel all the seam sealer off the car. This is to make it easier to remove the factory pinch welds that hold the rear wall onto the car. Once everything was wire wheeled off, Yuri did one last pull to straighten the floor by welding a metal plate to the rear apron. This was getting replaced anyway Way with a factory OEM part, so it really doesn't matter if it gets damaged from the pulling and the welding. Now it's time to remove the rear wall. We had to remove the adjoining plates first by belt sanding down the pinch welds and then carefully chiseling the metal plates away from the car. Yuri saws all the rear wall off camera and then once both sides were removed, it was time to just yank the rear wall off the car.
day two of a three-day project. We made a ton of progress yesterday. Pulled out practically everything that needed to be pulled out. For the most part, it came out way beyond expectations here. Obviously, some more unforeseen damage, but that's what goes on when you get cars like this. You gotta start ripping stuff off before you start seeing the actual damage here. But we were able to pull out this plate, as you guys saw in yesterday's video. Pulled this out, pulled all this out here. Last thing we need to do is put the uh, frame rail end on cut this off, put that on here, line everything up, and hopefully by the end of the next videos, we should have the whole back put on in one piece. That's right. I can't believe it's finally starting to look like a car again. In the last episode, day one of my three-day adventure, Yuri from 23rd Garage was able to help me straighten out the back of the car, as well as remove most of the damaged parts that need replacing. We were off to a pretty rocky start though, with surprises popping up just about all over. First we found hidden damage, and then we discovered that I didn't have all the parts needed to even complete the rear end of the car. That's what people, people who do bad framework say. We got an issue. What? what? This is just one piece of it. What do you mean? Yeah. Yeah, see, we're missing the outer. Yeah. Luckily, a Volkswagen dealer about 90 miles away from where we were, located in Knoxville, Tennessee, had the part, and fortunately, my friend Sean was able to drive out and pick it up. All in all, though, we ended up with almost all the damage removed, and that means that now, I just hope we can put it all back together in time. Peace. You got anything else to add? No, sir. <laughs> No. I mean, I, it's, it, you're doing great. There's some bumps and it's a bumpy road, but I'm, I'm just surprised that that, that, uh, yeah. that trunk pan came out like that. It was, it was bumpy yesterday, but the way it looks now, I'm actually really impressed and really happy. So it's, it's coming. We're going to uh, we'll straighten just... out a lot more, but I'm very, I'm very happy with that. And we'll just put a little plate here. Yeah, we do. We do have to actually have to fabricate yeah, our own piece plate. for that side because we just don't have time to wait from the dealer. So I think that's going to be. I think it'll be fine and it's gonna be fun. Yeah, for you know? sure. Learn how to weld here and there. Haven't done that yeah, yet. Yeah, we'll how to weld. So in a nutshell, the goal for today is to remove what's left of the old frame rail and replace it with the new one that I bought. Now, obviously that's a lot easier said than done because Volkswagen has some of the hardest and strongest steel in the automotive industry. So we'll see how easy this goes. Now, first things first though, I wire wheeled all the seam sealer off of the old frame rail, which revealed all the spot welds that need to be drilled out. After a couple of drill bits later though, we were in the clear. Next, Yuri aligned what was left of the frame rail in order to make sure that he had a clean cut. Remember, measure twice, cut once, as there's no going back. Once everything looked good, it was officially time to sawzall the frame rail off. Remember what I said about that ultra high strength steel being difficult to work on? Well, I wasn't kidding. This stuff is freaking strong. A couple of hours and one carbide blade later, and we actually made managed to get through it. What's up? We need a wire wheel all this shit up the bottom right here. Yeah. It came off clean. Oh yeah, it came off really nice. We need a wire wheel that shit off so I can dolly out that floor forward. Yeah. Don't get under there just yet. Oh you're just doing that. Yeah, I want this floor. All right, so what I'm doing here is wire wheeling all the seam sealer off the trunk pan. This is to make it easier to flatten out the metal while also prepping it for welding to the rear wall. Now there's quite a bit, but it all needs to go if we want to ensure a good bond when it's welded. I'm also cleaning up the underside here so that we can hammer out the pan flat. Otherwise it will leave bumps in the metal and it won't align properly to the wall. Once I was done, it was then time to flatten everything out. Now by flattening out the rear pan, we could then pull it out more to get it back to where it used to be. And honestly, it pulled out incredibly well. Once
Once we got everything straightened out, it was time to start working on the new frame rail end. What Yuri's doing here is actually pretty cool. By placing the light behind and using a piece of paper, it creates a shadow of the frame rail, basically a template of how it needs to be cut. Using the bolt as a reference point, once he mocked up the template, he could then transfer it to the new frame rail end and line it up exactly with the bolt. Yuri sprayed the new frame rail end with some weld through primer, and then it was time to cut it to shape. With everything lining up good, we then transferred the old bolts to the new frame rail end. Now here's something pretty interesting. What Yuri's doing here is called creating a gusset, which is basically a plate that goes in between the two pieces you are trying to weld together. The reason you do this is to transfer the stresses between the connecting pieces while also strengthening the joint between them. It's very cool and it's also very important. With everything aligning good, it was time to weld the mounting horn onto the frame rail end, as well as the exhaust bracket. of the golf rebuild. And uh, we actually have a lot of progress. We've got the rear trunk pan all dollied out. It still needs a little bit more uh, here and there, and we'll have to straighten this out to the rear wall. Obviously, it's not in its position. You can see it's still kind of bent, but it's really flimsy and it moves around a lot. We need to actually go ahead and attach it uh, to the rear wall. And then once we attach it, then we can dolly everything out the rest of the way, and get it nice and straight. It's not gonna move anymore. And then we'll weld it up. We also uh, assembled the frame rail right here. It all came in three different pieces. So I've got it cut to size and I've got the frame horn end welded on and we've got the muffler bracket welded on. Everything looks super good. We're gonna clean it all up and we're gonna spray it with some primer on the inside and then we'll spray everything with primer on the inside here and made it up, weld it on, and we'll be good to go. Yes, sir, it's officially time to start putting the rear end back together. Since the rear wall is brand new, Yuri was able to use it as a reference to see where the frame rail ends need to go. After a few pulls, they were perfect and lining up exactly where they needed to be. Next, I had to prep the outer rear wall. You know, the piece that I forgot and my friend had to drive 90 miles to go pick up. Yeah, that one. Now, but using this air compressed punch, I was able to put holes everywhere that needed to get spot welded. I can't imagine using a drill bit for this because there are way too many holes that need to be drilled out and I'm sure it would take forever. Luckily, this tool made incredibly quick work of the job and we were able to keep on going. With the rear apron on the car, we could loosely screw the bolts in to make sure that everything was lining up properly, which it did. Yuri then tack welded the apron in place so that it wouldn't move. Now, for those that don't know what tack welds are versus spot welds, basically tack welds are just small and temporary welds that hold parts together for the final welding. Now the tack welds maintain the alignment of everything and the gap between the pieces of metal that we're trying to join together. Now that the apron is secure, we were able to temporarily mount the rear reinforcement and see how it fits. Yuri was then able to use this as a way to pull everything over and to ensure that the hatch closes and aligns properly with the car.
Yuri made a few minor adjustments to the hatch by unscrewing the bolts at the top. Pretty much everything on this car can be adjusted when it comes to panel alignment. Nothing is set one way, which is good, but also a pain in the butt as you guys can see. With everything looking good and on schedule, all that's left to do in my last day with 23rd Garage is just some final measurements and then welding everything in place and officially completing the framework. What's up, dude? Yo, how are you doing? Pretty good. Ah, it's going to be the Kings Watch place. What yep. Is what is it, the G Wagon? Yeah. And I told you not to take anything apart, so. You, yeah, not to touch it. I wanted to buy a, a port of power and start going on the inside and pushing shit out, too. Oh, God. That's what I was going to do. He would have destroyed the other side of the car and not pushed anything out. And then, going back to Florida? Going back to Florida. Ooh. Going back to Florida? Oh, with Mr. Floppy on board. Floppy. Day three is officially here, and that means it's a race against the clock. Today is the deadline in my last day with 23rd Garage before I head back to Florida. That means we need to finish the framework on my Volkswagen Golf R today, or I'm gonna be in some serious trouble. Luckily, we've made some incredible progress these last two days. Day one, we managed to overcome quite a few surprises, like missing parts. Yeah, see, we're missing the outer skin. And hidden damage. Fortunately though, we were still able to straighten out the car and remove most of the damage. Even better, on day two, we were able to remove the old frame rail and replace it with the new one. We were also able to install the new rear apron. That means all that's left today is welding everything permanently and making sure it all aligns smoothly. Easier said than done. To start off the day, Yuri went over all the measurements to make sure everything was straight before welding. Once he was happy with it, he tack welded the rear apron onto the frame rails to make sure nothing moved when we put the rear reinforcement on the car. This is because the only thing holding it on at the moment are just the rear reinforcement bolts. With the reinforcement now on the car, it acts as another tool that can be used to straighten it out. With everything in position, it was time to start welding the belly pan to the rear apron. Now maybe some of you guys are wondering why Yuri is hitting each weld with a hammer, and this is because when you weld, the metal gets hot and it almost shrinks a bit. So by hammering the weld with a dolly, it will flatten the weld and stretch the metal back into the desired shape, and will also save time when grinding the welds down. As you can see, there are a lot of holes that need to be filled with weld. Now, from factory, a car's sheet metal is held together with spot welds, different than what we're doing right now. This welding process happens by applying pressure and heat from an electric current to the weld area, and it works by contacting copper alloy electrodes to the sheet surfaces, whereby pressure and electric current are applied and heat is generated by the passage of current through resistive materials. What Yuri is currently doing is called MIG welding, and this style of welding uses a continuously fed electrode wire and shielding gas via a handheld torch. Now, both techniques work extremely well for what we're trying to accomplish. The main difference between the two is that a professional spot welder is thousands upon thousands of dollars compared to a MIG welder, which could be just a couple.
With the belly pan finally welded to the car, it was time to test fit the hatch and make sure everything still lined up perfect. We put the rubber seal back on too, just to make sure the hatch would seal correctly to the trunk. Yeah, I was gonna ask how you did that. From the inside, I'm, I, may, I may or may not have ruined a clip hole. Uh, anyways, yeah, that's all that's left right now is to line this tail light up, uh, straighten out this corner right here a little bit more, and that's it. I mean, I've already started welding, and everything looks really good. Everything's lined up. We got the seal on it. We got the floorboard straightened out. I, I pushed it out right here a little bit, but. I think what I need to do is I need to pull the actual skin right here because it's a, it's a double wall. So I need to pull the skin because uh, by pushing it, you know, it's just pushing the inner part instead of the whole thing. Uh, and then I can't really grab it by anything because it's just a piece of skin and there's no flange. So we just need to figure out a way to get that pulled out and uh, finish welding it up and she's going home. No exhaust though. Leave the exhaust off. Yeah, leave the exhaust off. <laughs> that way you get pulled over every single day. That's when Yuri came up with a brilliant idea. Just add another clip hole. I didn't do anything. Oh, that came there? That was like that. Gotcha. That's factory. That hole? Yep, factory. Certified auto repair. Two holes? They must have made a mistake over there at Volkswagen. Yeah, at some point. The Vag Group. The Vag? <laughs> the Vag Group. Somehow I was able to find the plate that went in the corner of the trunk. It was all crumbled up, but I figured if the floor was able to get straightened out, then so can this piece. Lo and behold, I got it straight and it was a perfect fit. Now this saves us tons of time because we don't have to fabricate a new one. After, it was time to grind down the welds. Not only does this make the car look more OEM, but there's actually a good reason to do this. Now obviously grinding a weld down too much will make it weaker, but if you have too much weld, you'll get stress concentrations at the toes. So by grinding and blending it down, you can actually make the joint stronger. What's up, dude? Yo, how are you doing? Pretty good. I got a surprise visit by VTuned, which was really cool. He checked out the Golf R for a little and said it's coming out pretty good. So that's great news to hear. Now, for those that don't know, VTuned also has a popular rebuild channel and is also Yuri's brother. Now, if you want to check out either of them, then I'll leave a link down to their channels in the description below. Next up was cleaning up the car and prepping the other side, the outside of the apron for welding. Now, first I grinded down the welds and then Sean and I scuffed up the apron to get it ready for primer so it has something to adhere to. Then I continued to grind down all the welds and vacuum out all the junk that was in the inside of the car because we'll be priming that bare metal as well. After making sure the outer apron still aligns correctly, which it does, we can go ahead and spray the area with some weld through primer. Is that the primer? No, that's for the welding. Yeah, this is weld through primer. Oh yeah and affix the outer wall with some sheet metal screws to hold it in place. Yuri welded all the holes I punched out in the last episode, and it was quite a tedious process, but he was able to get it done. Then I grinded all those welds down and Sean scuffed it up to make sure that the primer could adhere as well. And I can officially say that at this point in time, we are done welding the car.
Yuri primed the bare metal with some self-etching primer, and the reason you use self-etching primer on bare metal and not regular primer is because regular primer prevents moisture and oils from coming up from the surface, while self-etching primer prevents moisture and oils from penetrating or going down to the material underneath and causing it to rust. Basically, self-etching primer etches itself into the metal, while primer kind of just sits on the top as a layer of protection. Now, after the primer dried, it was then time to seam seal all the edges of the metal. We used a urethane sealer and diluted it with some lacquer thinner to apply it easier. You see, seam sealer is like an additional coating to help prevent the intrusion of water and dust and air, and also aiding in providing corrosion resistance at the weak points of the metal, which would be where they overlap each other at the ends. Alrighty guys, so that is the end of the three day bender here in Chattanooga, Tennessee, rebuilding the rear end of the Volkswagen Golf R. Couldn't have done it without Yuri and 23rd Garage. So huge shout out to their team for making this all possible. You know, make sure to check out their channel. I'll put it down in the description of today's video and the next couple of videos for you guys to watch. Yeah, there's a lot more to come still. So definitely make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and uh, I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Drive off into the sun's not set. Sun's yeah, into the sun it's not dark. Set. Yeah, so hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and It doesn't sound too bad, I'm gonna be honest. That doesn't sound bad at all. Turn the lights on, Nathan. Don't worry. Hey, now you can just, you can drive down the road now. Down in Florida. That's what I said, I said, let's just drive it back. Give it one nice, uh, give it one nice little rev. I need to hear it. A little rev, mom. A little rev. It's not bad, honestly. That's not bad. third garage and they did a killer job rebuilding the rear end on my 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. Yuri was able to fix the rear door which never used to close. I mean check this out. It's literally perfect. But that's nothing. Wait until you see the back of this car. I finally have a working rear hatch. Check this out. It opens and closes like a dime. It couldn't be any more perfect. They were even able to align the tail lights, the bumper, and the quarter panel perfectly and seamlessly. It's like it was never in an accident with these OEM gaps. Now, even though most of the hard stuff is officially over for the Volkswagen, it doesn't mean I'm done working. There's still plenty of things that need to get done. Going to Tennessee and working with 23rd Garage was honestly an incredible experience. I was able to learn so much about framework and just the car rebuilding niche. And it's also given me the confidence to just keep going in this space. This car and my skills have come quite a long way from the beginning. I remember as if it was yesterday first taking delivery of the Volkswagen Golf R and realizing that I had my work cut out for me. Over 120 fault codes, a blown dash, all the airbags deployed, and even the front end and rear end of the car needing repair. It's truly fascinating to see how far we've come and grown on this channel. And it's even more fascinating to think we're almost done with this project. Now the goal for today is to actually paint the inside 
of the Gulf, as you guys can see here, it's actually not painted fully. I'll show you a better close up here. And also we need to paint what's behind the bumper to the lapis blue, lapis blue uh, paint color. In the last episode, you saw Yuri paint over the bare metal that was over here with some self etching primer. And then we also seam sealed over all the gaps. Unfortunately, we can't leave it this way, uh, obviously. And we need to repaint over this with a final coat of primer. And then we have to repaint what's under this bumper, which means everything that's in the back of this car needs to come out. Now, lucky for me, my local Napa store had everything needed to repaint the rear end of this car. We have the scuff pad. We have the base e-coat primer to go over the bare metal in the rear as well and to cover over the seam sealer. Then we have a custom made paint, my Lappies Blue base coat. And then the last is my 2K clear hardener, which is super cool and obviously some drop cloth so we don't get blue paint everywhere. But they did a great job. So definitely check out Napa Auto Parts store for custom paint that can be put in a spray paint can. So in order to repaint the back of the car, everything must come off. Tail lights, bumper, and obviously everything in the trunk needs to come out. As you can see, I pretty much have everything needed to complete the rear end of the car, but I did notice a few little things that I need to order that got damaged during the accident. Now with the rear empty, it was time to vacuum all the dust, all the dirt, and even all the weld splatter from the trunk. Obviously, I can't paint any of that. Pretty much when it comes to painting, 90% of the job is prep work and only about 10% is actually painting. Now since I will also need to paint the frame rail end, I went ahead and took off the wheel so that I would have better access to underneath the car. Next step for prep was to scuff up the surface with a scuff pad. And this helps smooth out imperfections as well as gives the paint something to grip onto. Next, I used a clean microfiber and some rubbing alcohol to clean the surface of any dust or oils. Then it was time to painters tape the border, lay out the plastic drop cloth and re-tape over everything so that the drop cloth doesn't move. Alrighty guys, so the area has been prepped, scuffed, and cleaned, and it's now ready for the easy coat the, to match the factory primer. Just wanna show you what that looks like really quick. All right, so as you guys can see, this is kind of what the factory primer looks like. This is just overspray. There's a little bit of blue overspray here, but ideally, if you like look up in the corner here where we didn't put self-etching paint, you can see there's kind of a green tint to it underneath the overspray of blue, and this is pretty much an identical match to it, but I have to go over now and spray paint everything that you see here that's black, as well as this wall here. This all needs to be the color of that Easy Coat Primer, including the frame rail, which you can see is under here, which we also seam sealed. So originally, I was just going to use another can of self-etching primer like Yuri did, but the employee at Napa actually put me onto a product that I've never heard of. It's called Sem Easy Coat. You see, unlike self-etching primer, Easy Coat is a direct-to-metal coating that matches the color and even the gloss of the factory primer and e-coat colors. Now, it comes in nine OEM colors and is even OEM recommended, so I decided to give it a try. Now, e-coat or electrophoretic coating is a process most car manufacturers use to prevent the frame of the car from rusting. They basically immerse the entire frame in a vat of like this water-based solution that contains a paint emulsion. They then send an electric current through it that causes the paint emulsion to condense and form over the car. And I thought this was pretty cool that I could replicate this or fill it in. I use one light coat of the e coat and then two to three wet coats on the car, basically until I couldn't see any more of the seam sealer. I waited about five to 10 minutes between each coat.
so I just finished the three coats of Easy Coat Primer. It came out incredibly well. Now it's time to use the base coat, the Lapis Blue base coat on here. Hopefully we have enough paint, it should be, to paint the outside. That's really all we need to do. The inside's gonna stay factory primer, this color, with a little bit of overspray. But everything else, this whole front wall here, this rear apron and the side, is going to be Lapis Blue. Hopefully we have enough. If not, I gotta go pick up another can. So fingers crossed. I called around to maybe three or four Napa auto parts stores near me. And luckily I found one that could make custom automotive spray paint, which is pretty cool. All I needed to do was tell him my paint code or bring the car or a body panel in for him to paint match. It was quick and simple and I had my custom automotive paint within 20 minutes and it only cost me around 24 bucks. Perfect for a small project like this and I highly recommend you guys take advantage of it if you have a project at home. I did three base coats similar to the primer, one light and two wet coats, waiting about 10 minutes in between for the paint to flash. Check it out. So this is three to four base coats on the car. It might look a little bit lighter than the paint, but that's only because I have the iOS set a bit high because it's super weird with the lighting from the uh, the garage. But you can actually see it came out incredibly well for a can, keeping my distance and doing three to four even coats. There's no running on this at all. Nothing ran on it, so it looks really good. And then uh, it's going to be time to start applying this. So I just got to shake this can up a bit and get it ready. I believe it's like two minutes of shaking like this. Then we pop the hardener in the bottom, shake it another two minutes. Then we do two to three clear coats over this and uh, leave it to dry overnight and put the car back together in the morning. So unlike your typical can of Rust-Oleum 1K Clear that you can get from any hardware store, Spray Max 2K Clear is entirely different and also twice the price, around $24 a can and for good reason. Now in summary, the significant difference between a 1K and a 2K clear coat is indeed for a catalyst to dry. Hence why I have to crack the bottom of the can to release the hardening agent and then mix it. You see, a 2K clear coat provides a far, and I mean a far, superior level of protection compared to a cheap can of 1K Clear. Trust me, uh, I, I know, I, I've, I've had enough experience. 2K Clear is what's used on cars, and it actually prevents scratches and scrapes, and is even UV resistant. So I highly recommend this if you plan on doing anything to your car, like restoring carbon fiber, or even some sort of panel touch-up. Otherwise, I'll leave a link to all the products down below, where you can check it out or even pick one of these up. But it's not just online. You can also get this at your local Napa auto parts store as well. So it is a new day and honestly, this paint came out incredibly well. I let it dry overnight for about 15, 16 hours and it is freaking identical. I am so incredibly surprised how well like spray paint cans did. Remember, I did get the color matched, so it is pretty identical, but I'm more impressed with the clear coat. I mean, this is 2K clear, a two-part hardener, and it worked incredibly well. So I highly recommend using this stuff if you're gonna do some at-home projects, maybe doing some carbon fiber respray, stuff like that. But I'm gonna pull this car outside, take the plastic off, and I wanna show you how incredibly good it came out. I'm so impressed with the product here for spray paint cans. I don't know, man. It's it's just pretty incredible. So let's pull it outside, and then we'll uh, and then I'll show you what it looks like. All 
right, well, I just realized that I can't pull it outside because there's no wheel on the car. So I'm gonna clean up this section here. There's a few things that need to go back on the car and then I'll put the wheel on. I have to put this fender liner and charcoal filter back in over here and that will be good to go. But you can see we even primed the new frame rail end here. So everything looks good. So uh, yeah, let me just put all this back on and then I'll pull it outside. The first thing that needs to get reinstalled is the charcoal filter. Luckily, it's super easy to take on and off, which isn't always the case for some cars. All you have to do here is push it in place and then slide it up into the clips and it just stays there. And then there's just one like reinforcement bolt at the bottom. And that's pretty much all you have to do to reinstall it. Now the three tubes you see at the top, one black, one white, and then one clear. The clear is a drain tube and the others you have to clip back into place at the top of the charcoal filter. Now the drain tube is what connects to your gas cap reservoir area in case of overspill. So this doesn't get plugged into anything and I just routed it out of the way. Then I could put the fender liner back on which had a super small tear in it. I just held it in place with some duct tape. No big deal. I can always patch it if it comes off later down the road. But there's a few torque screws around the fender liner and once those were in, that's pretty much it. All right guys, so check it out. I mean, that can't be more of a perfect paint match in the gloss. I'm gonna have to turn the car around so you get a better view, but it's identical. And I'm very impressed with how it all turned out. I mean, even picking it up, it's so nice. I'm gonna turn this around so we can get a better view, but everything looks how it should. Looks really nice. All right, so here is another angle. I'm still getting the shade, but I mean, look at that sparkle and that color. That clear coat is absolutely incredible. And you can see there's literally no runs. Like it went down so smooth for a paint can. I'm actually really freaking surprised at how nice and shiny and cool this thing came out. Like you really can't even tell. Absolutely incredible. I'm really impressed. You tell me what you think down in the comments below, but look at that. I mean, that's freaking sick. All right, so I'm extremely impressed with how the rear came out. And now that everything is done and official, it's time to actually start to reassemble the back for good. Now there are a few pieces, like some clips that are broken that are still coming in the mail that me and Yuri figured out. But for the time being, majority of this rear end can get put back together. I can't believe it's finally time to assemble the rear end. The first thing I did was put the plugs back into the belly pan and then I could put the tail lights back on. Next was the trunk lock, and then I could re-thread the wiring harness back to where it's supposed to be, which is actually through the floor and then out and around the car. I put the rear air vents back on and then I started working on the rear reinforcement. This is held down by a bunch of bolts, but before I screwed it down, I had to put the blind spot radar detectors back on first because the screws thread through that. These go on either side of the car. Once in place, I tightened down the reinforcement bolts and then I could put the last bolt back on either side of the blind spot bracket. Next up was the trunk seal, the rear bumper brackets, and then the bumper support rail. Now I actually forgot to run the wiring harness through this, so I had to take it back off and reassemble it. The orange clip you see is what plugs into the keyless entry antenna, which is underneath the support rail. Ta-da! 
Alrighty guys, so I think I'm gonna end the episode here. We got a lot done this episode. The entire rear end of this car is completely put back together. Everything is plugged in. Everything that I have purchased has fit and is aligned perfectly. Everything is good to go. I am waiting on a few more pieces left. I don't know if you guys saw on this side of the car, on the right side, I need that little vent to come in as well as I'm waiting on a new bumper bracket. And then I'm also waiting on a new trunk lid to go in the inside, like a trunk mat on the inside, since we had to cut that. I don't know if you guys remember in the episode on 23rd Garage, we had to cut this floor mat, you can see, so it don't look too good. I could put it back in, but I'd rather just put a new one in because this one looks terrible. But once all that's done, there's a few more things left that I want to explain what we need to do. So as you guys can see, the bumper is back on and everything is back inside of it. Like I said, a few more pieces I need to come in here, so the bumper is going to be coming back off. Then everything is plugged in. I am waiting on some new pieces before we reinstall the interior here. I need a new floor mat. As you can see, this one we had to take a huge chunk out of it and it was all mangled up anyway. So that needs to come in. And then once we're done, we can start to reassemble everything in the inside here because I got all these parts that need to go back in. And then we're gonna need to put the side skirts back of the car that we took off. And then we need to put the exhaust back in and then we need to do a build cost update. The rear end of my salvaged 2017 Volkswagen Golf R is finally starting to take shape. If all goes well, hopefully by the end of today's episode, I'll be able to drive the car around the block a little bit. Now we can't go too far because I don't have a plate and the car is still not registered, but I'll be able to drive it around my apartment complex. Now the only thing stopping me from really driving this car right now is because there's no exhaust on the back of it, which I'd like to get installed today and also the side skirts. Now to get you up to speed, in the last episode, I was able to successfully repaint and reinstall the rear end on the Volkswagen. I was able to not only paint match the factory e-coat, but also the base and clear coats on the car using spray cans of all things. Now, once the paint was dry, I was then able to reinstall the rear end for the first time ever. That includes mounting the brand new taillights for good, as well as the rear reinforcement and even the new blind spot monitoring sensors which got destroyed in the accident. The best part was the rear bumper lined up perfectly and practically all the codes are finally gone from the car. Meaning that I am just moments away from being able to drive the car for the first time. Now I'm gonna start off with the exhaust because I think that's probably the hardest to put on and then we'll slap the side skirts on it but for starters I need to fix the exhaust because one of the exhaust hangers is broken. As you can see this is what a you know unbroken exhaust hanger looks like. And this one, there's nothing to hang it to. Now, luckily I did order this part and it is in. So we need to swap this out really quick and then we can put that whole exhaust back on the car. Now I'm pretty sure the exhaust hanger is made from aluminum, which is why it broke off so easily. Had it have been steel, I probably could have just bent it back into place, but you know, oh well. Now I know they sell special tools to remove these exhaust hangers because these things are on there and I mean they are on there. They're not coming off that easy. I probably spent a good 10 minutes trying to get it off and it just wouldn't budge. So that's when I decided to try it the other way and it actually worked. Using some adjustable joint pliers, I was able to push it through and off it came. Oh, I could also do it that way. Using WD-40 on the new one, I was able to just slide it on with ease. Now it's time to actually get the exhaust back on the car. It's a bit harder to do on the floor, but after jacking the car up, I was able to connect the middle pipes together. And then all I had to do was figure out a way to get the muffler screwed back into place and up about two feet in the air. Keep in mind, this exhaust is like an easy 50 pounds, so it was quite difficult to move. But after a good idea, using some bricks I found, Sean and I were able to get the exhaust high enough to where the brackets lined up with the holes and I could lightly screw them into place.
with everything reconnected and sitting now how I wanted, I could then go back and actually tighten all the bolts back up. It's just two screws in the middle on the exhaust clamp and then two in the rear holding the muffler to the car. Alrighty guys, so it is a new day. The exhaust is on perfect. It fit up perfectly. There's no damage to it. Um, I wanted to put on the side skirts now, but I noticed that the side skirts need some 3M adhesive tape, which I don't have. That's coming in from Amazon for like 10 bucks tomorrow. So we'll be doing that later on. So I figured while I'm waiting, I might as well do the oil change on the car. The car is actually throwing uh, just a service, you know, uh, note that says I need to do an oil change, but also if I'm gonna start driving this car. I definitely need to do one because it's been sitting for a long time. So I wanna do an oil change really quickly with you guys, uh, and then we'll, we'll see what we need to do next. Kind of see, hopefully, in the camera, if it comes out clear where the uh, 3M adhesive tape kind of needed to be. You can see right here on this kind of angle all the way down, there needs 3M tape, and this is all dirty now, so it's not gonna stick. So when that comes in, We'll slap these back on the car. The first step to doing an oil change on the Golf R is getting the front end up just a little. This will give you the needed room to slide a pan underneath to catch the oil. And I'm honestly quite surprised with how easy it is to do an oil change on this car. Like it's almost too easy. Once I had the car up on ramps, I loosened the oil filter housing with a wrench and then just simply using a flathead screwdriver, I could unscrew screw the drain plug with like two turns. This was scary easy to do. Everything looks good though. Everything looks good. I cut a hole in this because this was being a pain in my ass for those that are listening. Never buy the Walmart uh, like oil cash can. This thing that you see here is horrible. Well, it's good, but you just gotta cut a hole in it and then it's good. I'll show you in a second what I mean and we'll see if it was a good idea or not. But I'll let this drain out. I had an a Audi A3 before this and it had a metal uh, drain plug and it had a metal oil pan. This is plastic with a plastic one, which is kind of silly, but well, whatever. I, I guess to each their own. But once this is done draining out, I'll just lube up the new one and then I will uh, put it on. I guess, let me show you what I'm talking about. Volkswagen Audi cheaped out and they're using this little thing. This is the new drain plug, plastic, because it's got a plastic pan underneath, which is so silly. I guess we'll put a little oil around this little seal, little O-ring, but that's it. I just used a screwdriver and I was able to unscrew it. So, oh well, pretty, pretty silly. I mean, you hit, some, you lower this car and you hit a bump, good luck. And that's it. That is, talk about easy. That's literally it. That's so silly. That's literally it. That just is so strange. It's not even tight. Like, that's it. That's with a screwdriver. Yeah, that's as far as it, we're going. That's fair enough. Whatever. With the oil out of the car, it's time to replace the old filter with a new one as well as a new O-ring, making sure to put new oil around the ring to ensure a proper seal. All right, now I know what you're thinking, but I do not want to hear it. There's been plenty of studies that prove that this oil is totally fine for being Walmart brand. Totally fine, totally fine. And I've used it for a long time and it's and it's fine. Full synthetic, 5W30. This takes about around five-ish, five and a half quarts. I got a little extra of some like liquid molly from the for the RS3, but we'll see, we'll see how much it takes. We'll just get it off the ramps after we get some oil in it. We'll go from there. Thank you. 
With the oil change done, it's time to clean up my mess. Hopefully now you can see what I did to the Walmart oil catch can, as this is like the only way to prevent the oil from bouncing off the shallow surface and going absolutely everywhere. All right, so it's a new day and the next thing I need to do is reinstall the side skirts back on the car. It's so much easier taking them off than reinstalling and that's because they got about a 10 foot strip of 3M tape that goes around the side of them and I was able to pick up some for 10 bucks of 3M tape on uh, Amazon. But I have to prep the surface, clean it, and then we'll reinstall it back on the car. This is by far the most tedious and annoying thing I've done to the car so far. Each of these side skirts has about 10 feet of dirty 3M tape that needs to come off and be replaced in order to get a good fitment on the car. The best method I've found so far was using a razor blade and just scraping them off inch by inch until I had the entire thing done. My fingers were going numb by the time I was done, but it was well worth it to see the final result. Once both the surfaces were cleaned, I could then lay down the new 3M tape to the side skirts, making sure to press them down hard as this is truly how you activate the tape. Now, in order to have enough room to install them, I turned the wheel to reveal the screw hole that mounts the side skirts to the car. Once it was lined up, I could push down and the side skirt will fit into a groove on the car. Then I can start peeling off the 3M tape while pushing down at the same time as this will lock it into place on the car. The last step is just putting back the four or five screws that secures it to the car for good. And now all I have to do is just repeat it all again on the other side. Alrighty guys, so before we take the car out on its first ever test drive, there's a few things we need to do really quick. The first is I finally got the bumper bracket mounts because the old one broke off the rear. So I wanna install that super quick. And then I've now discovered a new problem, which is actually kind of scary. And I wanna show you guys it. And hopefully if you have a GTI or maybe it's just a Golf R thing, I want you to let me know down in the comments below if you've had this problem because this, it scared the crap out of me because I thought I had a bigger problem than I think it is, but I'll show you guys that in a minute. So really quickly, I just wanna swap out the rear bumper bracket because as you can see, the old ones are broken. This is super simple to do as it's just a few screws holding them down. And then also for those wondering, I do replace that broken air vent uh, off camera another day. Alrighty, so it's a bit dirty in here, but I wanna show you guys the last problem that I found on this car. And I'll also show you majority of the dash lights are gone, which is incredible. But um, so when I drive the car and I first tap the brakes, there's a really loud, scary clunking sound. And it only seems to happen when I put it for the first time braking in going and drive and the first time braking when I go in reverse. So it seems like it's a brake problem and not something else, but I wanna show you. All right, ready? All right, so first and foremost, we really don't have any more problems. There's only that, you know, front adaptive cruise control, but that can get solved later. None of these problems are really uh, anything major, but I wanna show you. All right, ready? All right, so take a listen. I'll let the car idle down and then I want you to listen. So you're gonna hear this really loud clunk. I'll put it in drive. Ready? Not 
steer it into the, the garage door. You heard that? That metal clunk? I'll do. I'll see if I can put it in reverse. Listen again, ready? Oh, right there. Yet again, I'll put it in drive. You heard it? It's real loud and it sounds scary because that's metal on metal. Just like that. And that again. So here's what I think it is. So I have a feeling, and I want to know if anyone other, any other Golf R owners have this problem, but I have the feeling it's these brake pads that aren't sitting because look at the gap between it. These must be aftermarket. There's a massive gap and then no gap on the bottom. So when I drive forward, the pads slide down and you hear this metal on metal smacking and in reverse, this smacks on the top. So I'm gonna try to grease these on both sides and hopefully that solves the problem. Otherwise, maybe maybe it's the rust on these, but I, I really think it has to do with the pad sliding and not being, uh, you know, with some anti, anti C's on it. So if my hunch is correct, then this should be an easy fix. I basically need to just put some sort of metal shim in that gap and it should stop the sound. Either way, it's still a poor design flaw that leaves a scary result for people that don't know any better. Now, in order to inspect the sound uh, a bit better, I removed the wheel and unscrewed the caliper by using a wrench and socket at the same time, as this prevents the nut from spinning. Then the caliper should just come right off. All right, so this is definitely the problem. That's way too loud. I don't know why these have so much unnecessary play in them, which is so silly, but holy hell. So either I need to put something in there to shut it up, which I think is the only answer, or put like lube on it, but thinking Thinking shoving something in there is gonna be my only option. All right, so the moment we've all been waiting for a quick test drive in this car, I'm only gonna go around uh, my apartment complex to stay on private property because I don't have a plate yet, but this is gonna be the true test. A uh, little bit nervous. We should be totally fine though. It's the first time I've ever driven something like, you know, a rebuilt car, fully rebuilt. It just feels a bit different, but I wanna test it out. We'll see how it goes. Um, the brakes are gonna have to wait for another day until I can figure out something to kind of wedge in between that's not gonna hit the rotor. Unless you guys have another idea, feel free to let me know down in the comments besides replacing the pads, but everything should be good. The bumper, I'm not too worried about the bumper falling off anymore, but uh, I, I don't know what to expect. Keep an eye on the coolant and everything, although coolant is topped off, we should be good. Like it sounds good. Real scary though, the whole rear, I mean the rear is good, it's on, everything's good, but it just, there's no, the inside, I didn't, I didn't finish the inside of the car yet. We're still waiting on the mat and stuff before I can be done with it, but. I mean, everything works, it's sketch. But it drives totally fine. Everything seems to drive fine, everything sounds good, everything looks good, no problems. Pretty surreal, pretty crazy. Let's do another lap. Really try to get the the brakes set in. I'm like afraid to put it in sport. Do I put it in sport, guys? All right, I'll put it in sport. Now we're in sport. I love the DCT, dual, dual clutch transmission. Exhaust opened up. Oh yeah. You can hear the turbos. In the last episode, I was able to fully complete and put back together the outer rear end of the car. As you guys can see, everything is exactly where it's supposed to be. Now, what we're gonna try to accomplish today is putting this back in one piece. We had to disassemble the rear end of the car in order to do all the framework, which is now completed. And as you guys can see, we had to rip this out of the trunk. And this is like, the first piece that needs to go down in order to rebuild it. And you can see we had to cut it out and it was all torn up. I tried taping it. I'd, I'd never put this in the car, but 
I thought I would just try and see what we got. And that's what's actually in my, uh, my big burger box right here. So what we're gonna do is unbox this, make sure everything is good, and then we're gonna have to fully reassemble the rear end of the car. To catch you guys up to speed, in the last episode, I was finally able to take the Golf R out on the road. Prior to doing that, I actually had to get the car ready. Now, what I mean is I basically put the last of the parts onto the exterior of the car. That included fixing and reinstalling the exhaust. I also put the side skirts back on, and I even did an oil change as the car has been sitting for quite a long time. Not only that, I even got to do it on Volkswagen's weird plastic oil pan and plastic drain plug. Then, for the first time ever, I actually got to give the car a little gas. All that's left now is to clean up the interior for good. And in order to do that, you have to start by emptying everything out of the boot. So we'll do a whole price breakdown in a little bit because I know I've been delaying that, but there's a lot of stuff that's been uh, needing to get done first. Now that I got, this is the last part, we should be good after that. So this should be perfect. And it is. No creases. Well, no, I'll come out in a second, but everything looks good. And I think this is probably the first thing that's gonna have to go in the car. The first thing that needs to go in is of course the new trunk mat. With that installed, now I can start to put everything back in correctly. Next, I can reinstall the left and right liners, and then I can install the left and right plastic trims. These have plugs in them for the cigarette lighter as well as the lights, so you need to make sure to plug these in as well. As you can see, the right trim was dented in a little, but with some heat from a heat gun and some bending, I was able to get it back to the right way it was supposed to be. Next is also installing the rubber seal. With that on, it was time to reinstall the rear seats, and this is kind of annoying as there's a metal bracket that needs to be set in place prior to screwing it down. Getting it into the right place is what's difficult as it never wants to seat correctly. I screwed the left and right side latches down with the special triple square tool, and then I reinstalled the bottom trim pieces. Next was the upper trim, the bottom trim, and all the stuff that goes in the trunk. And now I can finally say the interior of the car is assembled for good. the next day and the rear end of the car, I was able to get everything 100% put back together, which is nuts. I'm opening it up to show you guys. It's pretty impressive to see how far this car has come and where it is today. But let me show you what the rear end of the car officially looks like. So everything is back in where it's supposed to be. All of the new parts have been replaced if there was damage and we look the part. Everything looks incredible. We even got this that opens and closes when you 
you know, you see, I think it's pretty cool. You can see everything is on where it's supposed to be. I know it might be a little too dark, but the rear end is officially put back together. All the parts and everything you'd need is back here. And honestly, it couldn't have been any more perfect. You can lift this up right here and you have what I thought was a spare tire or something, or like a spare tire kit is actually a Fender speaker, which is pretty cool if you ask me, but everything is officially there. Now, uh, the last thing I wanna do is pull this outside and uh, clean it off because it smells like weld smoke. Alrighty guys, so it is time for the official price breakdown. There is a lot to go over. We've had a lot of parts since the last time that we did this and we are still on budget somehow, surprisingly. Obviously, if you guys were to do this, then things would differ, but for the time being, we've had quite a few parts added to complete the rear end. We have the right taillight, $108. Rear apron, so that's the back piece of the car, the big, the longest part, was $293 I got on eBay. You know, genuine OEM Volkswagen eBay. Somebody must have bought it, didn't use it, which is cool. The frame rail end, that six foot pole, I got directly from the dealer at Volkswagen, which is mind blowing. Uh, that took a month and a half to come in, and that was only 216 bucks for that massive thing. I don't understand. Now, then the actual horn, so that the horn that mounts up to it that you saw Yuri weld with the bracket for the exhaust to mount to, that total was 64. So we have the exhaust hanger, so that's that little red thing that broke off on the old exhaust, on the exhaust. I swapped that and I got it on eBay. For $13, we have the exterior rear apron. So that's the part that I forgot. And Sean had to go drive all the way to like, uh, what was it? Uh, some other part in Tennessee to pick up. That we got directly from the dealer as well for $146. We absolutely destroyed the old blind spot radar and bracket. So I got those in on eBay as well. That was $98 for both the bracket and the blind spot radar. And then we have uh, the floor mat, which was $108. All right, so I totally forgot a few things on the build cost, so I wanna do a quick update. The 23rd garage trip, totally forgot to add the truck and trailer, so that brought it up to $25.98 from about $1,700. And then I also forgot to add the rear air vent and the rear bumper brackets for the bumper, uh, which was like 45 bucks total, which brings the new total up to $22,000. $625.41, which still gives me plenty of room to get a few things repainted on this car, as well as get this bad boy programmed. There's only three things left to fix on my 2017 Volkswagen Golf R. The three things include getting the adaptive cruise control programmed finally, because this has been honestly one of the hardest things about the car rebuild so far. Now, number two is getting the car repainted because right now it's kind of mismatched. And number three is getting the car from a salvage title into a rebuilt title, officially making the car street legal and allowed to be driven on the roads. Now, in order to do that, that involves getting an appointment with the DMV, filling out a bunch of paperwork, and actually physically driving the car and getting it inspected at a special DMV place and passing, and if it does, then we'll be able to officially have this car on the road, and that's kind of the goal for the next couple of episodes. It's pretty crazy to think that this might be one of the last rebuild episodes for the Volkswagen Golf R. It's been quite the journey these past few months. In the last episode, we officially finished the interior of the Volkswagen, which included reassembling the entire trunk area, fixing a few bent plastic trims, and even putting the last few final touches in place. And hopefully you guys remember this, but it was one of the first few episodes we did in the rebuild series where I had installed a used radar module that I bought off an Audi A3 with a matching part number because the one on the Volkswagen had fallen off at Copart. And ever since installing it, I've been getting a ton of fault codes, which can only be taken off at the dealer. And hopefully we can fix that today without going that expensive route. Now I'm not going to be repainting this car myself, I'll have a body shop do it. But for the time being, there are some things I do want to try to uh, accomplish in regards to the paint. As you guys can see, I do have a few door dings, which sucks, and these were here when I bought the car. The first one is right here, and then we do have another, which happened because of shipping, 
which I told you in another video, is also right here. So I wanna to try to remove these two dents by using a special PDR kit that I bought on Amazon. Now I'm obviously no PDR specialist or paintless debt removal specialist, but the whole point of this channel is to see how far I can get with doing things on my own. And as you guys can see here, I bought this Vivor paintless debt removal kit on Amazon, which I'll link down in the description. And the goal is that this will help me get those dents out and looking close to as OEM as possible. Obviously it's not gonna be perfect, but we'll see if anyone can do this. Now this kit was only 60 bucks on Amazon and as you can see, it comes with quite a lot of stuff. We have glue pull sticks that go into the glue gun here, which we can then use these special tabs here to place over the dent, pull the dent out and then push it back in flat, or at least that's the goal. We even have a tap down hammer, a rubber hammer, a, sl uh, a slide puller thing, I'm sure you guys will correct me. And then we have this, which will be cool to actually see the dents or the roughness in the metal, but it comes with quite a lot of stuff for 60 bucks. All right, so with the car outside, you can see kind of on an angle where the door ding is here, but it's still a bit difficult to see. So as far as I can understand, if I put this on it, we should be able to get a better view of the actual ding that's there. So with the board out on here, it makes it much easier to actually pinpoint where the den is. You can see the straight lines here, and then you can see the ripple. And I'm actually noticing another one right here. So it kind of tells you where you want to tap. This is obviously pushed in. This one's pushed up. So pushing this down, and we'll have to try to pull that out using some of these glue sticks and stuff and pull tabs. But it actually looks pretty cool for a $60 kit. As you can see, the kit comes with an assortment of tabs. I'm gonna be starting with this one, as I'm pretty sure you wanna start big and then work your way small. So this covers it fully, and then we'll go to a smaller one and we'll keep pulling out, and then we'll tap it back down. And hopefully, we won't have such a big dent like that. Well, I'll tell you what, I give you PDR guys a lot of credit. Now, I'm not sure if it's because I bought a cheap Amazon kit that came with weak glue, or maybe just the professionals use a much stronger adhesive, but this kit was kicking my butt. The kit itself is awesome, and the tools all work as they should, but no matter how hard I tried, the deep ding on the door would just not pull out. Now, I'm sure I'm gonna get roasted for doing this in the comments, or maybe some of you can actually offer me some advice, because I I'm sure I'm doing something wrong. All right, so after pulling this for a little bit, the dent is still there, unfortunately. And honestly, the reason I think it's still ever so slightly there is because of how this dent was hit. It was hit on such a corner that it's such a point, a fine point, it's not rounded on the inside, that honestly, the only real way to pull this dent out would be from the inside and pushing it in. So with that in mind, unfortunately, this is probably gonna be how I leave it, unless I wanna go take the door panel off or get a rod to shove down. But with this idea in mind of how to get the dent out, that's what we're gonna try doing on this one here. I'm actually gonna take this panel off that's underneath it and we're gonna try to tap out from the inside, push this out smoother, and then maybe it'll look a bit better. But I do wanna make a point. It did definitely do its job. Like the kit works and that glue holds on really well, but because the only thing left literally here, and this is after putting some touch-up paint, is the ever so tiniest little speckle, as you guys can see if it focuses, it is the tiniest little dent which is literally the only way to get that out would be from the inside of the door and pushing it with a push rod or a hammer if you take the door panel off, but it got a lot better. It is way smaller than how it was when, um, when I first had it, but definitely I think we're gonna be able to get this dent out way better than the other one. You can see this one is definitely bigger, but I think I know how to get this one out from the inside.
Well, I'm stumped. I don't really have any tools to get behind there and really push it. And this is some strong freaking metal cheese. It might have me beat. Seriously, this is nuts. Like I can feel it, but I can't get any good force on it. Like with the door, you can take a hammer and whack it, hopefully. But with this, I don't have enough leverage to push it. I'm trying to use an extension to push it out. It doesn't want to go at all. Like the only way I think is if you welded a, uh, the tip to it and pulled it that way, those little welding uh, hooks, that would probably be the only way, or you just body filler it, but jeez. I am stumped. That's much harder to work than I thought, so I might have to just leave it how it is or have the body shop fix it. I figured before I end up returning the kit back to Amazon, I might as well give it another shot. And instead of using the black glue sticks, I'd try to use the clear ones instead. And to my surprise, it actually made a massive difference. They actually stuck on much longer, but it was still to no avail. Maybe with a, a bigger, more shallow dent, these glue sticks PDR kit would actually do the trick. But in my case, the dent is just too deep. So I guess my last test is to use the smallest pull tab with the structural glue or the professional adhesive glue. And we're going to see, so far I got a lot more pulls on this than I have had with all of them. So, I mean, it's got to be doing something better. Well guys, I gave it my best and this is pretty much the best I can do with the tools that I have. And honestly, I don't think it did much at all. Unfortunately, I was really hoping that it would do what I thought it would do from watching other videos. Maybe this is just too strong of a metal, but um, yeah, this, this is just not the way to fix dents like this, unfortunately. But even though that didn't work, hopefully tomorrow when it comes time to remotely program or try to program out the component protection in the adaptive cruise control, hopefully we'll have better luck. All right, guys, so it is finally time to code out the component protection system, the lock that's on the uh, adaptive cruise control on the front. And on this car, it's like the last code on the car that needs to be fixed, and a car is 100%. Now, unfortunately, I can't do that, so I have to outsource this, which is awesome because there are services where you can do this remotely, and all you need is like a Dell or non-Mac computer. You need a cable, and then and all you need is a like trickle charger on the car and then you let them work their magic and it gets completely done so that's what we're going to do today i just need to set up the car a little bit plug this in plug the uh, cable into the obd port on the car and then hopefully by the end of this we'll have a car with no codes granted i'll have to program set up the sensor but that's for another day but let's uh let's set everything up all right so you need to use a special cable in order to actually communicate with the car and i don't know the exact name of this but if you would like to do this service he actually sends this to you for only a deposit of 200 bucks and then you send it back to him and when he receives it you actually get all your money back which is cool and this service only costs a hundred or so dollars. All right, so as you guys can see, the setup process is super easy to get this coated out. We have red to red, black to black. The reason we have that is for the trickle charger. It keeps the battery charged because you need to leave the car in accessory mode. Now, as you guys can see, you also need to run this cable. It's a special scan tool that's needed in order to connect that for the car to communicate with the computer that we have here. And then all you do is download TeamViewer and then you let them work their magic and they will code out the car and get rid of all those component protection codes. I'll tell you, it took me a week or two of researching if this was even possible. I was looking deep in the Volkswagen Audi forums to find someone with the skills capable of doing this remotely because the other option was either having someone come here, which really narrows my options to only local businesses or bringing it to the dealer, which is not only extremely expensive because they wanna replace the entire module with a brand new one and then code and program 
it, but also near impossible because the car isn't street legal and I'd have to pay to get it towed back and forth. And luckily, so far doing this remotely is working out pretty well. All right, guys, so I just got the okay, which means he was able to successfully clear the car out, which it's just mind blowing how easy that was to do using this loaner tool here, which I now need to go ship back to him. But absolutely insane. I have the OBD11 plugged in right now on my phone and I'm just making sure that all the codes are gone, which I think they are. I'm gonna clear everything and scan it again. But this is super exciting and it finally means that I'll be able to actually program the adaptive cruise control and not just be locked out of it completely, which is definitely a step in the right direction. So huge shout out to Justin for helping me do this. If you guys wanna get or have any sort of coding you need, component protection, whatever it is, or you just are curious about a service you might need, make sure to hit him up. I linked him down in the description below. I put his email. So make sure to send him an email ASAP if you have services, because I know a lot of you guys were asking me about it. And um, with that being said, let's see what uh, what codes we have left. Alrighty guys, so check this out. We still have some codes left, but it is no longer component protection lock which is insane here. The only faults that we have is just the fact that this can't communicate with it because it needs to be reprogrammed, which is much, much, much easier than actually getting the component protection off. Database, error value received, database and plausible, no enable identification active, so on and so forth. I can figure that stuff out, but as you guys can tell, the codes are gone. The rest of these codes that are left, which is just a couple, can all be programmed off just by pro the last 20, can all come off by programming the adaptive cruise control. Check it out, we are officially done. Session is ended and we are all finished and everything is good to go. All right, so we've made a bit of progress trying to code out the adaptive cruise control. It's a new day. This is attempt number two. Currently what I'm learning is we were able to get the component protection off of the uh, adaptive cruise control module, but now there's like a two step process in here, actually three component protection, then there's something called VEC swap or FEC swap codes that need to be installed, then you can actually program it. So we're on step two now, which we're gonna to try to do today. Justin was, you know, uh, nice enough to send the cable out again so we can attempt this, and then hopefully we'll have some progress. Now, a lot of stuff has happened or is happening in this video. I was able to get the car officially roadworthy, road legal and registered which is awesome. I actually wanna show that to you really quick, so come follow me. After doing all the paperwork and I made a new video, I'll make a separate video on how to actually get these cars registered here. Um, I wanna show you that this car is actually road legal. So in the state of Florida, what literally determines if a car is rebuilt, so from a salvage title to a rebuilt title, they put this little sticker right on that door that says rebuilt and that's it. I have a plate, I'm not gonna show you all the numbers, but you can see right there, I do have a plate on the car, which means we got a lot of progress on this car and I've actually been able to drive it for the first time ever. That's also why I wasn't able to get a video out last week um, because there's just so much going on, I haven't had time to edit, but lots of progress is being made. So I had a company reach out to me and they were you know, nice enough to send me this for free, I'm not sponsored, but they gave this to me for free to test out. This is the TB6000 Pro, topped on, as you can see here, it's a battery charger and tester, which is really convenient because in order to code this car, you have to have the battery on a tender because we leave the car in accessory mode and it's running a lot of stuff. So I wanna review this, unbox it, and there's actually a mobile app too, which we can use to see everything on this car. It's just a cool way to you know keep in check with your car instead of physically going over there. But as you can see, this is like legit. It's as legit as legit can get. Check this bad boy out. Top down 6,000, I'll show you how to plug everything in. But it comes with everything and it's real official. And I think, what is this? Uh, we'll figure out what this is. I think it's, oh yeah, this is a battery tender. So instead of constantly turning the car or unplugging it, you know, with these gator clips, which is like a temporary solution you can unplug this here put these on and then you can actually hardwire this to your car and then every time you want to just take your car off you just unplug it and you're good to go and then you plug it back in and you could go about your business but today we're going to use the gator clips and put this on the car so let's get this sorted out so i have it plugged in on the florida regular outlet you can see 
Obviously it's reading nothing, but we're gonna plug this, put this on the car and get power to it while everything, while we start coding the car. You know, red on red, and you can see it's already starting to do its thing, 85% charge. We have 12, 12 volts small, and it will give us a reading soon in a second, but I wanna actually show you what's on the app. So what makes the TB6000 Pro stand out from the competition is the fact that it can connect to your phone via Bluetooth to intelligently manage battery charging and even battery testing. Now the time charging function allows you to automatically charge at low cost times, saving you money on electricity bills, and you can even set the voltage and current regulation with a 0.1 accuracy. Even better is you can monitor real-time power consumption and charged power, generating a pre and post report. So if you plan on coding your car like I am, or you just want to ensure that your battery doesn't die, then make sure to pick up the TB6000 Pro on Amazon with the link I left down in the description below. All right, so Justin said he's made some good progress actually coding the adaptive cruise control, figuring out that second step, and we might not even need to align it, but you know, I'm going to assume that's also necessary here, but he says he cleared almost all of the codes, and now that we now we just need to go drive it and actually confirm that all the codes are gone and we might actually, for the first time ever, have a working cruise control, which is pretty incredible. So let's take it on a quick test drive, see if we got any codes left and we'll keep you guys posted. Alrighty guys, I have some incredible news. Justin was able to code out the remaining faults left on the car. There was about 20 or so, maybe 26 faults left. I officially have a faultless car. There are no faults left on the car and there are no lights left on the dash. So yet again, huge shout out to Justin for helping me fix this car and get rid of the remaining faults program the adaptive cruise control, troubleshoot it, as well as the uh, the blind spot modules too, which we figured out needed coding as well. So make sure to check him out down in the description below. I will leave his email there. Shoot him an email, let him know that I sent you so he knows you know where you're coming from and how you found him. And with that being said, let me show you the craziest thing. As you guys can see, there's only one fault remaining. And if anyone has Volkswagens or Audis, know that you'll literally only have one fault remaining. And as you can see, the only fault that is left is for multimedia, which is a fault literally just saying that you don't have Sirius XM, tuner for satellite radio. It is so silly. If you get satellite radio, this fault will go away. But the fact that we have no more faults on the car is absolutely insane. Now here's the thing, Justin was able to take off the component protection that's on the adaptive cruise control, as well as we got a code for like no adaptation code, which is a little more complicated, but we were able to figure that out. The only thing left on the car in regards to adaptive cruise control is actually calibrating the module. Typically, when the module is disconnected from the car, even if it's the same one factory from your car, what happens is it kind of goes into sleep mode. It deactivates itself. So I believe using OBD11, which I have now through my phone, I should be able to reactivate it and turn it on. And we're gonna try to do that now. Worst comes to worst, we'll have to bring it to some place and have them calibrate it. Best case scenario is that we actually can do it here at home by myself by taking it on the road or something like that. And I think we should be okay because I'm not retrofitting an adaptive cruise control. This car came with adaptive cruise control and the actual bracket where the adaptive cruise control sits on is totally fine. The only thing that happened during the accident was it plopped out. So. I just plopped the new one back in, so there shouldn't really be maybe some minor adjusting, but everything should theoretically work as planned. But I wanna show you how to do it anyway. So from what I understand, if we go over to here, and then we go to, where is it? We're going down to adaptive cruise control. As you guys can see, there's a few different options. If we scroll all the way down, we get the option security access, and that's what we're gonna click first. So if we go to security access, it should pop up login codes, as you can see here. We're gonna click the first one and that should give us access to now being able to mess around a little bit with the adaptive cruise control. Now, what I believe the next step we need to do is click on basic settings right here and it should load up. It will load up these options, reset personalization, reset triggering, calibration of adaptive cruise control, release of the swap function. So obviously we're gonna to go to calibration and then you can see status not, at, not active, type of calibration static. 
And we also get the option of dynamic. We're gonna leave it on static and we're gonna slide to start. All right, so update on the calibration. I tried doing a reset uh, static instead of dynamic and it didn't work the first time. And I read online that if you actually are four feet away from a wall, uh, 1.2 meters to be exact, and then you try it, it should work. And I did it and it actually reactivated the um, adaptive cruise control. And now we're at the second step which is getting a new code, which is adaptive cruise control sensor misaligned or misadjusted, which is a typical uh, response that I would get. But we've made it past the first step. Let me show you what I have. As you guys can see, that original code is gone. And now we have a new code, which is adaptive cruise control sensor misadjusted. So I'm gonna clear the code and see what we get. Well, OBD11 doesn't work. I tried, it shows that you can reset the calibration if anybody happens to know. How to do it via OBD11, let me know, but it doesn't seem to work for this, which means I'm going to either A, have to take it to like a Volkswagen specialist or B, take it to the dealer just for them to program the adaptive cruise control so that I can actually access it. But that doesn't change the fact that there's still no codes on the car, which is still really cool. And on that note, I think I will be ending the video here. Uh, I'm going to go drop the car off at a auto body shop, getting the car repainted. Uh, just because, you know, they pull panels on and off and I don't want to go get the, you know, the adaptive cruise control calibrated, then bring it to a body shop and then have to get it recalibrated again in case they touch it. So the next time you see the car, we should have a completely blue, fully repainted Volkswagen Golf R. So with that being said, definitely make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Peace. Well, wanted to give you guys a quick update. Turns out I just don't know how to use adaptive cruise control and it actually works on the car. Check this out. As you guys can see, lane assist, blind spot, if I go down, or originally I had lane assist off and then every time that I was pressing set, it wouldn't work on the car. Turns out, I don't know how what I was doing actually. If I go back, I gotta figure this out because I like have no idea. All right, so this is what I kept getting every single time I would press like adaptive cruise control. It would keep saying, let's see if I could pull it up. I don't even know what I'm doing. I keep messing it up. Ah. Yeah, here we go. Adaptive cruise control and lane assist deactivated. That's what it kept saying. And I, for whatever reason, thought that that meant I needed to be programmed as you can see. Well, turns out all I need to do is press this and then press this and we have cruise control. And then I press set and we're good to go. It's that simple. Like if I press, if I start going fast and I press set, now I set it to 42 miles an hour with my foot off the gas, we're going. That's pretty nuts. Super easy too. And we're slowing down. So it's working perfectly. Now we're slowing down because of the car in front of us. Wow. <laughs> so we did it correctly. So I can cancel this. Yep, and now I deactivated it. I just deactivated it just like that. I seriously cannot believe I just figured it out. Literally this, the adaptive cruise control has been programmed and is not misaligned at all. It's actually perfect. I just had no idea how to use the adaptive cruise control because it is entirely different than on my RS3. And it turns out it works fine and it's already programmed. Maybe I needed to calibrate it and maybe sliding it um, on the status when the garage door was closed four feet away was actually able to recalibrate it or turn it on. And now that it's on, we have no fall codes and the adaptive cruise control actually works, which is just so funny that I'm on my way to get it painted. I'm playing around with the adaptive cruise control buttons and we fixed it. So I'll be damned. Alrighty guys, so check it out. This is the last time you're gonna see the car. Whoa, unpainted, <laughs> fell in a hole. Unpainted as you can see, last time you'll see the bumper like this and then the front, check it out. This will be the last time you'll see the car unpainted. It's so dirty, but this will be repainted. The hood will be repainted as well as the front bumper. So make sure to check it out in the next episode. Getting the work done from Alvin Auto Body. Well guys, I hate to say it, but my salvage 2017 Volkswagen Golf R 
is no longer salvaged. It's been quite a few months since I took ownership of this car, and honestly, there was a few points where I didn't think it was possible to rebuild it and I'd have to cut my losses. This car has taken me on quite the journey to say the least. Winning that car in Copart felt like I hit the lottery. That was so easy. But that feeling didn't last that long. Once I got the car in person, I knew I was in over my head. I know my limits, and from the outside, everything looked doable on my own. But that is until I got a closer look. It wasn't the deployed airbags, or the ruined dash, or even the front end that scared me. It was what was hiding underneath. Frame damage. But I knew I couldn't give up. I had to prove to myself and you guys that if you put your mind to something, you can achieve anything. With a little perseverance and help from my friends at 23rd Garage, I started to see the light at the end of the tunnel. After months of waiting, my delayed parts had finally started to arrive, and the car was finally starting to look like a car again. All that was left now was just getting the car repainted. And even with all those challenges that I was able to overcome, you have to remember, this is my first time ever really working on a car. I wanted to just challenge myself and see if it was possible. And, you know, I'm going to let you guys be the judge of that. So without further ado, check out the Volkswagen Golf R. So I guess the question now is, what do we do with it? I can keep it and modify it, which I've actually modified it a little bit more um, than the previous video. We actually put new brakes and rotors on to stop that, that annoying clicking sound. But honestly, it's like, do I keep it? Do I sell it? And honestly, I'm leaning more towards selling it so that you know we can continue to do different builds, either another wrecked car or maybe we go into flipping cars. I'm not so sure. I didn't even think we'd get to this point so quickly. It's pretty incredible if you ask me. So I'm reaching out to you guys. What do you think? Do we jump into another wrecked car and rebuild it? Do we modify a car buying it base? Or do we buy a, you know, a, a beater car and we fix it up? Because there's lots of cool different ways we can go, you know, with this channel. Now, what you guys are probably most excited for is how much did I spend in total on this build? And in order to break that down, there's a lot of different sections we have to talk about, but the overall cost of the build, which is how much did I spend on paint, which came out to a total of $2,000 to get the full car repainted and also to get the dents pulled out and fixed up in the rear uh, tailgate that was damaged from YRC Freight, another terrible company, a terrible shipping company, uh, that damaged the parts. I was able to get that repaired uh, within the deal for $2,000, which honestly wasn't bad. They were able to paint match it and pretty much repaint four to five panels. But that brought the entire bill to $24,625 and 41 cents, which isn't bad. That's below my $25,000 budget. Now, funny enough, I've been keeping and holding on to all of the used parts that were salvageable from the build, pulling off trim panels from the, you know, exploded dash, as well as just parts off the uh, the old destroyed tailgate that actually wasn't damaged in the accident at all. And I've had all of these up on eBay and there are still maybe about 10, 15 or so items on eBay. And I've actually been able to sell about a dozen of them, which surprisingly has earned me about six to $700 in earned income, which brings the bill back down to about $24,000, which isn't bad. So, Overall, what exactly is next for the car? Now, I guess the rebuild series is officially over with this video because there's nothing left to rebuild on this car. However, I don't think it's going to be the last video where you see the goal far in because I do have a few other things in mind that I want to do. Maybe some small cosmetic upgrades, maybe explaining how exactly the uh, the title the rebuilt title application goes and how exactly I was able to do that. I want to explain that and maybe a few other videos. I don't know if you guys are interested wanting to learn how to do your own alignment on a car and just things off the top of my head. But ideally, I think the best 
way to move forward with this channel would be inevitably to sell this car and find another project to work on, whether that, like I said, a, another car to rebuild, uh, maybe a clean titled beater car that we can fix up, uh, or, or so on and so forth. But obviously, I think in the next couple of days, I will have this car up for sale. If any of you are actually interested in purchasing this, feel free to send me an email, which is in the description of the video, or just leave a comment, let me know, because it's going to be... It's a pretty solid car. Everything's fixed. Everything drives well. So I'm thinking of listing it for 25 or 26 K. Um, but obviously that's, we'll see what happens there. But I think 25 to 26 K is about what this car goes for with only 34,000 miles. Keep that in mind. It's a 2017 fully loaded adaptive cruise control. Uh, you know, so the market right now for around this car is 31 to 32,000. So I think taking five to seven K off is a pretty solid deal, but that's pretty much going to be it for today's video. I guess, let me show you super quick. I threw on some stop tech rotors and some, um, EBC red stuff brake pads. I did that a little bit ago. It was super quick to throw on. Um, I want to show you what that looks like, but, um, and that did officially stop that clunking sound back and forth. So whatever, I'll actually show you the pads that were on the car. As you can see, these are the new rotors we put on. Stop Tech, you know, Sean helped me. And we do have some EBC red stuff pads under there. You can't really see them. Yeah, you can kind of see some red showing through if it focuses. You can see the, the red EBC pads in there. And um, that stopped the clunking. These were the old pads that they used or whoever had on the car. And these, I don't know what brand these are. I mean, they got tons of meat left, but there's no, uh, they're definitely not OEM, and these are smaller on the ends here, which allowed it to shift in the in the bracket. So I'm glad these are off, and I'll give these to the next owner of the car. So was it worth rebuilding this car? Definitely a loaded question. We could separate that into two different parts. I think financially, going over the numbers, and then as a whole, if we start with the numbers financially, being that I'm in the car about $24,000, $25,000, and I'll probably be able to get twenty-five to twenty-six thousand dollars. Then we've broken even on it. Now that excludes labor. If we include labor, another five to six thousand dollars. Then no, it is not financially worth it. And ideally, I did break even because cost about twenty-five, and the car's worth that. So we broke even that way. So if I was to keep this car as my personal, then yeah, I saved about seven grand from buying a clean titled one. And you don't even know what's wrong with clean titled ones. You're taking a risk even when you buy clean titled, but I would be in it and I am saving money about seven, six to seven K by rebuilding this myself, excluding labor, which is really freaking cool. If you know what you're doing, you can save, or you know, I don't know what I'm doing, but I was able to rebuild it. Um, you can save quite a bit of money if you wanna take on such a big, big project like this. Now. As a whole, it was also 100% worth it because like I said, I have learned so much. It's gonna save me so much money now that I know how to work, at least on European cars, but work on cars in general. It's really getting over or getting that confidence because I remember I was afraid to take off a bumper when I got my first car, I thought I was gonna break it. But now I have so much more confidence going into this. So it's really awesome that, um, that I've been able to do that. And also I've met some great people and made some great friends along the way. So that's also super cool that this car has pretty much given me that opportunity and you know, go out of my comfort zone doing something I've never done before. So this is definitely something that I would like to do again. But overall, I'm happy with the way the car has come out, especially for never doing anything as extreme as this in my life before, prior to starting this YouTube channel. I think that most I've ever done was put brake pads on the car. But honestly, if you put your mind to something and you don't quit, and you don't give up, you can literally accomplish practically anything. And sometimes it's okay to ask for a little bit of help. So I learned a lot with this whole rebuild and I learned a lot from doing this on my own car, working on, on a car. It's allowed me to learn skills that I don't think I'll 
you know, they're just priceless. And I've saved thousands of dollars from not only fixing my girlfriend's car from the skills that I've learned rebuilding this, but I've also helped fix other people's cars in the community, friends, family. Um, so it's just some, it's, it's really incredible what I've learned and was able to accomplish from rebuilding this car, but it's on to a new chapter. Uh, and with all that being said, if you're liking this content, if you have any ideas as to what I should do next, definitely make sure to leave it down in the comment section below. But with that being said, make sure to smash the like button, turn on post notifications, subscribe, and we'll catch you in the next one. Like it was never there. Pull me closer